Hi everyone and welcome to IDG Live. Today is my charity Christmas Q&A open uh, chatting relaxed special um, and I've got some fantastic guests who I will introduce in just one moment um, but first of all this is a charity live stream so I thought I'd just uh, introduce you to firstly the boring uh, bit uh, which is for technical reasons uh, can't get the uh, actual charity option open up on this channel on YouTube at the moment. But what we're going to do is we're going to do a work around every single super chat, every single super sticker. If you're watching this back a bit later, every single super thanks will go straight to today's charity, which is Crisis at Christmas, which is a fantastic homelessness charity here in the UK. Uh, it gets very, very cold at this time of year here. Um, and they go out, make sure people have somewhere to warm to sleep, food, um, and also help them slightly longer term get back on their feet and hopefully get into accommodation in the longer term. So that is what we are raising money for today. We've uh, we've raised lots in previous years. And I'm really excited about this one. It is an open Q&A. Uh, so you feel free to we'll answer pretty much any question within reason uh, that you put at us. Um, uh, and I've got questions for my patrons coming up. But let me just quickly introduce you to Two people that you probably already know if you uh, are regulars on this channel. Uh, first of all, uh, Aziz in the middle. Um, do you want to say hi and introduce yourself? I do want to say hi and introduce myself. I'm Aziz from the channel History of Westeros. I've been on uh, Indie Geek several times and also in, in foreground and background. And it's really fun to be hanging out and, and doing some chatting about our favorite fandoms and helping the charity all at the same time. That's that's what this time of year is all about, huh? Absolutely. And uh, on the right of your screen um, is uh, the wonderful uh, Clueless Fangirl. Do you want to say hi, Helen? Okay, Helen, yes. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm basically just here to uh, have a good time and to uh, fight through my jet lag. <laughs> well, perfect reasons. Um, okay, let's, uh, I'll just quickly uh, go through. We had a few uh, um, super chats just before we uh, came uh, on air saying, uh, first of all, I can't actually see who that's from. Sorry, it's just gone off the top of my screen, but thank you very much saying, hi, Robert, can't make the stream, but wanted to thank you for hosting it and for the hard work you do creating your content. Mara Lee, hi there, Mara, I saw you were in the chat. Hey, Mara. Uh, uh, very generous, thank you very much, saying just a gift of love and support for the holiday season, wishing you, your guests, the chat, fellow mods, all the best for the holiday season. Uh, Nath Drum, uh, thank you very much, saying you're my favourite channel. Oh, thank you. Thanks for the content, happy to give to a good cause. Uh, who else have we got here? Kate Whitehorse saying thank you and your kind heart. Well, thank you and your kind heart. Um, uh, Dillafan saying, wondering about your opinions on Westworld past season one. Well, you may well be in luck. We may well have uh, a Westworld expert coming on in, in a little bit um, mm. as a special guest. Uh, saying, personally, didn't watch much of season two as it felt a bit like an afterthought compared to the exceptional story and ending of season one, which felt nicely complete. So we'll come back to the, that question, if that's OK, a little bit later. Steve Ash Lerner Turner saying, greetings, Robert, Dan, and fellow members of the Geekiverse. Um, um, what do you get if you cross a giraffe with a porcupine? A bloody big toothbrush. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, the Hammer Time 51 saying happy holidays. Uh, thanks for another great year. Thank you very much. Stephanie Brindle saying thanks for all you do. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, miscellaneous AB, thank you. Uh, Stephanie Lash, very generous from you as well. Thank you very much saying uh, thanks for the charity chat. Love your work on this channel. Happy holidays to all. So thank you very much to uh, to all of you. I will at some point take this hat off because it's actually quite warm in this hat. <laughs> um, uh, but I thought I would uh, just sort of say, as we're sort of in a... Uh, uh, Looking back at the year uh, mode, um, why don't we, uh, Helen, we'll start with you, just in terms of TV, uh, before we get onto sort of all of the questions that we've got, uh, what, what, what have been your sort of TV highlights of the year? What would you say has been the best TV that you've come across this year? I knew that this question would come and you asked that the last years and literally I have no idea what year it even is. <laughs> so I, I do not fully remember. I didn't well um yeah, let me let me think about it. Let Aziz answer first. I'll, Sorry. Well we'll I'm get to Aziz then and then we'll come back to you. How's about that? <laughs> and I, I might answer. 
That sounds fine. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed Foundation Season 2. I've enjoyed that show in general. Uh, that's been really fun. It's it's kind of a surprise because it's unique in that the adaptation aspect of it isn't particularly strong. But the stuff they've created to fill in the gaps is is quite strong, which I can't think of a show that's really pulled that off before, like failing to, you know, not not having a strong ad adaption, but actually being strong despite that because of their own inventions, which anyway, I highly recommend Foundation. Also a, a fan of Wheel of Time season two. I, I thought season one was just OK. I didn't love the ending of season two, but endings are hard and and I'm excited about the groundwork they've set. If it stays at this level of quality, then that'll be that'll be fine. You know, not to say that it's perfect, but I certainly enjoyed the ride. And I'm I'm watching the show. Uh, it's not very geeky, but the show uh, The Curse uh, with Nathan Fielder and Emma Stone, and it's hilarious. The, the masterful cringe humor there. So uh, I'll leave it at those three for now because it looks like we we not only have more people, but a, a new person has arrived. Hello, a new person has indeed arrived uh hi who are you and uh why are you so wonderful um i am hacks dogma um hello everybody um glad to be here happy holidays merry christmas and um i make a little bit of youtube videos about um you know whatever whatever my hyper fixation uh you know dictates um this year i kind of covered loki which was amazing um i also covered a show called from um and uh, yeah, right now I'm actually working on a video about um, censorship and the effects on public trust and kind of diverging a little bit away from from the, the standard that I've kind of set for myself. Fantastic. Well, it's great. to. I mean, Hacks and I worked closely together on Westworld in years past, um, uh, and, and Hacks is an, an awfully good person. Uh, so I'm delighted that you're here. We did, uh, by sheer coincidence, I did not set this up, we did actually have a Westworld question, uh, which uh... just appeared uh, in the chat just a moment ago. Uh, I'm just scrolling back up and see whether I can find it. Um... <laughs> Uh, in the meantime, uh, Hacks, uh, as uh, Helen can't remember anything which happened this year, uh, Aziz gave a very articulate answer. Uh, what, what's, what's your highlight in terms of TV? I know with the things you've covered, what, what would you say is the best thing on TV this year? Oh, man. <clears throat> um, so the best, thing on the best thing on TV is going to be um, is it Loki. The season two of Loki was just a phenomenal addition. Um, it kind of brought back the original plot of season one that we just kept, everybody fell in love with. Um, so it didn't like do anything drastic, um, but it kind of brought us back to the original discussion about like how governments work and what we should do as people and what is morality in this entire situation. Um, and it it really ended in such a way that was just like, magical like it ended in such a way that you're just like this is this is um this is a a organization that has like complete creative opportunity to just do these wild things that we fell in love with superheroes right um we can we can just do these outlandish things like loki can just be the god that you know he has always said that he was going to be um and and seeing that feels just so good Awesome. Um, I mean, I think I, I have to admit, I, I found when I was just thinking about this earlier, I found this year didn't have for me have as many highlights as last year where I, there were so many stand for me standout shows like Andor I thought was great. I thought House of the Dragon was great. There was a lot of really good stuff last year. Um, I would personally love to give a shout out to Wheel of Time season two, which I thought was a huge step up uh, from season one. I thought that uh, I, I enjoyed season one, but I thought season two was uh, was rollicking good tv um also if you've never seen it it's not sort of the kind of thing we normally cover on this channel but the bear if you've if you've ever um sort of come across that it's a really good uh tv show this was season two happened this year um uh and uh the other thing i would say was i think the last of us was this year right at the beginning of this year which was uh really good if you didn't get a chance to to catch that please do um but uh, Helen, have you thought of anything yet? Um, I 
think uh, season two, um, they cut it weirdly in Germany, so I'm not really sure, but um, Vikings Valhalla, which I praised last year yeah. as the first season, I loved it because I was I, I stopped watching Vikings, I think after season two, the OG Vikings. I, d- I don't know, didn't get into it. But Vikings Valhalla is standalone. You can watch it if you haven't watched the other ones. And I really, really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, epic cast and uh, I'm a big also succession fan oh, um so, good. so I, oh god yeah this season was really good um yeah and well, yeah, oh, ahsoka also. didn't you like ahsoka i remember us talking about that i did like okay so i i mean i probably get a lot of people here in chat but i really <laughs> Because you know, I'm I'm a very um well I, I, I do like the old canon. Um and you know Feloni always uh, brings in some little nice treats for people like me. <laughs> um and yeah, I, I like uh, how Thrawn was portrayed. Um I'm excited for season two. I really enjoyed it. Um I hated uh with a passion, uh, Obi Wan because I think that was really, really bad and I really <laughs> love the Joker. Yeah. Can I can I it can I tell on myself real fast? I so, have not watched any of the Star Wars TV shows. Any wow. of, that's a lot of that's any, a lot of shows to have not of watched. Yeah. yeah, that's usually how it goes, I suppose. You've yeah. you seen the films, though. I take it. Oh or, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it, I mean, it's I, just one of those things that is, it it just it doesn't cross my mind. Like it wasn't until this conversation that I've even thought of these TV shows in <laughs> like in months. You know. Um, mm. And it's just yeah. not on my radar, I guess. Like they've blown for me, they've and, blown oh go on, Helen. I, sorry. And I have just started the fall um of the House of Usher, which is so good. Mm. I've just seen the first of, Oh no? I love Well, I don't it. know, because I, I I I love the story, but the, yeah, the it's trailer different. struck it's me the, as being very different to the story. It's very that, different. It but is, so, okay. yeah. So if you like spooky horror, I totally I haven't finished it. So I'm I'm just this is my Christmas treat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh but I did promise you uh hacks are pining on Westworld. Um hacks I have oh, found goodness. the question. Okay. Uh, this is from Dilo Fan. Um uh, wondering your opinions, and this is taking us back on Westworld past season one. Personally, I didn't watch much of season two as it felt a bit like a, an afterthought compared to the exceptional story and ending of season one, which felt nicely complete. Now, I'll I'll just sort of throw my two penneth in here first, um, which was, and I suspect this doesn't come as a surprise to people who watched me covering this. I loved, adored season one of Westworld. I thought it was one of the best seasons of TV there is. Um, I thought season two was very, very good as well. Uh, not as good as season one. Season three... Uh, I enjoyed enough to cover it, uh, had some really good conversations, but I could see a few cracks by that point. By the time we got to season four, the acting was still great. The visuals were still great, um, but it would just it kind of lost uh, the attention to detail and the um, uh, the the narrative drive that there had been in, in the to start with. So that's my overall take. Um, but hacks, uh, what about you? I know you went deep into this. I mean, I was, I was very deep into it and I, I mean, I shared the same assessment. It is, it, it was a great show. Like in terms of, uh, just like what could be done. It felt like season one was this amazing thing that just made you wonder. <clears throat> and then as we like kind of panned out and got, um, more of the information, more of the world, um, it just it just felt less thought out. Um, it felt like they at that point, and they had plenty of time, right? Like they had two years per per season. Um, and and I remember like being just so upset at how long it was taking them to make these these seasons while Game of Thrones was still coming out with like magic, but then you know Game of Thrones kind of did its thing. Um, and I mentioned it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The unspeakable. Um, and uh, and uh, I'm sorry. Uh, Westworld. Westworld was a great show. Season one will forever be the the most amazing part of it. Um, and honestly, if they got the chance to do season five, it it felt like we were about to get season one all over again. Um, with just a little bit of revision, a little bit of how the world could be. Um, and 
also in a similar way of Loki, like exploring the world when you have like this person that you have like just objectively shown to be a good person um, that you know has a complete picture that they're working with would then have the the keys of the kingdom and be able to control the system like the the god that you know they would be like Dolores running the running the running things um, would have been pretty cool to see, but the way that it ends kind of you know, leads up to the idea um, or the theory that um, maybe everything that we've already seen was her best attempt, right? Like it's this cyclical thing where, um, you know, maybe who is who is ultimately controlling the uh, the show here? Um, but yeah, season one will will forever be undefeated. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with that. Let me just quickly catch up on uh, the uh, Super Chats coming through. Uh, just to confirm, as I said earlier, every single penny on the Super Chats, Super Stickers, or if you're watching this back later on the Super Thanks, um, will go straight to Crisis at Christmas, which is a fantastic homelessness uh, charity here in the UK uh, that, that help people who really, really need it. Um, Michelle Ramo, thank you very much, saying happy holidays. Thank you for all you do and the community you built. My favorite place to be on Thursdays and much love to all the friends in the chat and the mods. Uh, let's raise some money. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, relaxed like a cat. Um, do you find that, <laughs> yeah, good, good name. Do you find that fake out deaths such as Brienne and undead characters such as Lady Stoneheart weaken the impact of death on a narrative level? Um, uh, okay, well, Good question. Who should we go to with that? Let's uh, let's go to Helen. I've got some more Song of Ice and Fire ones for you, Aziz, in just one moment. Uh, let's go with the with Helen with this one. What what do you think in terms of? Um, and this isn't, I think, just in terms of a Song of Ice and Fire or something, but also something I've noticed with Star Wars recently is there's an awful lot of uh, people getting stabbed by lightsabers and then you think they're dead but then they just come back again does that kind of undermine it all a bit yeah i mean especially for <laughs> martin no i mean um in 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 others you kind of expect it uh obviously you still hear liam neeson screaming what 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 happened to me dude um but no for, for martin uh it is odd now because i mean he this is his his stick or uh to to kill off uh people and Tolkien would be like oh no but this is the hero <laughs> why is he dead yeah I mean, I think I would uh, I would agree with that. Um, we're getting lots of questions in, so I'm not going to go with everybody with all of the, every question, uh, just so you know. Otherwise, we would be here all night. Um, uh, my, my guests may may sort of come and go through the night. I, I'm I'm committed to staying here till either I fall asleep. It's now twenty past ten in the evening over here, um, <laughs> or you stop donating money. So uh, um, we'll we'll keep going for the time being. Reasonable. Um, Nicholas, uh, this is Maura Lee. Thank you very much. Picking up a question from Nicholas Snamatoruslu. Nailed it. I completely botched that. I'm guessing it's exact a pronunciation. <laughs> oh, that was perfect. Um, <laughs> saying, how much free will is there in Bran and Blood Raven uh, to change events if they are already consumed by the tree network? So uh, this sounds like an Aziz question. Uh, what, what do you reckon, Aziz? <laughs> how much? Uh, so Bran and Blood Raven, obviously. In the books, uh, Blood Raven, yes, completely yeah, hooked up to the Weirwood Network. He's got roots and things literally coming through his body. Bran is not yet in that place. Um, but how much free will do you think they have or will have? I think that they have some amount of free will. And I think in general, this question extends outside of A Song of Ice and Fire into, into some real world metaphysics, like what is free will? What is... You know, what are these concepts that we put names on that we conceptualize and using our very our human perceptions that would be different if we evolved differently? So within the framework of the story, though, we get answers and details that we can't have in real life. So it is interesting to pose the question within a, a more. Well, a different system that has magic and, and the ability to see and perceive the future and the past. So I'd say there's still free will there because. I'm not sure that there would be any point to meddling with any of it if you can't change it. And there does seem to be changes. I think we're if we're going to see that just theoretically that a future brand is talking to himself, well, then he has 
in a sense, that's a that's a loop. But there was still an initial action to to affect the past that then created that loop, and that was a choice that was made at the time. And I don't think that was predetermined. So I think if you dig through enough layers, there's always a way to way to say that someone made a choice, whether it's a higher power that you give a name to, like a deity or a god, or whether it's a character making that choice. So it's a good question, very hard question to answer, but I think ultimately to keep it, maybe to wrap it back up in a more simple way, I think, yes, I think also from an authorial perspective, I don't think it would be as interesting if if the characters didn't have choices and free will, because I think conflict is at the heart of the story. And if they don't have choices, then they don't really have that much conflict. Excellent. Good answer. Love it. Um, and Evan Power, thank you very much, saying, Happy Christmas. Your streams are the best, Robert. Thank you. Uh, have to go study, but we'll watch later. Aziz, I love your podcast. So there you go. You thank have you. a fan. Mm -hmm. um, and David Thomas um, saying, I recently saw a video and was lured in by the title, Why Stannis is the Next Night King. Uh, the argument was that he echoes the original Night King, um, or Knight's King, I assume in this case, if it's a book question, and has fallen from Melisandre. Red versus blue, fire versus ice. It was a stretch, but any thoughts? Um, well, uh, I'll pick up on this one, and I'll sort of tag team with Aziz on the uh, Song of Ice and Fire ones. Um, yeah, I, I think there, there's definitely a possibility that we... Uh, to start with, Stannis has got blue eyes, which is, is clearly very... Uh, um, uh, sort of themed along with the others, um, and he is the king, um, and yes, we get Melisandre, who is very much this fire kind of opposite to ice, that he may well also end up at some point at the Night Fort. If he does, that also echoes the Night's King. Uh, so I think we haven't yet got all of the clues here, but there is a possibility that yes, George R. R. Martin is using him as a sort of an echo of that story, perhaps a sort of an opposite echo. Of, is that is that a is that a technical phrase? I don't know. There's probably a better way of saying it, but I think you understand what I mean. He is. Uh, I don't think he's going to be set up as the new Knights King, uh, but I think he is using him as a sort of a, um, a literary echo. Um, a username redacted asking what locations in the north uh, will fall to the others. Will White Harbor be a massive refugee point for people fl um, fleeing the north? Aziz, I shall throw this one to you. Um, guys who are non song voice. <laughs> Actually, before because that, we'll let, me just double, <laughs> let me just d d double check. I, I know, um, uh, Hacks, what's, uh, are you, uh, I know you're, you, you've watched and, and enjoyed uh, Game of Thrones. Are you uh, oh, yeah. a Song of Ice and Fire person? You know, I've not, I have not given it the time that it deserves. I, I think I own all of them on Audible, and then um, started it, and then realized how hard it is to listen to an audiobook of any kind of fantasy, where like the names are just like names that you need, you need to see. Um, and so I've always like started it and put it down, um, and just not really given it like a, a good shot. Um, but yeah, I'm very familiar with the with the show. Well, in that case, uh, I will put book questions still uh, very firmly to uh, to Z's and occasionally to Helen, who uh, <laughs> I'm sure will have huge amounts of. Uh, Helen, would you want to answer this one? What do you reckon in the books? Is uh, where in the north are the others going to take? I've literally, I've, I'm tweeting about this stream. I haven't even listened. To what <laughs> you people well, are. <laughs> in that case, I, in that case, I shall, I somebody shall ask saying, Aziz. I, I thought I'd throw the saying, rest of the I'm, panel, but you know, I'll, it's, it's just the safest. Option, sorry, buddy. <laughs> well, yeah, I think uh, yes, I oh, think yeah, that I would... White Harbor's somewhat been foreshadowed to have that problem. When Davos goes there, he sees that there's already lots of people streaming into the city. Uh, because of winter, just because of the regular f f notion that it's getting colder and food's harder to get. And so you go where all the other people are. And there's a, a Davos notices empty buildings. He's like, these might could be repurposed for, for people. He even has a few spare thoughts about it while he's passing by. Uh, but he's on a different mission. So most of those thoughts kind of end up being just uh, lost in the shuffle, perhaps. But a bigger problem is disease that's been set up so i think what we we might possibly have the grayscale plot align or at least be combined with the pa fact that people will be packing in close quarters during winter trying to avoid both 
war, whether supernatural and or regular, because the Boltons and, and Stannis are fighting. So there's there's already war in the north and winter in the north. So if the others come, yeah. I don't know that they'll get as far as White Harbor, but they will certainly have an effect on the, the southern parts of the north because of the refugees, and that could kick off and or interact with all sorts of other plots in very horrible ways that are not very Christmassy on in theme, are they? <laughs> no, no, it's pretty brutal. no, there's not much Christmassy <laughs> stuff in A Song of Ice and Fire, it has to be said. Um, okay, uh, Martin I S. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh, Martin S. Hi, Martin. Um, saying, have you guys watched or read The Wheel of Time? Um, now, this one I definitely can throw at Helen uh, because I know you've uh, uh, you've dabbled, shall we say, with The Wheel of Time. What What are your thoughts on it? Uh, as you said before, I did not. So I didn't read all the books because it's literally like eight million books. Um, I think I read 30. nine four. million. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I read four. Um, yeah, I I enjoyed season two so much because I do think they finally focused on um, less characters in a way. Um, and I, I, I love where the show is going. I'm very excited for season three. Um, and you kind of, because in season one, you literally didn't feel anything for these children. You're like, they're all annoying. This, this makes not, even if you've read the, <laughs> the books in the beginning, right? And this is how I felt. I didn't, I didn't like one of them. And now you really, <laughs> no, you felt. I, I agree with you. I was bored. I read the when I read the first book, I was stuck on a Greyhound bus for 22 hours before <laughs> cell phones existed. So I'm like, it's it's, it's you wow. and me, book. This is all I, I, you're all I've got. So I plowed yeah. through it, and I but by the end, I liked it. By the end, you know, and that's kind of reflects why season two is better because the source material is also more interesting. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it is more interesting. But but finally, I don't know what what they exactly did because again, this whole year is a blur. I have a one year old baby, so I'm like, oh. um. But anyway, um, I really liked that I finally felt something for the characters, and I'm interested now in their in their story and where it takes them. And um, yeah, I I feel we things are getting together now because you know they're they're meet finally meeting up again um, at the end now, and I really really enjoyed it. And I think you said that Robert um, that you also enjoyed the few bits they that differ from the book, but they make sense in the show now in season two. Yeah, I mean, this is the kind of thing that can get you into trouble with that fandom. It has to be said. Um, uh, every every fandom has the exact. I've discovered this doing doing this. Is every fandom has the it's exact. Not here. Same Inkeeper is not here. Matt is not, Matt is not here. Uh, but uh, I am. Um, I have read. I have read the uh, uh, the Wheel of Time, um, uh, and I'm slowly listening my way back through it, trying to keep. Keep up mm. with the TV show. Um, so I'm like three books into listening through it as well. Um, uh, so I like it and I really enjoy it. Um, but yes, yeah, I think season two, if you if you watch season one and thought, yeah, I'm not that impressed. Season two is a definite step, step up as far as mm. I'm concerned. Uh, yes, I think it would be controversial if this was like a Wheel of Time discussion, but I think a lot of the <laughs> things they've done best are the things where they veered away from the books to make it work for TV. Um, so, um, yeah, do go and check that out. Hacks, did you, are, are you a Wheel of Time person? So I have not read, I have not read Wheel of Time. I have not watched Wheel of Time, but... I'm not sure. Like, should I? Which should I do first in this moment? Well, don't don't let that stop you having an opinion, hacks. I think this is. Uh... Oh, great! Well, listen, listen. I it's those those kids, those kids. I hate those kids already. <laughs> <laughs> one I, of them. I would pers <laughs> I would personally I would personally suggest the TV show. Um, okay. And uh, work your way through yeah. it. As I say, season two, def for me, a definite step up. Um, uh, season one feels. I mean, to say it feels kind of. Standard fantasy is, I mean, it's probably a bit harsh, but also I think reasonably fair. But I think when you get to season two, then it's really starting to hit its stride. Yeah, it it feels a lot like Lord of the Rings, like a like a like it's borrowing all heavily from Lord of the Rings in the season yeah. one, where they're just being pursued by, you know, it's a big, yeah. Anyway, Robert you, said it well. I, I I've read the books too, and and 
I enjoyed the, you know, it's the author died before finishing them. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a thing, but Brandon Sanderson did a good job yeah. of finishing them. Yeah. That, that yeah. is, that is quite literally the only thing that I know about the series. Um, you know, yeah. When I was, <laughs> when I was working on some of the stuff that I written, um, the, like Brandon Sanderson was a, was a big point of inspiration. I watched like a lot of his stuff and did some background on him and, and yeah, him yeah. finishing the wheel of time was just like in cataloged in the back of my mind forever. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll give but it a if shot. If you love world building, uh, it is the the books are really beautiful. If you yeah. you know like all the religious stuff and yeah, well, magic and all that. Um, the thing you'll that is really bad. I'm sorry. That's okay. The thing you'll find, I think, with the books and even even people who love the books will accept this is that the pace slows. It starts off really good. Really good book one, I think, is good. Books two, three, four is probably the uh, the where the, the story really gets going once you get about halfway two-thirds of the way through the pace slows hugely mm. uh, there are so <laughs> many characters so many things going on uh some of the descriptions are uh voluminous to, to say the least yeah. um and it Brandon Sanderson did a really good job of sort of tying it all in uh, towards the end. And, and when I say back you, up, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, I've, yeah. I've seen Rafe Judkins, who's the showrunner on Wheel of Time, speaking about this, and he, even he is just like, you know, in front of an audience of Wheel of Time fans uh, who all sort of laughed with the sort of in humor, sort of saying, well, maybe we'll sort of skate over a little bit of like the two thirds <laughs> of the way through this. So, like, everybody accepts that. But it's um, a yeah. natural thing. Like, how are they going to adapt all 14? But, well, you really don't have to because yeah. there's, yeah. <laughs> there's literally a scene where one of the main characters leads his men on a quest to discover what's going on with some grain. And then they figure it out and then they go back to what they were doing. And this is like 11 books in. Like, <laughs> like, and as he's still stuff, on the Greyhound like, bus. Yeah, like, bro, we did not need <laughs> this grain mission at all. That's beautiful. <laughs> you know. Uh, okay, yeah, let's, I'm, let's, I'm, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> Cass Bellarina saying thoughts on Doctor Who's 60th. Um, I, as uh, I'm sure if you watch this, uh, then you're aware of it. Uh, in the chat. Mm. Joe Magician's in the chat. Hi there. Hey, Matt, Joe, great to see you. Um, can he move on? He can answer Game of Thrones questions. He he could. Um, uh, I, he I did sick. ask him, but unfortunately, he's he's got a, a more important things to know. He's sick, unfortunately, poor, <laughs> poor, poor guy. So um, uh, I hope you're feeling yeah, better well. soon. Um, uh, so yeah, thoughts on Doctor Who's 60th? I'm very happy. I do. If, if anyone else has uh, has seen this, then feel free to sort of jump in as well. I am a I'm a bit of a Doctor Who junkie myself. Uh, the 60th anniversary, they brought back David Tennant as the Doctor and Donna Noble, who was a fantastic uh, companion as well. Uh, three episodes, really good fun. Um, introduced the new new Doctor, Shuti Gatwa, who um, uh, you may know from Sex Education. Sex education. Uh, and uh, he had a really strong start. So um, it was very silly, um, uh, but that's what Doctor Who is like when it's at its best. So, um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it felt like they're doing a, a, another soft reboot, which you have to do with a TV show that's 60 years old every now and then. You have to do a sort of a soft reboot. So, um, uh, yeah, it's starting afresh. Now is probably, if you've never watched Doctor Who and you're intrigued, then now is probably a good time to jump into it, I would say. Is that, is that a show that you like? You could just start watching with this new Doctor? I, that's the plan, yeah. So basically, ah. the 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 way that they did it was sort of not non spoilers for the specials that they've just done, but they the the way they set it up was that they're basically starting again with uh, Shoot to Get Were. Um, the, I'm sure that they'll anyone who sort of like exists in the sci fi fantasy world knows the basics. Oh, so he's like a time traveling person and you know uh and goes to places and has adventures in a tardis so you know the basics already uh but i the idea here is that rather than having what was probably about 14 seasons since they did the the restart again back in 2005 then uh that um uh, rather than all of that plot, looking back at it and like referencing it again, I think they're starting from scratch, basically. Uh, so yeah, now is probably a good time to jump in if you 
if you are intrigued. And they've also, and this is very important for Doctor Who because this has not always been the case, they've got budget this year uh, because they've uh, they've signed a deal. <laughs> the BBC signed a deal with Disney, uh, so oh. that if you if you're wanting to watch Doctor Who, it's now appearing worldwide on Disney. Uh, so uh, that's uh, that's where you get it, and you can tell the difference in the quality of the CGI. I can okay. assure you. Um, Carl Moxman saying, why did the first men not bat an eye on the destruction of a massive landmass only to completely give up on the first hint of a white walker? Um, I, I mean, I assume when you're saying the destruction of a massive landmass, you're talking about the Hammer of the Waters here. This is in Song of Ice and Fire question, Hammer of the Waters destroying the link between Essos and Westeros. Uh, why did they not bat an eye? I think uh, I'll, I'll answer this one, I'll, I'll put the next one over to next to Song of Ice and Fire one over to Aziz. I think um, uh, we do not know what their reaction was to that. Uh, we this is all ancient, ancient history. So they may well and possibly were completely freaked out by it. Um, uh, certainly, what followed was a massive, uh, seemingly centuries-long war against the children of the forest, uh, which seems to be how you might react if you did not react well to somebody destroying a massive landmass and you think that they were responsible. Uh, so. So I think that's uh, the answer is we we do not know the exact reaction. Uh, Katrina Simmons, thank you very much, very generous, um, saying not sticking around because I have two tiny dogs in need of walking, but thanks for supporting a great cause and happy various assorted holidays. Thank you very much. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. I'm sure we had another couple of here. Uh, Beres Aurelius saying question for everyone. Uh, mm. Have you seen the Amazon Fallout TV show trailer? And if so, what did you think? Is this a show to keep an eye on for next year? I have not. Has anyone seen this? I have. It was mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, it is run by um, uh, Lisa Joy and Jonathan Nolan. Um, it is... It is with the Westworld people. The Westworld people. Um, yep. It is... Um, it is in a, in a, in a world where, um, the, like the fallout universe, the lore is expansive. It's beautiful. There are so many good stories in that game, um, in that game series, uh, that they could really have some fun playing with and interacting with. Um, I have high hopes. The trailer was amazing. And yeah, I, I, I honestly look forward to that so very much. Um, did Helen, did you say you've seen this as well? I literally just, I saw the super chat and I watched it uh, on my phone while we were talking about <laughs> White Walkers or whatever. Uh, it looks really, really good. I'm intrigued. Awesome. Uh, well, let's go to one for Aziz. Uh, this is Maya or Mia Sinnott saying, if we get a Fire and Blood Part 2, um, will the histories and accounts get more truthful and accurate the closer they get to the current story? Interesting question. I would think so. If George has aimed to capture a lot of realities of how history, history documents work, which is with a lot of the same biases, a lot of the same, you know, closeted academic takes that you might see that, that are missing some real world angles or just the game of telephone that passes over the years, which is more in line with what the question is, is aiming at. I hope so. And I would, I, I would guess so. There's no way to be certain. Uh, we do have sort of the guide of the world of ice and fire as a, as a reference point, because it does go closer to now than F fire and blood does. And it is more accurate. It does have more detail. It has a lot about Tywin and Ned Stark, and it doesn't have things that it shouldn't know from a maester's perspective, like answers for, about the Tower of Joy or what really happened at the Tournament of Harrenhal. It doesn't know those things, but it does report the basics pretty well, and it gives us a fun secondary viewpoint to compare and, and use as a framework for showing how George likes to write history as compared to how his characters experience it. So I, I hope so, I guess is the short answer, and, and given the way he's written it, I would bet on it, but... No way to be sure until we get the book. Yes, which may well be some time away. It has to be said. Um, <laughs> in, in like the last two years, he's written like two pages. So yeah. well, that's hey gains. Uh, well, I mean, I, I I will just very briefly say, and I can't remember whether I said this on one live stream or just when I happened to be chatting to Aziz. But my my basic take is for those who missed this news story, George R. R. Martin. 
um, basically uh, said, um, I think it was in an interview a couple of weeks ago, that, uh, and he didn't put it in these words, that uh, he's no further on than he was a year earlier. Um, uh, and that obviously caused a huge amount of people to just uh, throw their hands up in the air and do the, the usual fan thing. Um, <laughs> hey, they'll my, get it when they get it. Yeah. My, my take on this is that that does not mean he's not writing it. Uh, we know the way that he writes and uh, he's told us the way that he writes. He's, he calls himself a gardener writer and he very happily, and he says that he does this, uh, he will write two, three, four chapters in a row about a certain plot line and then decide it's not quite working and then just go back, change a detail and then to write two, three, four chapters again on a slightly different offshoot. So my guess is that he has been writing. It's just that he's been writing off on a whole load of tangents that he's decided actually don't work yep. because he's in the Or he's the guy, it. he's the meme guy on the whiteboard trying to get together all the <laughs> That is That is it. That is it. He's that that, is, that yeah. is what it is, yeah. He is Charlie he Day. Pull, he can't pull a David and Dan be like, oh, I just forgot about Euron. Hmm. Yes. This is true. Yeah. Oh, they can shoot at they can shoot at yeah. dragons. Oh. Oh. Really? The best the best example of Robert's comment there is how George wrote five I think five different versions of the prologue to A Feast for Crows, one from each point of view of the different companions that are in that drinking group there. And he's like, well, let's try it from this one, this one, or this one, or this one. And I doubt he finished it, like he wrote a finished version of all five, but he wrote a substantial amount of each before he decided to, which which character to settle on. So that's part yeah. of why it takes so long is, yes, yeah, he does put a lot of effort into getting it right. And sometimes that means rewriting which which looks like no progress, but it kind of is. Yeah, and well, and like but... the like with that type of writing, like you're kind of an explorer. You're like trying to find your own story, um, you know. And writing those different perspectives is like how you do that, um, you know. And I, I honestly, I like admire that process so much because it, one, it's so difficult. Um, you know, writing anything is is such a challenge, but like it it is really like you just putting yourself in situations where you write and you create and you do it to the point where you're like, I love this. And it, and that only comes after you hate it a hundred times, you know? Um, so I'm sure he's working. I'm sure he's doing his best. And if he's not, if he's like, you know, kind of just relaxing right now, watching us talk about him, I, ho I hope, I hope he's doing good. Well, he, he needs a, he, he manages needs a crystal. to avoid. Go on, Colin. Yeah, sorry. No, I think he needs a Christopher Tolkien, you know, who's picking up all the um, uh, ideas he had and all the things he has written and just uh, creates a new Silmarillion for George R. R. Martin with the things he didn't put in. Yeah, actually, I'm going to, this is not a question from anyone, but Aziz, you, you've been in this fandom for a long time. So I, I just, <laughs> this is, as questions asked, uh, variations of this question come to me quite a lot. And I think maybe you're a person who can give a good answer, which is, um, if he did, and obviously we hope he doesn't, but, you know, he is getting old and, and, and all the rest of it. If he did stop writing now, it, 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 what is there it, that anyone could pick up? Are, are there people there who know the story? Are there people around him who um, perhaps could be trusted to take this on? What What's the situation in terms of writing the writing team around him and his notes? I suppose that would be a like game time decision. But yeah, they do have a substantial collection. He does have all his notes in one place. He writes, you know, a lot of it's in his head, but he does write in a very coordinated manner in terms of it's all in one place. He doesn't uh, have a lot of pages here and there, like some on one computer, some on another. It's all in one computer that's not connected to the internet. So it's uh, <laughs> so that limits the problems uh, he can run into. Uh, it does also limits a few of the options he has but ultimately it's fine and true story the uh, one of the authors of the expanse set that computer up for him oh, that's pretty uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. and he uh, they would probably a lot of his assistants for example are writers or aspiring writers or in a combination of the two and i don't think they would take it up but they are very well connected in the in the author thor hurl community it would be hard to find someone to finish it for him because 
it's a unique piece of work. Everybody, it's his, it's the masterpiece of a author who has had a storied career. You can't, it's not quite the same as Robert Jordan, who was an excellent author, but his story was easier to pick up. And there's more, there's more authors out there like Robert Jordan than there are like George R. R. Martin. For example, the man who finished Wheel of Time, Brandon Sanderson, said that George R. R. Martin is number one author. He came up with this the way Brandon Sanderson would. He came up with a four-tiered category system on how to determine who the best author is. It's like one of his magic systems in, <laughs> in his world. And George is the only author that checks that's a 10 on all four categories, which are that's pretty cool. Which are pros, cool. quality of prose, reach, like not you know, popularity basically, how much have been he, he scores as high as anyone on that one, or almost as high as anyone on that one. Uh, the changing how much it affected the genre which he's like well that's one that george gets a 10 and also because he he as soon as george wrote game of thrones everybody wanted to start writing dark fantasy it was like he flipped a switch and everybody was like, oh, yeah let's all do let's do that and it's um, not like people hadn't written dark stuff before obviously some of his influences are pretty dark hb lovecraft frank herbert dune i mean there's a lot of dune parallels to a song of ice and fire so yeah uh it, it would be really it's gonna be really hard to pull off so but it's gonna have to be done there's so much money in it someone's gonna do it I, I have no idea who would actually do it though it might have to be a collaborative effort but i can't think of an author that would you know this this is a thing that's come up in a lot of forums like who would be the guy to do it or a gal to do it and i've never seen an answer i'm like yeah them it might be someone that's not really well known but what a pressure what, what pressure to put on hmm. someone that's yeah you know, I, I, just, I just don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Awesome. Thank you. As I say, it's uh, it's something which comes up in very people asking in different ways. You know, could it be finished? Basically, I think is the and, and I think the answer is it would be very hard. But the notes and the information is there. Um, Kelly Summers saying George R. R. Martin is notorious for his food symbolism. Um, he he does like writing a good food description, it has to be said, uh, George R. R. Martin. Uh, do food and drink have similar importance in Tolkien? Uh, Helen, this one's coming at you, especially considering how much the hobbits love to eat. So so is there is there food symbolism in Tolkien? Yes, obviously, drinks and food. I mean, it literally it it almost starts you know in a in a pub basically um so yeah no obviously and when you when you read about um how how the elves make the lembas bread and um yeah it is and and i do think that there's more behind it because obviously Tolkien, you know was a child of war not a child but he 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 fought in a war right and and what is what is a, a big issue always you know for for people living um for normal civilians living through war um and you can see like hi, like uh little um hints for that in all through through the books uh yes obviously the hobbits are always hungry and and uh, want to have a lot of breakfast but um it, when when you read about it food is su super important even for characters uh like elves right like why do they do this weird bread thing you you would think of elves they don't eat they don't sleep you know they're just pretty and play the harp right um but no they they make food uh so i yeah i think like for martin it's important yes and i, th I think the other thing i'd add is that so particularly for hobbits ho th this is like the sign of what is the, the good life what is uh what is how we should be living what is th yeah. this or this warm and fuzzy place that we've got is the shire and what does that yeah. mean for tolkien well that means yes friends and family and and gardening but food and drink and for him smoking his pipe uh, these are the things that he thinks are representative of good um uh, so uh, yeah i think absolutely Aziz, go on. If I could shout out a fandom we have yet to mention, even in TV show or book form, even though it's one of the ones you cover here on In Deep Geek, which is The Witcher. I noticed none of us mentioned it as one of the shows of this year. That's no, not, a good, no. not a good sign. Not a good sign. Oh, anyway, not the best. Not the best. The books are also very big on mealtime as a really important mm -hmm. thing. Recurring mealtimes, when the Witcher mealtime scenes are some of the most endearing yeah. and engaging moments in the story, in the stories, and it yeah. happens at several different points. And I just wanted to say that because it's, I, it just comes to mind. Anytime someone talks about mealtime, yes, it's I'm a big A Song of Ice and Fire guy. It's my, it's my career, basically. But 
I, I think about The Witcher even more in that because of how how much love he puts in those scenes and, and fun and, and like I don't know. I, I just stands out to me. So it was worth a shout out. I feel like um I like I feel like food and eating together is such a great way to like inform the audience and literature about like how they're doing, right? Like if they're only eating bread. Um, you know, you, you kind of know that they're struggling, right? If they're at a feast, you know that like that moment is good. It, it feels like food is such a great way to to just give that insight or get that feeling something that people relate to. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's a good way to show like um, power in terms of like excess or gluttony. Um, and at the same time, like be able to, to you know, see the people who are fighting, fighting for scraps kind of thing. Um, food and food in any kind of media or story is just is kind of a really cool way to just give insight um, without explicitly saying, hey, these people are doing great. These people are struggling. Mm. Yeah, I absolutely agreed. Um, as we've mentioned The Witcher, I, th I shall just say, say my thing on The Witch Witcher season three. Um, I... I enjoyed it personally, and I know there's quite a lot of mixed views. On it. I I preferred it to season two. I think it was a step up. If you're yeah. wondering, you if you stopped at season two when we're thinking, it what's uh you know it was season three worth it? I personally I found it a step up in quality on season two, um, and also uh, trying to get back to the book. Season two veered a long way away from uh, from the books in a number of different ways. Uh, season three um, did take it back to a place that is very close to where the books were at that point uh which is good i mean i think ironically the episodes which were probably least well received by the fandom were the ones which were trying to stick the closest to the books like the one with siri in the desert and it's a like mess that. it's a mess <laughs> Yeah, you're right. Um, like the the most book adapted scene that like I agree with you is the one they hate the most and the stuff they change. They hate that just as much. It's like, yeah, they can't win. Like some of it's a problem of their own making, but I agree that it's just a mess. Like it's hard. It's hard thing to fit. And of course, losing Henry Cavill's and that's going to make the whole thing worse. Everybody yeah. had that in mind when watching. Yeah, but I agree. I think season three was better because the baddie, I mean, every good story needs a good baddie. And the baddie in season two was so bad. Not in a good way, bad. Um, so, yeah, I really yeah. did not enjoy that. So season three and the, you know, the little plot twist then, which you didn't expect. I really liked that and the way that they filmed it. The last two episodes, the the ballroom party scenes i really think that was good that was good filming and good storytelling mm. yeah episode five was strong i agree uh, which maybe made the second half even more disappointing the six seven and eight but i did like the the desert stuff was pretty good and the yeah. the, the fight between Geralt and vilgefortz was was one of the best chore choreographed yes. fights they've had since season one and uh yeah, so it did yeah. have its moments. I mean, it's like you guys were talking about Westworld. A lot of people didn't like Westworld season two, but episode, what was it, seven or eight, was one of the best episodes of any TV show ever. You know, it's just something oh, like, like... Riddle like, of the Sphinx. Yeah, that one was incredible. Yeah. It's like Game so of Thrones good. season eight gets canned, but like the, the scene before the this episode two where they have the song and Brienne gets knighted, that was a great episode. It like, was. The rest of it the season was, was like... Yeah. Hey. But like, uh, yeah, so all these things have shining lights in their darkness, you know, so if we're being, hey, this is, and this is a charity stream, so let's try to highlight <laughs> the, be the charitable about it. Yeah, yeah. let's be also about it's Christmas. It. <laughs> also, it's Christmas. Yeah, so, you know? yes. <laughs> I, I also, I also um, have sup something super important to talk about. Ooh. That is, that is One Piece. Oh, have all, okay. Have started, Tell me about One Piece. Yeah, have you all started watching One Piece yet? Because it is no, the greatest show I've ever heard made. Good things though from from good people. I would love to give me your elevator pitch for One Piece. Uh, One Piece. Okay, so imagine like a very long story in which like um, all of these individual characters um, all elaborate into their own like into their own selves until you have like this feel good story about um, you know you can do anything that you put your mind to and the power of friendship and why it's important to be there for your friends and um, you know what you can do if you come together as a team and love each other and lift each other up instead of put, put each other down. Um, you know, the, the story that happened this year was honestly some of the best animation that has ever happened um, in the world. Um, some, of the, some of the greatest moments, um, like I was literally crying over an animated man with blue hair um you know okay. go, like literally doing everything he could to make sure this plan worked under you know while they're fighting this oppressor 
Um, there is beautiful moments. There are, um, you know, lots of laughs. It is a show that does not take itself too seriously. And then while it, you know, has you like just kind of laughing along, you realize that they're actually talking about some of the hardest stuff you could ever, you could ever discuss in humanity. Um, and it is, it is beautiful. It's a great show. Ooh. Thank you very much for the recommendation. As I say, it's something I lots of people were talking about, uh, but I I'd not seen. Was that you putting your hand up, Helen? Just stretching. Okay. Um, uh, just to, to round off the Witcher for those who uh, uh, are unaware, uh, it's a looking forward rather than looking backwards thing. But there's a lot of really interesting Witcher stuff that is about to happen over the course of the next few years. Um, the we, we, there, there's obviously going to be seasons four and five of the TV show. There's two spin-offs. Uh, one uh, which is the rats, which if you've read the books, you know who that they appeared briefly at the end of uh, season three, but also an anime uh, of one of the short stories, which I'm really looking forward to. That's going to come out about this time next year. But even more excitingly, there's going to be another Witcher book uh, coming out. Uh, Andrei Sapkowski has uh, announced he is, uh, he's writing it and it will be ready by about this late next year um uh, and in english then early the year after so that's exciting that's going to be yes. probably set around the time of the the short stories um and video games we've got another witcher trilogy a sequel trilogy coming up that they've been working on uh, plus um uh, an uh, mmorpg uh plus they are redoing Witcher one uh the video game so there's Ooh. a lot of things happening in the wider witch world uh which i think i think is actually quite exciting um hogsmeade howler saying hi robert thanks for the brilliant content all year and for hosting this live stream for a great cause have a lovely christmas everyone thank you very much um eldrick stoneskin saying round of applause for robert everyone's saying nice things that's very kind of you but it's quite embarrassing uh for the round of applause for bringing the community together and for supporting those less fortunate this time of year uh thank you very much victoria gill with a lord of the rings question helen your moment has come once again um mm -hmm. uh, with the modern lifestyle and our often diverted attention spans do you think Lord of the Rings, well, actually, this is something we can probably all answer, but we can start with Helen. Do you think Lord of the Rings would have the same impact if it was released in 2023? The, the books, we're talking about the books, The books, right? I, I think we're yeah, talking yeah. about the books rather than the films. Yeah. So yeah. I do think so. I think these books are timeless. Um, and this is, look, Tolkien didn't write them in the 80s and we read them in the 90s or 2000s and like them, no, he wrote them almost 100 years ago. And look, history repeating itself. And the thing is, the these books hold topics like friendship, forgiveness, um, kindness, um, but also, you know, like good versus evil. Um, that is always in this world. This is in 2024, in 2055. Um, so because it's all based on this bigger questions and wider topics, um, I think it's a timeless classic. Is that a word or am I just making that up? That's perfect. Um, yep. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yep, yep. Does anyone else want to jump in on that one? Yeah, sure. I, I, yeah, go I ahead. Agree yeah, more. Go. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, <laughs> I, I think it, you hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, it deals with these concepts that we're all familiar with. I think the only thing that would be different if it was written, um, like currently is the bad guys would be, you know, more morally gray. You know, like <laughs> it, it feels like every fi every bit of fiction is just, just you know, uh, the bad guys need to have the justification of, of, um, you know, a lifetime. Um, and and yeah, I think that would be the only change. Yeah. yeah. But the good thing about this Tolkien thing is, you know, he let he the the bad guys are very vague. You don't know a lot about yeah. them, and I think this makes it timeless again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Part of yeah. the appeal is, yeah, is, is how little you know about Sauron. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I would say, like, the, the one thing that would be very different is that, that it's arguably the most influential piece of fantasy ever written. So if it was written in 2023, it would probably be less influential. It would still be just yeah. as amazing. It's still The quality is yeah. still there. But, yeah, it wouldn't have influenced all the, the authors that it did, which which is part of what makes it so special. But still, yeah, the quality, the prose, the, the themes, timeless, absolutely. I do wonder, like, I wonder, like, 
what kind of races we would have um, in fantasy stories, you know, because I feel like, um, mm -hmm. you know, elves and dwarves <laughs> and gnomes and like all, you know, all these things are like all coming from from one thing, you know. Even like yeah. wargs and goblins and like those things yeah. were like like some of the ones that he didn't invent. He he catapulted no, some them to where from to here. to a hundred or eleven, whatever scale you're looking yeah. at. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the, it's one of these questions is almost imponderable because uh, the the fantasy landscape is so influenced. I mean, I struggle to think of another genre that is so dominated by an author in that if you just think we, we were talking about um the wheel of time um the huge swathes of uh the the shanara books the david eddings books they are they are so influenced all of the the sort of the 70s 80s uh fantasy stories so influenced by tolkien uh, dungeons and dragons you you just look at that the world that's there oh, yeah. is so influenced by tolkien and so we, it's almost impossible to say, well, what would be the reception of the Lord of the Rings now? Because the world we have now is what it is within the fantasy genre because of Tolkien. So, um, yeah. Clearly, it's very meta. It's like his book is. is the one book to rule them all. <laughs> and he's the true Sauron. Uh. <laughs> Hashtag not Halbrand. This is very important. Yeah, well, let, let's not talk about Hellbrand. We can talk about Hellbrand, guys, if you wish to. But um, hey, this is a um, Christmas stream. <laughs> yeah, exactly, true. exactly. And and he is the giver of gifts. Hey, um, also, do y'all do y'all play D and uh, I have uh, just picked back. Uh, I've I've just picked up Baldur's Gate three after not playing oh, D and D yes. for like twenty oh, yes. years. So I'm getting it's it's so familiar. Like the rule sets are like so much of it is sim similar to how it was 20, 30 years ago. So yeah, I'm having a blast. But I'm, my character's level three, so I'm not that deep into it yet. It's beautiful. Boulder's Gate three yeah. is amazing. Um, and yeah, you know maybe uh, at some point we play D and D on stream. That, that would, would be, be cool. Actually, yeah, cool. yeah. get into it again. I did many, many years ago. Um, not quite as far ago as as, as easy as land before mobile phones. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but but many, Just many years ago, time, I was. Yeah, yeah I was. Uh, I I did indeed play quite a bit of it. Um, Darius Hutchinson, uh, Hutchinson, sorry, saying if John is king, who might be his hand um, uh, by the end uh well if you're talking king of the seven kingdoms personally i don't think he will uh become king of the seven kingdoms uh whether he might be king of the north is a different matter who his hand is obviously they went um with davos on the tv show um it's uh yeah i mean i think he's it, that that is very dependent on what happens with Stannis, and I suspect what happens with Stannis might well be a bit different to what happened on the TV show as well. So I don't think that we'll be getting that. Um, I mean, I would I would love if if this kind of thing happens, something like Sam uh, to be. I mean, I have no idea whether the timing would work, but how great would that be to have Sam there being a sort of a wise counsel to John? Yeah. Um, Catherine Firsith saying. Thanks to Robert, all the guests, and all the cats in the background for yeah. doing this for charity. The, yeah, I have noticed the cats in the background. I have no cats. My dog is uh, is fast asleep upstairs. Uh, he he uh, uh, almost gate crashed last week when he was oh, there you go. to be let out. And there's your solution. To, there's your answer to the question. Clearly, John Snow's hand will be cat, as in Lady Stoneheart. They have so much in common, you know. They're both oh dead. Love each other. They have they they have such a they're warm history. <laughs> Uh, Corvus uh, Art. Uh, <laughs> has anyone got any book recommendations? Old or new? Seasons greetings and thank you for all the fun community that you've built. Um, uh, I, well, I will give my. Th this was my. I don't think I've got a book this year that I've read that I was blown away by. But last year, um, uh, Susanna Clark's Piranesi. I would highly recommend to anyone. Um, she was the person who did. Um, uh Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, which is an excellent, excellent story, and, and then got writer's block for a couple of decades, as far as I can tell, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, dropped a fully completed manuscript on uh, on her editor's desk and said, here's the next one. Um, uh, and it's a, a thing of beauty. So Piranesi would be my uh, old or new book recommendation. Mm -hmm. um, who wants to, Hax, what about you? Have you got a book that you'd recommend? 
Um, I would love if other than your own, of course. Oh, true. <laughs> I would love if everybody. Thank you. If everybody listened to a, an audiobook uh, called Project Hail Mary, um, it. I don't think it came out this year. Uh, I believe it two years ago now. But it is a wonderful listen. Um, I I listened to it all in practically a single week. Um, it was amazing. It's a sci-fi. Um, it is like there are moments in that book or in that story that you're just like you know what maybe maybe we save this like alien species instead of our own like it is it has so much heart it is um really well done and so yeah project hail mary i happen to have read project hail mary this year as well um, <laughs> under under not under not happy circumstances unfortunately oh, there yeah. was uh there's a friend a community friend a long time a song of ice and fire person that uh that a lot of my friends are friends with as well and he uh, got brain cancer and oh. so uh he is he uh it, it's very very bad and a bunch of us recorded an audiobook for him of that like so it would be his friends reading the chapter because he lost his eyesight uh as part of hey the, that's that's beautiful so mm. that was just like six months ago um unfortunately he's since passed but they the project went forward oh. to give the book to his son who's he's got a like a four-year-old so um yeah that it is a good book. Yeah, it is really good. Definitely. Heck yeah. Wow. Um, on the brighter note, my picks would be as well besides that one, which again, I recommend. On the lighter side, I've really been enjoying the Star Wars High Republic era. Those are all very easy oh, reads. But yeah. they, but they yeah. have a lot of what current era Star Wars lacks, which is tension and the characters. You When you keep seeing same the, the stories with characters that you already know will survive because you've already seen the future uh in other stories that removes some of the tension it doesn't mean they're not good but it does mean you kind of know who's going to live and who's going to die at least in the short term so that's a great thing about the these past stories which will be coming to life on tv as well in the show the acolyte next season yeah but it's a big long era 150 years prior to you know the luke skywalker era the jedi are at a high point and they are wrestling with questions like should we have a standing military and should we you know how do we handle the ex expansion of the republic that's growing too quickly and how do we handle planets and systems that are not included in under our authority etc and there's no there's no sith at this at this point for most of the books so uh it's it's very different in, in tone and on the heavier end i would recommend the three-time winner of the hugo awards uh Broken Earth Trilogy, which um, mm -hmm. I'm about to do another run through on because it's not only great, but it's going to be a show eventually. Uh, N.K. Jemison is the showrunner of her own series. <laughs> she said she would, it would only happen on TV if she got to be the showrunner. So we're going to see a new kind of show where the, a, a very successful, well-regarded book series is adapted by the person that wrote it. So never seen that it's never happened before fingers the crossed the expanse guys were in the writer's room for the expanse which is part of the reason why that show is a cut above a lot of other adaptations but they didn't have final decision they were just a big voice in the room she's got full control apparently so that's going to be really interesting but that's still it's still years away but no good time to get started on the books you know prepare yourself because you're going to want to you're probably going to want to read them more than once they're 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 really really good awesome um and helen Book recommendations. I know you've had no chance to do anything this year, but it doesn't have to be this year. <laughs> no, no, I actually finished a massive book uh, this year, which I'm very, very proud of. But I did read a lot, actually, this year. But what uh, I remember is um, Barbarossa. And, you know, I'm big into um, the Crusades um, at this point, And I'm listening to a lot of audiobooks as well. Um, and they are actually really good YouTube channels who do who cover. Um, I think one channel is called the Crusader King or whatever. Really good one. Um, and yeah, it's about um, Barbarossa, who was a very very famous uh, German emperor, um, a bit like Charlemagne. You, how do you call him, Charlemagne? Charlemagne. Right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, Karl der Große. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's a super interesting book. And he basically died. Um, well, 
going to, um, but he was very old at that point, uh, going to uh, his crusade, to the uh, crusade, uh, the German one, and uh, going to Jerusalem. And he died on the way there. And it's um, it, it's a book about his life and his valid and good friend is telling uh, his life to his son. Uh, and it's really, really good. Um, yeah. And it's not fiction. I, I bet it's fiction, but mostly is actual factual history and a lot about the First Crusade. Um, and yeah, it, it's cool. I really enjoyed it. It's not, you, you can read it if you're not German. It's about world history. Excellent. Thank you all. Um, I'm just going to do a quick plug again for the charity because this is a uh, charity live stream. Um, this is the charity we are collecting for is... Um, Crisis at Christmas, which is an excellent homelessness charity. Uh, they don't, yes, they they provide shelter uh, for people overnight uh, and warm food in their bellies at this time of year, but also uh, try and help them out long term, uh, try and help them work out what, what are, the, are the underlying issues, how can they help them get their life back on track, back into uh, something close to or, or actual proper permanent accommodation as well. So um, uh, at this time of year, um, it's great to help people who who just need the money and just need something um, uh, who just do not have the, the, the basics uh, that we uh, happily enjoy. So uh, if you can spare any money, then I would highly uh, encourage you to do so. Uh, the way we're doing this is that any super chat, any super sticker, any super thanks. If you're watching this back, not live, you can do, you can't do a super sticker chat, but you can do a super sticker. There's a button somewhere probably on your screen. Uh, and every single penny that comes in, uh, I will make sure go straight to the charity. I will, for those who do not, uh, we, because the charity button isn't working on this channel at the moment for complicated reasons, um, I will uh, I will add it all up and then I will over on X Twitter, I will uh, show you uh, how much it all was uh, once I've added it all up and uh, the receipts so you can see it going off to the charity. So thank you very much. If you can uh, be as generous as you can afford, that would be wonderful. Uh, Nick Gull saying, hello, Robert, and thank you for all you do. Do you think there is any chance Fagon, this is my Song of Ice and Fire question, Fagon finds out that he is not a true Targaryen? Maybe Jon Snow meets him before he dies. Uh, Aziz, what do you think? Do you Where do you stand on this whole Fagon thing? For those who do not know very high level, we have this character who, in A Song of Ice and Fire, who uh, claims that he is Aegon Targaryen, the, uh, the long missing and thought uh, killed as a child, uh, son of Rhaegar Targaryen, and therefore heir to the Seven Kingdoms. Um, he has just landed in Westeros with a massive army. Um, uh, but fandom is divided on whether or not he actually is who he claims to be or whether he's actually secretly somebody else. But what what do you think, uh, Aziz? Do you think that he will find out that he isn't a true Targaryen? I'm not sure if he'll find out. Uh, I do think that there's a very good chance, though, because there's a couple of things that point to it. One will be the evidence that uh, how the dragons do or don't respond to him, if that chance ever comes up, how... Uh, the clues that other people may point out to him, uh, but I don't. But I don't think it's that easy to reveal parentage in this world, uh, except to to the readers. It might be, but to to actually this sixteen to eighteen year old boy, how are they going to convince him of who his parents really were or weren't? You know, there's just there's not a lot of mechanism for that. Whether or not Danny is a true dragon or not, which he obviously is, that doesn't necessarily prove one way or another that Aegon isn't even if the dragons don't respond to him that might be a clue but is it proof probably not he's probably not going to live a whole long time either uh Danny's also in her vision is the slayer of lies so that may be one of the lies she slays perhaps both literally and figuratively Lit figuratively meaning she exposes the lie that he's a dragon so that he's a Targaryen perhaps also literally he's slain <laughs> not just the lie itself but the person uh, so she could expose the people who have been behind his uh, rise as frauds, Varus, Illyrio, etc. Maybe John Connington comes off badly, but ultimately, I think he probably dies still thinking he's a true Targaryen. 
yeah, I think that kind of makes sense. Uh, Jonathan S. saying, Robert, you should do a Crusader Kings 3 Game of Thrones mod. Let's play. Mm -hmm. Who would you play as and what alt history from uh, Robert's Rebellion would you enjoy? Aziz, do you do a Aziz Crusader is Kings? playing that. I yeah. do that every Friday on my channel. Yeah, yeah on my Twitch, yeah. Twitch channel. I play Crusader Kings 3. Right now I have a, I'm 170 years into a House Dane playthrough. And in fact, I'm playing tomorrow with a, a character who... Out of okay, so 170 years of playing House of Dane, I've had probably 12, 15 lords. For now, for the first time, I have a character who has become Sword of the Morning, who's finally have one who's been worthy to wield <laughs> on, and he's only 16. So he's actually called Sword of the Morning in the game. You know, he's Apollo Dane is his nickname because I, I have the chatters help me name the characters. He has a sister named Artemis, twin sister named Artemis, and. It's great. It's extremely detailed. It has all the the lore and the family trees and all the you know. If you're a, a, a northerner, there's a there's a super small chance you could become a skin or you could be born with skin changer genes. If you're a uh, you know a Tyrell, you can go on to be a tournament champion and ha et cetera things like that. There's just a huge amount working with it. Now at this point, the game is still in beta because. You know, CK3 has been out for a couple of years, but the Song of Ice and Fire mod is like, like you would expect, is a huge undertaking. So you can only play Robert's Rebellion and right after Robert's Rebellion right now. In the previous version, you could play almost any timeline. So they'll be adding those in. But yeah, it's super fun. You can play Tywin, you can play Rhaegar, you can play Robert. We had in this in this timeline, Robert died during the rebellion, but Stannis was able to lead the Baratheons to victory still. But then he sent himself to the wall for some reason that we still can't figure out, which is a very Stannis thing to do. We're not sure what happened. We're just like, wait, Stannis won the war. Now he's on the wall. What the heck happened? So we just call it Stannis sent himself to the wall for some law that he broke himself. He's like, well, I got to go to the wall. So Renly became king and his descendants are still on the throne 170 years later. He had a long, he had like a 40 year reign. So it gives you a little insight to see if Renly had won, you know, that's what would have happened. <laughs> wow! Uh, yeah. So there, that's it's that's fun. where you go if yeah. you're wanting your uh, Crusader Kings three, uh, a Song of Ice and Fire mod uh, content. Um, yep. every, I Friday. Will, <laughs> every Friday, every Friday, I will possibly be doing uh, some not that I think to start with, but some other uh, video games lore playthroughs. This is one of my plans. Nice. Uh, I've got for next year. I will be uh, sort of picking a few random games and um, having a little bit of a playthrough, but doing it at my own speed. Which anyone who knows me, is what type good. of games do you do you prefer? Uh, do, you, do you have like a, a genre of games? Snail you're emoji. About? Uh, yeah, so, well, I think I'll probably start, there was ages ago, um, Aziz, I'm sure you'll be aware of this, there was a Telltale, tame, Telltale oh, yeah, Games, yeah. Uh, Game of Thrones game uh, mm -hmm. that I think I will play through, um, maybe like one of the Witcher games, and there's uh, there's a whole host of good uh, Lord of the Rings games as well. So uh, the idea is not just so much of a, a playthrough as the taking the moment to sort of uh, just sort of explain a few... Yeah, obscure facts about the worlds as we're going through them as well um yeah that is a fun part so there is a uh, to look there, forward to there's a uh, mind i think it's minds of moria um yes, game out right now out recently yeah you know yeah. I, I think it's like a, a little bit of a dungeon crawler but um you know hey i mean maybe you dive through and make little videos about uh you know of, of the possibilities yeah <laughs> that's the idea uh so yeah that will be on this channel at some point basically once i've figured out how to hook up my playstation to my laptop that which will probably take me quite a while um <laughs> uh, reflective rambling saying feel free to skip i'm never going to skip a question from you reflective rambling uh if you could have two authors past or present co-author a book that haven't who would they be and what type of story wow um uh well okay i mean i, I will just to start one and, and if anyone gets any inspiration on this then uh, go for it but i think uh wouldn't it be great to have a cross between someone like George R. R. Martin and Agatha Christie. Um, uh, <laughs> that that would be uh, really funny. You could just have a, uh, just a little whodunit set uh, somewhere in King's Landing or High Garden or something. I think that would, uh, that would work wonderfully for me. I think George um, even mentioned that, that he would love to write a murder mystery in Bravos. 
In Bravo, oh, that would be excellent. That would be a <laughs> fantastic setting. Um, so I, I would love if Stephen King and Brandon Sanderson teamed up, and Stephen King wrote the, um, it was it was a book in in uh, two perspectives. Um, Stephen King doing a like a monster, you know the the looming um, you know threat throughout the entire story, and then Brandon Sanderson was the was the hero perspective, and then you know, at some point they come together and whatever happens, happens. Hmm. Good one. Uh, unless anyone else jumps in, I will go to the next one uh, from Martin S. Uh, this is about the Rings of Power. Um, oh, Martin God. Says, uh, Don't go. so, so <laughs> Helen has strong feelings on this subject, everyone. Uh, so we may or may not go to her. Um, uh, <laughs> so it was not great in season one, says Martin S. But uh, And I buy a lot of the criticism. But one thing I can't agree with is that they made Galadriel too capable. I think her skill level was accurately portrayed in the show, given Tolkien law. Um, uh, okay, let's 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 do this. Helen, is you, your chance uh, on the Galadriel question? Um, do you think that her skill level was accurately portrayed, given you know? What well, Tolkien well, wrote about question, her. I just want to refer to this person by name. Martin, Martin S., Martin, who, who is a Martin fine, S. fine gentleman. Thank you for your question, Martin S. I completely and fully and wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, because, yes, you know, he said, <laughs> this is not what Robert expected. <laughs> um, no, he said, you know, she, she was a man-maiden, uh, right? She, she was capable of anything the men were capable of. And... That was never any, I, I didn't saw a lot of people complaining about that. It was more her attitude, how she delivered lines the way she was, rather than the things she did. Um, so that she is powerful and one of the oldest and wisest elves. Uh, yeah, that, no, totally. And I'm fine with women being strong in Tolkien and able to fight. This is not something... He particularly wrote about because you know during his time in his experience women didn't go to war right um it wasn't that they sat at home and you know doing needle work um but um they didn't partake in war um but i'm fine with with her portrayal in that regard but that's it then <laughs> everything else was wrong um, I'd, I'd be interested, uh, thank you, Helen, and thank you for holding back, because I, as I say, I know you have strong thoughts on this, but uh, <laughs> it is Christmas, but uh, either of the other two guys, any uh, any sort of thoughts from, I, I mean, I know obviously you appreciate Tolkien, but uh, you're not as deep into the uh, sort of the, the Tolkien world as, as Helen and I are. I mean, what's what was your take, either of you, on, on Rings of Power? It was one that I did not watch either. You didn't watch that one either, Hacks. I no. don't, Hacks. Skip I, it. I, okay, well, there we go. Yeah, I did Got watch it. I, I, um, it, it was unusual. Like, I definitely agree that it wasn't a great show, but I, I still found myself watching it the second it came out, even as much as I was, like, rolling my eyes at some of the stuff. Because it's one of the things you want it to be good, and it did like a lot of these other shows we talked about that were ultimately not very good or that we didn't like. It still had strong moments, it still had things that were like, oh, that was kind of cool. You know, it still had scenes where that were good, even though maybe the whole episode wasn't good. But there were, and, and you, when you're into the, when you're into a fandom, that's just you got to watch it and hope that, and just cherish those few good moments, even if there's only a few of them. But uh, I, I it's hard for me to answer. It. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That is the term, right? As far as Galadriel goes, I mean, she did seem very powerful, but that's, you know, she's like like the questioner said she's supposed to be really powerful and she's supposed yeah. to still exist later so you know there's there's no tension around whether she's going to die or not which this show also goofed by creating tension around a character that we know is not going to die so <laughs> it's like why why do that <laughs> you know like That's are they alive are they alive of course they're alive they're alive 200 years ago later like or how many <laughs> years i don't even know how many years Ooh. it is but they're definitely alive thousands later, so. that, yeah <laughs> however long it is the, yeah they're not dead we know okay yeah that's even worse than the are uh, coming than coming back is like because you there's less that removes lighter tension but this is like there was no tension in the first place yeah <laughs> but you that's know it, I think it, it was 
it was for a younger audience as well, I feel yeah, like. That's true. And that's true. and maybe they haven't seen because we're old AF, all of us here. Well, <laughs> it's not that much, but you know, the, the two top ones definitely. Yeah, hey, I, I hit thirty um, this year, all right. Oh, <laughs> baby. <laughs> um but but no, I think it was for a younger audience. And maybe they haven't seen the OG ones. You know, there are a thousand people online on YouTube. I love to watch these reaction first time watching something reactions. Have you have you ever seen one of those and it's like super young people like 16 or whatever um and they they watch lord of the rings for the first time and then they film their reaction and it's hilarious but i mean yeah there are a lot of people who haven't seen the og ones and definitely haven't read the books doubt that some of them even can read but you know it's another topic uh, yes, let's not get into educational standards today. Um, <laughs> let's go to a question from uh, Das Bursa Fleisch. Uh, saying, oh, which the... means the evil meat. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. Evil meat. So, evil meat. Uh, would there be a Lord of the Rings without Tolkien's traumatic wartime experiences? Uh, also, what holidays does Middle Earth have? What holidays Middle Earth have? Um, actually, I just been making a video about so if you Ooh. hang on until monday maybe i don't know we'll see what they can get it out for then then you will have the answer on that one but would there be a lord of the rings without tolkien's traumatic wartime experiences i, th I think is a really it's an interesting question i think clearly his creative spark was always there um yeah. uh, and i think that he as he a was child already, yeah as a child he was already creating this universe yeah. um i think what some of the the rounding of the world would would not be there but for his experiences um uh, i think certainly there's a lot of things like i mean the the obvious examples are if you think of the dead marshes if, even if you've just seen the films you can you can remember it when frodo and sam go through when you get like the marshlands and their faces down uh in sort of in the water staring up that is directly from his really traumatic uh, experiences in the battle of the somme uh with faces looking up out of puddles at him um and uh, you just think about that and you go okay that's quite horrific so there are clearly some elements that are influenced by it um and also i think that his that there's a sense of loss but hope that came out from that i did a video <laughs> ages ago so one one moment helen i'll just finish my point but i did a video ages ago about the ents and the ent wives which if you remember the ents are just like and tree beard is there going like have you seen the ent wives we've lost them they're, they're, they've gone away and it's like uh, that sense of loss is permeates now. And everyone's got sort of, where are they? Are they going to find? And the whole point is that they're lost. And if you ever read Tolkien when he writes about his wartime experiences, he's he's he clearly was hugely impacted by it, but he writes very concisely, but incredibly powerfully. And he's saying, I went to, when I when I went to war, um, I had you know 30 really good friends around me when I returned, all but one were dead. And it's just like, if you just stop and consider that for a moment, that man understands what it is to lose things, important things in your life. And I think that kind of experience played out into it. But as a whole, his creativity started well before he went off to, to war. Sorry, Helen, you were about to say something. Yeah, no, and I, I agree. I, I think we would have had similar books because mainly yes you know the war plays into it and yeah it's it, it is a story about uh, the war for the ring right but in the end it is about mythology it's about you know he created a lot of this based on him wanting to create uh, and talk about languages right and um, so he created a universe uh, around it so i think um, the topic of and a lot you know he got from north mytho mythology and all that i think those main topics are not war related and even if he wouldn't have been the soldier in the first world war i think we would have gotten something similar to it's my opinion because mm. it was more about the mythology for him and the languages and building a world and yeah war is part of that but war you know everybody's lifetime um, since our world exists. So he could have talked about another one, right? Not him being a soldier. But maybe, you know, we wouldn't have gotten that scene, as you said, about the dead marches and the personal feel. Definitely gives, uh, definitely gives like some kind of, you know, perspective or inspiration to draw from. Like, 
know, being able to see those faces and and then just recreate that in a media that will be shared with people so that it's like, you know, they can digest kind of what it was like to to be that person seeing that. I think that's just such a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, lost for words. Thank, very generous. Thank you very much um, uh, uh, for there's uh, for the uh, donation. Um, and uh, Jeremy Magician is still in the chat. Hi there, Matt. Um, uh, great to see you still. Um, Berus Aurelius saying, "Is there anything?" Gandalf, having said that, there's a, there's a whole load of uh, my patrons have given me masses of a song of ice and fire questions that I was going to shoot at Aziz, uh, but we've not even gotten to them yet. Uh, as I say, I, I might be a late night oh for me, uh, but uh, we're getting lots of Lord of the Rings ones here. Beres Aurelius saying, "Is there anything Gandalf and the Fellowship could have done to turn Saruman to their side? Would Saruman have drastically changed the outcome of the war if he was working with Gandalf?" Okay, Helen, I will throw this one at you as, as well. Could, oh, you could answer, Gandalf... I, I'm interested oh. in your reply, actually. Oh, okay. I, I don't think that they could have turned him to this. I think he was too far gone by yeah. this this point in time. Um, I think he'd been affected far too much by his studies of uh, the ring magic. And um, uh, he, I mean, he his sort of descent to the dark side, as it were, had started a long time ago. But by the time of the Lord of the Rings, yeah. then definitely he was on the wrong side. Um, would he have drastically changed the outcome of the war if he was walking, uh, working with Gandalf? Um, well, if if he didn't have his army, then the entire Rohan uh, plot, um, Battle of Helm's Deep, and things like that would not have happened. Uh, so yes, that entire bit of the story would have changed. But the for me, the whole point of this is that the, the force of arms is not what won this. Uh, it was the hobbits um, who who yeah. snuck into Mordor, um, and that was what the point is. So yes, the 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 story would have been very different had Saruman been on the good guy side. Uh, but ultimately, having a a large army would not have made that much difference. But yeah. Helen, and go on. I think, no, and you can see um, that his, you know, um, decline started early on because the elves didn't choose to give him one of the elven rings and they gave it to Gandalf. So there you see um, they choose wisely, I think. And they, it's not like they knew what would happen, but they could feel something is off. And he has other ambitions. The vibe, the vibe didn't, he didn't pass the yeah. vibe check. Exactly. He did yeah. not pass exactly. the vibe check. He did not pass the vibe check. <laughs> no, this is true. Um, Dragonborn, do you think, uh, this is a Song of Ice and Fire question, do you think uh, why no new dragons were born after the Dance of the Dragons was because the dragon eggs were poisoned or there was less magic in the world? How could the maesters poison so many dragon eggs that are supposed to exist in Westeros, um, this is this is something I've. Uh, I mean, it's not just me. Many people have opined on this. Um, the after the dance of the during the dance of the dragons, almost all of the dragons died. Um, uh, hashtag spoilers. Uh, but uh, <laughs> four uh, we know of did survive, or three or four, depending on your interpretation. Um, uh, but the important thing was that although there were lots of dragon eggs around, none of them hatched from that moment on. Or if they did hatch, then they only hatched, uh, and the maesters use various different words, stunted, deformed, uh, basically not proper dragons were born. Um, and the theory I'm working with is that the maesters poisoned the dragon eggs. Um, now, Aziz, do you go along with this theory, uh, or do you think it's something to do with there being less magic in the world? How could this happen? What What do you think? Well, there it, it is a tricky question, and I understand why there's theories about it because there isn't a clear explanation in in the in the text. And I think one thing that's explicitly true is dragons are magical creatures; they're not natural. They don't breed or procreate under the, the terms that we expect animals to do so. So. Uh, if the maesters wanted to poison and destroy them, it's certainly there's, there's very little to preclude that possibility. There's definitely other possibilities, as you say, though, magic, the waning and waxing of magic as a as a seasonal thing. Uh, the 
the idea that there are certain places around the world that have more magic than others. But I think there's also just a way that they were being raised that changed. Like they were the way that Targaryens raised dragons changed over time. And that seemed to result in progressively less powerful dragons. So there's maybe a natural explanation and it can be both. It can be a little of we'll column A, a little of column B, like the waning and waxing of magic versus also the way that they were being fed and raised and they weren't being kept in volcanoes anymore. They were kept in the dragon pit, you know, which is none of the dragon pit dragons ever got to the size of the ones raised at Dragonstone. Part of that is because they all died before they could have full lives. We don't know that some of them wouldn't have gotten bigger, but a lot of them were, died as like teenagers. So the data just isn't there. So I think the major conspiracy thing, I'm I, I I'm kind of 50-50 on it, maybe a little less than 50-50. I think it's absolutely possible. But I think George has given us, as he often does, a lot of explanations for this that are both natural and supernatural. So I'm kind of in line with saying it's a little, a little of both. There's probably some cases where... Yeah, the high towers saw how badly that the war went for both themselves personally and the realm, and were like, "Well, maybe we should influence the citadel, or maybe the citadel took it upon themselves." But it's also hard to ascribe a conspiracy to so many different individuals without any of them ever telling or talking about it, and there would have to be quite a few maesters involved in this without any of them ever saying anything. So it does suffer from some of the problems that a lot of conspiracy theories suffer from, which is that someone would why, why didn't anyone ever say anything about it it should be someone leaking but maybe not maybe not maybe they'll maybe that'll come out maybe we'll find writings maybe in the next book when sam's at the citadel we'll find mm -hmm. you know, this is if we're going to find out about it we haven't th this is where we'll find out about it we have a pov at the citadel which we have not had yet so i think some of these yeah. questions are yet to be answered and danny's eggs are the ones that Alyssa farman stole right do we Pro Probably not, probably. actually. Oh, I George, oh, we'll go probably then. not. Yeah, I probably think, not. Yes, but <laughs> go on. And why do you think not, Aziz? Oh. The way that um, the, the timing's not great on it. And we know that they had uh, that those, they don't, the, the egg, that there were definitely eggs. Ares had eggs. Ares the second. Mad King had eggs. This is much easier for Varus to have taken some and given them to Illyrio. It's just a much less. It's a much okay. simpler theory that we know that the Targaryens still had eggs at the Red Keep in the time of Ares. So it's just a much simpler explanation that, that that's where Illyrio's eggs came from is from Varys rather than. But those would be poisoned then, and then it wouldn't make. If if the, if you yeah if you if buy they into were the poisoned, poison, which... yeah if you buy into okay. the poisoning um, argument, then you're looking for eggs that were not in Westeros at yeah. that moment in time, which does give some weight to the idea that these were yeah. the ones that were in Bravos. Um, all tracks. I, I Danny's think... eggs were also already fossilized. They were already hardened, so they weren't like if the poison maybe isn't even relevant because they were already they were already they were already quote unquote dead. So it's it's all magic to explain how those hatched. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I will add just one other thing to just on the opportunity because the second Dragonborn is talking about the sort of the opportunity um, uh, without sort of touching on whether the Maesters did this. Um, I think it's probably worth pointing out that at this moment in time, the Maesters were probably the, by a long way, and particularly Grand Maester Munken is the person I'm going to name and shame, the most politically important person, powerful person at that moment in time, at any point in history of the Seven Kingdoms is my contention. Um, he was, uh, at, at the time, this was in the Regency, uh, and the king was playing no part. He had no interest at all in what was going on. So the king was not involved. The regent, and he was the only regent left at this point. They appointed seven. Six went. Uh, they appointed a couple more. They went as well. The only guy, the only man standing was this guy called Munken. Uh, he was the regent, so was ruling as king. And he was hand of the king. And there was no small council. And he was the head of the maesters, therefore in charge of all of the uh, the information uh, that's going on around. And pretty much all of the other lords of the realm at the time were children um, uh, and or were in the far north when there was a massive winter going on. So if you're looking for somebody who for a period of perhaps six months had all of the power of the realm in their hands, that was the maesters, archmaester or grandmaster Munken. So uh, I think it's possible. Uh, I personally, I think it fits. Um, 
Aziz, who is uh, one of the few people in this world who I'll bow to in terms of knowledge of A Song of Ice and Fire, clearly thinks the balance is slightly in the other way, uh, but I'll let you draw your own conclusions. <laughs> uh, for my peoples... Oh, real fast, I, I think I'm going to hop off. Uh, absolutely well thank you so much hacks uh thank you uh again it's been an absolute pleasure as i say uh I've, I've said to the guys they can jump on and jump off whenever they want to um it's been pleasure seeing you is there anywhere okay, okay. on the internet you could uh, point people towards where they can uh find? you can check me out on uh hacks dogma on youtube on twitter um robert thank you so much um you're a great friend i appreciate being here Thank you. Thank you. Um, and yeah, enjoy the enjoy the holidays. Merry Christmas, everybody. Um, and can't wait to talk to y'all soon. Absolutely. You take bye care. Bye. Thanks so much. Good evening, bye. sir. Okay. And then, oh, and it automatically changed how we're looking. Yeah, we're so time. different. Three and four is such a different look. <laughs> yeah. oh, Three is very odd. Four and is very really close. good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, three is weird. That's, it's like a lot of like a lot of things. Three is a weird number. <laughs> um, well, I have got another guest who may be turning up, um, but I just had a message saying that uh, the housemates' music was too loud at the moment. So uh, we'll see. Um, uh, for my peoples, saying the disputed lands. Uh, Amanda, uh, we're a big fan of Amanda here. Um, yes, we are. Recently, dropped and she's dropping two... videos. Yeah, she yes, dropped last recently night, yeah. dropped dropped two great videos that support my theory of the return of the Knights King or leader figure for the others. If you'd seen them, I'd like your thoughts. I have not seen them. Um, have either of you seen these videos? Not yet. I will. I just saw I got notifications and I was very happy about that. Aziz, have you seen these videos yet? I didn't see the one from last night yet, but I did see the other one. Okay. Well, yeah, um, <laughs> she is great. Uh, I think I think the answer for my peoples is that we we cannot yet comment on them. Uh, I will try and I will find some time over over the Christmas period to have a look at them. Feel free to ask me again at some point in the year, and I will let you know what I think. But uh, if it's from Amanda, then it will definitely be very well researched and well presented, uh, and definitely worth engaging with. Um, Kaya Spellarina. How did the time period that Tolkien wrote in affect his portrayal of women, or did it not at all? Um, uh, well, interesting one. Uh, well, obviously, the time period he was writing in, uh, the situation facing women, particularly in England at the time, is very different to uh, where they are now. I mean, he does get uh, quite a lot of critique uh modern critique and not having many female characters um uh, my sort of slight pushback on that is i think when you, the deeper you go into the legendary you more actually some of the strongest and most powerful characters yeah. um like luthien and the Galadriel wisest and, and the wisest are uh, are women um and of course he did the you know, i am no man uh little switch thing which yeah. uh, uh yeah. feels quite pointed if you, when you uh look at it um uh, so did it affect it well yes but i think the audience i think uh would not have received it in a in the same way that we perhaps receive it now and and he didn't talk about i mean i don't i don't know a lot about let's say 50s 60s um there were you know the main role of the women at that time was probably you know being a housewife i guess um and to be caring for the family although imagine back during wartime right who did all the jobs the men were at war in germany in england everywhere so the women were not just secretaries they did a lot of jobs right and even after the war I know that from my own family history, the women also helped rebuild the countries, right? Rebuild Germany and all the other countries. So I actually think the role um, that a lot of people who say that about Tolkien have in mind is actually wrong because this is not what women did at that time and not the women he experienced. And, you know, his his mother was a single mother. His father died very young and she took on a lot of things as well, right? So I think he had a great admiration for women and I think you can feel that in his characters and they were capable. And 
yielding a sword is not being capable you know that there are other things that make you strong and heroic um and i think you feel that and see that in his female characters he has if i can cite a single line from house of the dragon that that i think really s s uh s summarizes what you were saying there at the end from allison one of her best lines from last season was a reluctance to murder is not weakness and she shouts that at her father. I know a bunch of people who are like, yes, yes, that is so true. Yeah, reluctance to murder is not weakness. Yes, that's very true. And that's a good point. It's like, yeah, sometimes it's the braver, stronger thing to do by far. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, waiting for winter. Thank you very much. Saying hi, Robert. In a reread, I noticed that Sajora is weirdly pro Rhaegar. Despite his history with Ned as a northerner, shouldn't he think poorly of him? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll kick this off and then Aziz, happy for your thoughts on this one. Uh, I mean, I think the the extra point to make here is that Ned on a reread is weirdly pro Rhaegar as well. Um, uh, in, in as much as the people who knew him don't have many bad things to say about him. Um, uh, and I think this is George R. R. Martin trying to give us a kind of a, a hint um, and we always we, we're looking back at this, having having been thinking about it for all these years. But if you take it from the perspective of people sort of reading this through first time, I think he's giving hints that maybe Rhaegar isn't this nasty, kidnapping, horrible person that that the the histories of the Seven Kingdoms make him out to be. Um, but yeah, what was your take on Jorah and Rhaegar? I agree with that. Uh, what you said, and I would just add to it because yeah, it is that there is a lot of initial painting of Rhaegar as some something he's not in terms of cruel or uh, abusive. But also, I think getting at, at maybe part of what the question is asking is, wouldn't they look on him as soft? Like a lot of Northerners look on Southerners as soft. They are raised in easier environments. They have more access to food. They don't deal with Northern winters. They live at court, you know, and especially in his case, so he's a prince, you know, blah, blah, blah. So they would maybe look at him as soft. So I think Liana might think the idea of Rhaegar is weak or soft, but then she actually meets the man and is like, oh, okay, he's not soft. This is a guy who's actually worked really hard to be something he doesn't even necessarily believe in because he thinks it's necessary. Like he's, I seems I must be a warrior, that whole line of, of his training, mm -hmm. which, which Barristan acknowledges. And I think Jorah would have had some sense of that too. Jorah doesn't really speak negatively of Rhaegar in part because he probably saw a lot of the same qualities that Ned did. He's like, yeah, this guy has a reputation, this and that, but the, the actual Rhaegar led his men. He led from the front. He fought, he was willing to fight Robert, you know, with one-on-one -on -one combat. This guy wasn't soft. You know, he may mm -hmm. have had, there may have been plenty of criticism of him, but he, he, he fought like a warrior. He went down like a warrior. He led his men. Like those are something that a Northerner would respect. So I think the reality wasn't maybe what, uh, it was crack well, what she was presented with. You know, she she was presented an image of a man that wasn't accurate. And by the time she met him, she was like, Oh, okay, yeah, this guy's this guy's actually the real deal. He's he's a tough, you know, person worthy of respect. And that's maybe part of why she fell for him. Because if, if assuming she did, which I think she did, then it's not hard to see why, because he has a lot of these qualities, he's got this sort of weight of the world on his shoulders, like it's my responsibility to, to do the song of ice and fire and all this stuff. You can see someone, you know, falling for that in a lot of, especially a young woman, <laughs> you know, like mm. kind of romantic, right? <laughs> yeah. And actually the, the facing up to Robert Baratheon in combat, it's, uh, we, we think of Mark Addy, who obviously was wonderful as, as him. Uh, but the Robert Baratheon in the books is six foot six, I think, where we're exactly, talking yeah, yeah. pretty, pretty much two meters tall, if that's your, your currency, uh, and a hugely uh, big and strong man uh, with his war hammer. He actively sought out uh, the the leader of the, the, the other army in the center of combat each time, and pretty much each time defeated them one-on-one. -on -one. He was a fearsome warrior. So, and, and Rhaegar seems to have been like a typical Targaryen as far as we're told. We're not told that he was massively muscular or tall or anything like that. So, uh, yeah, that was that's certainly some bravery going on there. Uh, Darius uh, Hutchinson saying, uh, 
You are dropped into Westeros. Where are you? Uh, time period. What is the first thing you do and your favorite house? Okay, so where uh, let's where, where where would you like to be dropped into Westeros? I think is the the question. And my default on this is that I think the uh, the nicest place uh, is probably High Garden. Uh, that seems absolutely delightful. Yeah. Um, uh, there, yes. there there will probably be some <laughs> other places I'd want to go sightseeing to, uh, but in terms of just living, um, it's uh, we don't we don't really go there in the books but we read about it lots and it's just it's full of uh uh tourneys and uh, wandering uh through Fruit trees and of, books yeah it's, yes yeah. So trees of flowers <laughs> and, and 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 floating down rivers on boats while minstrels play uh, and it's, it seems like an amazing uh place um uh, either that or the arbor perhaps uh but uh i don't i don't know where where would you go either of you uh, you just named the two places. I mean, that's absolutely oh. right. The Arbor and the High Garden and yeah. maybe Old Town. You know, that you you nailed it. Those are like top three right there. <laughs> but what's your what's your house? Oh, house. Well, I, I mean, sure. Why not be Tyrell or Hightower then? Make, yeah. it easy. make it easy. Make life easy. I'll be a lesser. I'll be like the, the fourth son of House Hightower. No responsibility. <laughs> just, I'll read the books. I'll just hang out in the library, have some Arbor Gold. Just don't, yeah, I don't need to, yeah, I'll just do my thing. Do the yeah. equivalent of podcasting in Westeros, whatever that is. <laughs> 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 Stand on the one. top of the Hightower and shout. I yes, think like, hello. Listen. Probably. <laughs> yeah. yeah i wouldn't have i wouldn't be of much use so you know <laughs> that's why i need okay. to have money <laughs> uh where no, you are what... of use though go on and you, you, are you gonna have you got a thought on this one as well helen of course i mean everybody who knows me knows i'm a lannister i mean hello what's greater than that and you know i would go back in time and really try to get that sword um or a um, Valyrian sword. Um, so, and I would get it, you know, with I don't know trickery or whatever, and my gold, obviously. Um, so, yeah. Awesome, uh, Carlos Ballerina. A question for you here, Aziz. I think is Rosby's ward Olivar Frey, and will it matter? Uh, Oliver Frey, for those who don't know, is one of the many members of House Frey, um, but then became Rob's um, uh, squire um, yeah. uh, when uh, heading off into south and into battle, and they grew quite close. Uh, but then he was mysteriously absent for the Red Wedding. Um, the implication uh -oh. being that they knew that he was friends with Rob and therefore they didn't want him around and they dispatched him off somewhere. Um, and, uh, well, I'll, uh, as for why he might be Rosby's ward and whether he is, uh, I'll le let Aziz explain. Well, he might be Rosby's ward because he would be in hiding because of his loyalty to the Starks amongst the fray after the phrase did their thing. Uh, there were one or two other phrases that were kind of good guys they weren't at the Red Wedding, Sir Perwin being another one. So there's some, the theory is that we haven't seen or heard from Oliver since the Red Wedding, and he was seemingly very loyal to Rob. So he would have both been against what his family was doing, and they wouldn't have been able to trust him to keep it a secret if they, if so he probably wasn't even in on it. Uh, one way it can all end up is that a lot of Freys die and this, maybe this Oliver or Sir Perwin is the one who ends up in charge at the end, someone who wasn't uh, complicit in the red wedding or someone who isn't the target of revenge because of you know whoever gets that revenge whether it's aria or someone else or the starks or lady stoneheart who knows but yeah i think that i don't know about him being rosby's heir uh, uh, that's kind of a little off the beaten path for me but certainly possible because there's plenty of places all of our could hide. There's a lot. I mean, it's it's a large country, you know. <laughs> so we don't necessarily have to expect that he's one of the par characters hiding in plain sight. Um, also, the Rosby Ward has been disinherited. Cersei just was like, nah, never mind. We're taking that. We need it. <laughs> so whoever he's... A, <laughs> she, so we this character's been pushed to the side regardless of who they are yet again. So... Um, I'm not sure that's a way, a good way to introduce a character or reintroduce a character to have them not named and then have them kind of shoved aside off page anyway. 
But again, it's one of those things where, hey, it's possible. And if all of our fray pops back up, we're going to hear about where he had been hiding all this time. And that may where may very well be the answer. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, just for those who are wondering why this might be important. Rosby is one of the there's a handful of um, uh, sort of medium sized places uh, just north of uh king's landing places like maiden pool is around there as well duskendale's around there um uh, the, the the there's a lot of these places that are uh near to king's landing so always in its sphere of influence uh but th they sometimes get a little bit rebellious and this is what's happening at this point where we are at in the story is that um uh, we've got uh Cersei, who is sort of or will be ruling the roost in King's Landing, and there are some slightly rebellious lords just outside. And uh, so uh, the the question is, is she going to get distracted by all of this business that's going on there? Well, actually, a whopping great big army has just landed two weeks march away from her. Mm -hmm. uh, it's entirely possible. We're going to see a lot of these places in season two of House of the Dragon from mm -hmm. the first trailer. We've yes. already seen Rosby Shields, D Darkland Shields. We saw a shot of Duskendale, Rook's Rest. Yeah, so we're going to get to see them kind of up close. That's neat. Uh, Beris Aurelius in the chat just spotted saying, huge shout out to modders, by the way. So, uh, yes, let's do that right now. Uh, moderators, you are wonderful. Um, uh, thank you so much. Uh, you... I'll do. I'll, thank you for the entire year. Actually, I'll take my glasses off to show my sincerity. Um, uh, th there is uh, 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 YouTuber could not ask for a finer uh, set of, of mods than uh, than I have. You go above and beyond uh, the Call of Duty. You keep this uh, the chat <laughs> a safe and happy place for everybody. Um, so thank you so much. If you are there in the live chat, could you just show them a little bit of love? Um, uh, hugely appreciate it. Thank you. Um, also, Kieran Robert, McGee. Oh, go talk on. Talk about wait. Talk about your. What are you wearing? What is this? Where can people get this? I mean, <laughs> advertising here, please, good man. Uh, oh yes, sorry. I always rubbish at advertising this. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, this, this is, is such a cool design. In deep <laughs> geek, it says across the middle. This is my Christmas merch. Um. And uh, you can probably find it down link somewhere down there. It's available as uh, this is a T-shirt, but you can get hoodies, uh, sweaters, tote bags, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so if you're interested in that, then, uh, yeah, just have a look down at the link down there. Uh, and while I'm doing this random other stuff, um, patrons, thank you. I know I've not got to any of your questions yet, um, uh, but uh, I do value, I will get to them in just one moment, I promise you. Uh, but I cannot do what I do without your support. So a huge thank you uh, from me uh, for all your support throughout this year. Um, right, let's keep going with the chat. Kieran McGee, Longclaw and Dawn. Um, two swords in uh, the world of Song of Ice and Fire. I think there will be a sword swap. Danny promises Jorah a mighty sword. This she does. This is just uh, right after she gets her dragons, um, or around that time anyway. Um, uh, John needs Dawn. Um, uh, would love to hear your thoughts on how this convoluted plot comes to pass. Love you guys. Uh, yeah. So, so the 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 issue we have um, uh, is uh, so Dawn is down uh, is down in Dawn. Uh, so um, uh, Longclaw John has which is right up at the wall so at the moment they're a very long way away from each other um, uh, so any kind of sword swap if there is such a thing um, is not going to happen immediately uh, now my best guess is that Dawn, so Dawn for those who don't know this is the House Dane's sword um, and uh, it's different. All these named swords, Valyrian steel swords, uh, this is different to all of them because this is far more ancient. This is uh, uh, made from uh, the metal within a, a meteorite that fell to Earth. This is not Valyrian steel. Uh, this is storied and probably the most famous sword in, in all of Westeros. Uh, this is significant and big. And I, there's a a fair to middling chance, I think, um, though we don't have any evidence on this, that it could turn out to be Lightbringer. 
dawn equals light bringer is an obvious uh, sort of uh, linguistic trick. Um, John has Longclaw, as you've said. Uh, Longclaw is the historical sword of um, House Mormont. Uh, so yes, all of these can, and John potentially is uh, is Azora High or one of the many Azora Highs or whatever you say. So yes, the potential here for swords shifting around does make sense. Um, but what what do you think, Aziz? Is is there a chance that they could be swapping these around? I kind of doubt it. I don't really see a connection for John and the sword Don. He's not of House Dane. Uh, I don't know that the sword swap makes a lot of sense in terms of the plot. Like, why give him Longclaw in the first place if he's going to end up with a Valyrian, not a Valyrian, she'll end up with Don later. I'm not sure that works for me. I don't see it. Uh, but I do think Dawn is important to the story. And I think some of the clues to how it's going to be introduced are to be read sort of in between the lines. George had planned a five-year gap, right? And he introduced Edric Dane, who was 12 at the time. If Edric Dane had been given the five-year gap, like all the other characters, he would have been 17. And he was shown to be very honorable and a, just a very good kid all around in his short time with Arya. And how he was squire to Beric Dondarrion and tried to, you know, protected his body and was acted very noble and dutiful. So this is a kid that really looks like he was going to wield Dawn in the, in the confines of the story. But then George changed his mind. But he still wanted to bring Dawn into the story. He just can't have a 12-year-old be the, the sword of the morning. So... This is where I think High Hermitage and, and Gerald Dane, uh, a.k.a. Darkstar, comes in. Obviously not the type of person that you would expect to be worthy of wielding Dawn, but he doesn't have to be worthy to simply claim it and take it and wield it. And what better way to represent his father, his so-called father, putting father in air quotes for Fagon, to have a Dane wielding Dawn at his side legitimizing him as the son of Rhaegar, Rhaegar, whose best friend was Sir Arthur Dane, the Sword of the Morning. And what better way to recall his own famous father, if it's really his father or not, than by reminding people of that heritage by having this sort of same parallel uh, persona at his side. So I kind of think that's how Don's going to come into the story. Where it goes from there, I have no idea. But I, I don't really see it going to John. Okay. Uh, that's, that's fair. I mean, I don't think I would, uh, disagree with, uh, with much of that. I mean, I, I definitely agree with the thematic idea of, uh, um, uh, Gerald Dane with Dawn joining up with, uh, with Fagon. I think that makes sense. Um, why don't we, uh, as we have you here at the moment, Helen, I know you've got to go at some point soon. Um, Five minutes. why don't, What's that? Five minutes, I would go. Okay, well, uh, let's give you a, a Lord of the Rings question or two. Um, uh, and uh, this is there's a Kelly Summers question from one of my patrons. What would have happened if Smaug had acquired the One Ring? Um, so <laughs> so what, what, what do you think to that one? Oh, okay. How get quiet the one ring. Um well I mean the the, the dragons I just I don't know, you answered fast. Sorry, I have to think about that one. I just, I mean, I, I do not like this what if uh questions. I'm not a big fan. I always skip these videos if people have these videos, but um yeah, you answered fast. I'll think about it for a second. Sorry, it's very uh, late. Yes, uh, yeah, it's it's late later for Helen than it is for me. Um, so the, uh, I mean, it, clearly Smaug is a very powerful being, uh, and having the One Ring would increase Smaug's power, probably also increase Smaug's greed. Um, so I think that the first thing you would say is that whereas Smaug seems to have very happily gained all the gold in Erebor and in just like lay on it and fell asleep on it for quite a long time i suspect that what would have happened is that smaug would have then uh, gone searching for even more so i think the first thing to say is that uh, there would be a trail of devastation across uh, northern uh, middle earth 
Um, it's... And Saren would feel and know where the ring then is. You know, the whole thing with the with the hobbits was, you know, it it stayed hidden with Smaug. Obviously, he would find out. No. Yes, I think he, I think it would become obvious if um, if Smaug had the ring. I mean, I think this is one of those sort of uh, the, the the fun question as a part of this is uh, would the ring. Uh, expand out. We 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 take this idea that the ring shifts and changes its size according to the uh, the the owner at the time. Yeah. Um, but does that include going out into like a, a talon of of a dragon? Would it sort of expand out no. in size to be? Um, in, in which case, you're saying that he can't wear the ring. He could just be be have possession of it. Uh, so yeah, so it's a fun question, um, but I think I think the answer is bad things. Um, yeah, and again, the ring would try to escape, you know, because it wants to go back to uh, his master, and it, it's easier with somebody like Smaug to actually escape um, Smaug. Yes, absolutely. Um, let's go to um, do. You, do you want another Lord of the Rings one, or are you happy to some part? Oh look, Kelly, Kelly, Kelly is um, Kelly is clarifying the question here in the oh, okay. chat. She's in the chat. Hi, Kelly. By the way, she's awesome. Uh, the context was a bit more: Would Smaug be controlled by the? So, sorry, it just disappeared. Um, by the ring's power, or would he have enough power to use it himself, like Galadriel or Gandalf? Um. What do you think? So, are you controlled, <laughs> or do you control? No, I find that an interesting question. I think it's a bit of both uh, with the, the the One Ring. Is that um, so? Just to take one of the the simplest characters who had control of the One Ring at a p point in time, Sam. Um, would the One Ring have controlled him? Well, you could say yes, it would have done. It would have taken him over. It would have changed his personality and what he was like. But at the same time, he also would have gone, if you've read that little bit of The Lord of the Rings, you know his temptations were about having a massive garden and being with the greatest gardener in the whole world. He would have also controlled it uh, to do achieve the things that he would want to do. And it's so it's not a, like a you're in one of two camps it's the where is the the balance where is the dividing line between these two things so whereas somebody like um gandalf or galadriel if they had the one ring uh that they, they might have more sort of power and control over it it would also have great power and control over them so it's a two-way thing and i think that would apply also to smaug so Yes, it would it would change him and affect him and have control over him, but also he would be able to control and use its power. Yeah, and I find it fascinating. I, I thought I understand her question differently. Um, I, I thought she was saying the other elven rings in comparison. And it's interesting, you know, that the elven rings basically are switchable like you you know you can hand that ring uh to to gandalf then and then that ring can be handed over to somebody else and it also because those rings adapt to the power the one ring in a way is a bit different how it works and it always wants to go back to his master right um and i find that fascinating if you the the distinguishing be, between the rings although all are powerful in in their own way and enhance somebody's power. Absolutely. Um, Cash Ballerina, thank you so much for the uh, super sticker. Um, Helen, just shout when you need to go, by the way. I'm just going to carry yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, two more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm just going to go plowing on through uh, the chat. Um, have we got any more? We do. Stringer Studios. Um, uh, this is, I uh, love this group. Uh, Thank you. They're, they're good people uh, I've invited. I've got immaculate taste in friends. Uh, will Barbary Dustin get Ned's bones? If so, will she destroy them or will they uh, eventually reside in the crypts? Um, yeah, fun fun question. So for those who are unaware, Barbary Dustin, book-only character, um, she has uh, a grudge against Ned Stark. Um, uh, 
a long-standing grudge against Ned Stark. It has to be said uh, that I'm not going to go to all of the backstory on that one, but basically she has vowed that his bones will never get to Winterfell's crypts. His bones uh, were last seen going heading towards the neck, and she has put people out uh, there watching if they ever emerge. She also, being in Winterfell at the time, um, has gone to just double check in the Winterfell crypts to make sure that they're not already there. Um, so, uh, Aziz, what do you think? Will she find them? She clearly is hunting for them. Will she manage to find Ned Stark's bones and destroy them, or are they going to make it past her machinations? I think they'll make it because the fact that they haven't been seen yet is suspicious, which indicates that they're waiting, which might mean they're aware of exactly what faces them. We have a similar example to draw on, which was not interfered with to give a, which presents us with this timeline conundrum in the first place, which is ladies bones. Ned sent lady back to hmm. Winterfell rather than let that Lannister woman turn her into a coat. Right. So he had four guards sent. And we remember it's very sad when Bran and Rickon and, and, and Maester Lewin and everybody, they encounter lady being brought back. It's a very sad moment. And Ned dies in the same book <laughs> later in the book, but in the same book, book one, and his bones still haven't made it back. Like Catelyn dies before those bones ever, like she sees them, right? They've made it to River Run. But then why haven't they made it to Winterfell? Uh, it's probably because there's war in the north now and because Rob's will has been dispatched through uh, the neck where the bones would have passed, where Helen Reed is. And that's quite possibly where the bones are waiting in transit with Howland Reed and people who are aware of what's going on in the north that are like, yo, do not go there right now. <laughs> they might not even know about Lady Dustin. But by mm -hmm. the time they've gotten to the neck, Winterfell's been sacked and taken by, well, in reality, by the Boltons. But the public explanation is the Ironborn. Either way, Winterfell's been sacked. So going back there is already sketchy because they would have heard that. They're like, we're on our way home to take Ned's bones. And then wait, wait, Winterfell, what happened to Winterfell? Oh, it's ruled by Boltons and or Iron Men. Yeah, I don't want to go there anymore. We can hold on to these bones for now. So there, there's a very good reason. There's several very good reasons why they would just hold up. Uh, and ultimately, they may also be aware that Lady Dustin is waiting for them. Uh, that one, probably not. But even that's possible. So... No, like that's like six reasons for them to be waiting or or holding up the the transit yeah so i mean my general take is that there is very probably a big party of stark loyalists going on in the neck at the moment uh with howland reed mage mormont galbert glover um the, the the gang who are heading up north with the uh, uh the bones and so they will emerge at some point and yeah i think i'm with you that they will they will wait until winterfell is secure and then they'll head up whether the question is whether once they've made their way up to um to winterfell she then personally tries to do something uh, to disrupt things. I think that's the, the big question. Uh, and we're going to go now? You, you can go now, yeah. Um, uh, thank you so much, Helen. It's been Bye, an Helen. absolute delight. Uh, is there anywhere that you would like to direct people to if they wish to find more of you on the internet? No. No. <laughs> 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 uh, that case... presence will remain mysterious exactly <laughs> exactly so i'll see aziz soon we go to this wonderful con in january mm -hmm. and aziz will meet uh, all my crazy cats and and Oshea and aziz will uh i'll see them soon i'll see That's you right. soon Robert. and the chat you know don't find me. I'll see you whenever. Probably next year, next Christmas. <laughs> Have a beautiful Christmas, everybody. Be okay, kind, be it. nice. Bye. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, let's. Um, uh, how? I mean, how? How much longer have I got you for, Aziz? Just so I'm. I could go. I could go for at least another twenty minutes. Okay, well, in that yeah. case, um, uh, if you've got your questions in the chat, I will come back to them. I'm going to plow through a few of these questions from my patrons, uh, which is sort of a song of ice and fire. 
heavy. Um, let's go to uh, Corvus Connex saying, Hi, Robert. I have a curiosity about the significance of Sansa losing Lady. Um, I always interpreted it to mean that she would never again regain her starkness, possibly become Lady of the Eyrie. Could you talk about Lady's death and what it foreshadows? So, what what do you what do you think what do you think it means? Yeah, it's really tricky because I think some people interpret it that she's losing her Stark identity, where really I think that she's severed from it. More, it's not that she's lost it; it's that she's cut off from it. And at that time, she does enter a, a long period of very much being cut off from her Stark identity. She's stuck at court. She's basically under Cersei's thumb where she's forcibly uh, married to Joffrey and then to Tyr and then that's changed and she's in shamed in front of the court, even though to her it's a bit of a relief that she's not doesn't have to marry Joffrey. But she has to play it off as if she's embarrassed and humiliated and set aside by the king. And then she has to be forcibly married to Tyrion and do all these things. And all this time she has to put up a front it's the the thing that she's been trained for in some ways but she never imagined it would be like this and that's the a courtesy as a lady's armor so she's always putting on a brave face and pretending that everything is fine which she always knew she would have to do but she didn't expect it to be such a dramatic lie a uh, misrepresentation of how she actually feels but you understand she has to do it as a matter of survival but ultimately i do think her story is going to lead back north and she is going to prove herself to be a northerner in in a, in in a way similar to how characters like Arya and Jon are proving or will prove that that they are ultimately Starks more than anything else and perhaps Jon is the one that it matters most for because there's no doubt Arya is a Stark she looks like Ned she's always had these stubborn values that people associate with Starks Sansa's is the one that people question that about. And John's the one who is not literally a Stark. And he also has this Targaryen heritage that everybody knows is going to jump out of nowhere in terms of John's perspective. He's going to have that dropped on him. But but his behavior and his personality are very Stark-like. So I think that Sansa and John in that, in that way, both, they both have that Starkness sort of to prove uh, to the reader and maybe to themselves as well, to prove that they maybe belong uh, back there. And... That in that that by itself makes them more worthy in the first place of a question that they shouldn't maybe have to answer, but they're going to have to. You know, the the, the story is going to make them have to answer that, and I think they will in their own different ways. And uh, so ultimately, I think Lady is a step along the way for Sansa rather than her end state, rather than something permanent. Yeah, I do. I'd agree with that totally. I think the other thing is just worth noting. George R. Martin has said that. Um, all of the Stark kids have got this kind of wagging ability. It's just that Lady was killed too soon for us to see Sansa's, um, which I think both underlines, <clears throat> pardon me, both underlines her Starkishness, and I, I agree her her arc is taking her back to Winterfell, um, but also does open up this possibility that we've seen. We've seen the other Starks doing this stuff. We've we've seen Arya has been wogging into not not just Nymeria but also Cats when she's in Bravos. Uh, we obviously know that Bran does, Rickon does. Very very obviously, Rob did. Though we never saw things from his POV. Um, yeah. But Sansa has the ability. Is she going to do something in the future? Um, I think that we've generally always viewed her as being like, this is the non-magical storyline. But I think we shouldn't assume that. I think that there's a there's a very real chance that there might be some uh, sort of skin changing going on with her at some point as well. Yeah, maybe just a, a moment or two, a sentence or two, a vague, a vague one-liner from George could do a whole... Could, could do a lot in yeah. that regard. It's all it would take. <laughs> yeah, and and it's maybe uh, she's often referred to as like little bird and things like this, and she sort of stares out from the eyrie at, at the uh, I think they're the eagles who are flying. So it's possible that there might be a sort of a, a, a bird walking going on there at some point. But yeah, that, mm. that's going into the realms of speculation. But Falcon, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, Let's go to, um, uh, oh, this is an interesting one. Magma Frost uh, saying, Beleriand is the only dragon we know 
who was named after a Valyrian god while the Valyrian civilization still existed. Um, do you think this was common practice in Old Valyria, or was Valerion considered special? Was the good Valerion actively worshipped, or would it have been more like a modern person naming their dog Zeus? Uh, what do you think this says about Valerion's relationship with their religion? Well, um, uh, I'm I grinning. I'm grinning. Good, because uh, <laughs> I, I think the the, the the starting point for this is we do not know much. Um, uh, and I think we have to be upfront about this, is that we haven't got huge amounts of information about the Valyrian gods, their religion, how this worked. But it is, a, I think, a really interesting observation that uh, this wasn't just uh, the Targaryens naming their dragons after gods of their old, old homeland. Valerian was named, presumably, while that civilization was still up and running so what do you think the kind of the implications of that might be yeah that's a great question i did i did bring this up in in the history of westeros's video on balerion because i noticed the same thing and it, the uh the other side of that is yes Meraxes and vagar were thus named at a time when they were basically the only dragons in the world so it's definitely not as meaningful even mm. if it maybe was just standard practice so yeah, I think it's a big deal that Balerion was named Balerion in a time when there were hundreds of dragons. Whereas, we're, so you're naming a dragon after a god at a time when there's hundreds of other dragons around. So either that means there's just hundreds of Valyrian gods, which is possible, but not all that likely, or they knew something was special about this dragon and or it was just a very bold thing to do. Maybe they were being a little bit provocative by choosing that name. Uh, but my pet theory to explain this is that this is the same era of Danis the Dreamer. Danis the Dreamer, the very mm. person that predicted the doom. Now, what makes sense more that Danis the Dreamer's vision was believed out of nowhere or that she had credibility because she had already had lots of visions that had come true and they were like, oh, she's predicted many things that's why we have to take this one so seriously she does, probably doesn't have that much credibility if it's her first prediction so she'd probably predicted a lot of things and one of them maybe was related to this dragon she may have seen balerion balerion after all would have quite a future ahead of him even though it's an animal we're talking about if you're looking at any random dragon in the freehold there you would from a dreamer's perspective they would just their doom would be coming soon but for balerion yeah. this one example this one dragon out of all of them is going to survive besides actually a couple others went with him that survived but didn't live to aegon's time so there were a couple other survivors but this would have been the youngest one and maybe she saw how huge balerion would be there's lots of things you can imagine that would be outstanding about this dragon's future if you're thinking from the perspective of of someone that can see the future so like if you look at like a wheel of time thing where you use the the more aura they have is because of how big their destiny is valerian's destiny out of all the dragons in valeria at the time was just va much vaster like by orders of magnitude so from that perspective you can see why there would have been from danis or from some other source some reason to think this dragon was special and thus it may have earned a special name uh from early on uh but of course like robert said at the beginning ultimately that's just some theory <laughs> <laughs> we really don't know but i think there has to be something like it's we're right i think our insight is is correct that this is significant even if we can't interpret the significance of it i think it is significant yeah i think i, I think it, it it is significant but as i say we, we don't know i i do hope perhaps house of the dragon dropped a couple of small nuggets of, of information about uh, Valeria through um, uh, Viserys and his his big uh, um, uh, sort of model that he's been, he's been he's been making and he sort of dropped in uh, about the Anogrion and uh, the source of the power and things like that so I'm I'm hopeful we might get another couple of uh, little nuggets of information uh, yes, coming please. about that. <laughs> Um, let's have another, uh, actually, th this is another interesting one, actually, again, from Mag Magrafrost, um, uh, saying, uh, 
Uh, you've said in the past, this is me, I've said in the past that the Hammer of the Waters cut off the Weirwood Network's connection to Essos, but the land it destroyed was connected to Dawn, which doesn't have any Weirwoods to begin with. So how could the network have been connected to Essos through the Arm of Dawn? Uh, now, which is a really interesting question. So for context, um, I mean, this isn't a... Uh, I mean, I don't know whether I've ever stated it as as fact, but this is just my working theory. Many people's working theory is that um, the the shade of the evening. In fact, I, th I think we're talking about Amanda. Disputed Lands has done a very good video on this uh, in the past. Uh, the shade of the evening trees are very similar to uh, the um, weirwood trees, but do feel a sort of like a. Uh, maybe they're sort of uh, corrupted, um, uh, they're sort of inverse of them in some way. And the working theory is that the Weirwood network is all connected underground, and that if you did have this Hammer of the Waters cutting off Westeros from Essos, perhaps that cut off all of the Weirwood trees in Essos from the heart of the Weirwood network. Um, and perhaps that's what turned corrupted weirwood trees into shade of the evening trees. So it's 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 one of those theories that do we have any hard and fast evidence for it? No. Does it kind of fit all the facts? Yes. Um, uh, but uh, yes, are we ever going to truly find out? I suspect probably not. Um, uh, so so that's a sort of the background to it. Um, but what what's your take on on dot well I'd, I'd happily have your take on that as a theory uh but sort of the, and, and the sort of the follow-up into the question Magnum frost was asking is that uh is dawn do you think this impasse that there are at the moment as far as we can tell no uh weirwoods in dawn the children of the forest call it the empty land um uh is your take that there never have been or uh, or it's just that they got all chopped down. What, what's what's going on there? It's kind of hard to imagine that there were never any there. But how long ago is are we talking about? Like we could we there's the era around when the land bridge was destroyed, which should have had an impact on the local geography, but not not necessarily the entire region of Dorne, but certainly would have changed some of the region's climate and thus could have affected what would and could exist there so but there's a chance it's been a desert for just tens of thousands of years in which case yeah i can see just nowhere woods being there except maybe in some of the higher places maybe there's a few exceptions but even those are pretty dry so on the other hand there is the presence of the ific hevron in essos who are given the descriptions which are very vague woods walkers, forest walkers who are small people in the forests of Essos, northern Essos. And they sound a lot like the children of the forest. They might not be, but if they are, then there's got to be a connection between the two. And that would mean the only way they could have connected is through that ancient land bridge, unless there's some magical means. I don't really foresee there being this, the tunnel system that's so deep that it goes below the ocean. That's a bit much. But the I think the presence of a, a children of the forest like species in Essos gives some strong basis to the idea that there's a connection um, somehow. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, I think I think we're probably in the same boat on this one is it, it kind of makes sense um uh i mean i think in with in dawn the fact that there aren't any trees uh, i mean one of the few things we do know about the first men when they first came across is that they did quite a lot of deforestation uh so um it's entirely possible that they did just i mean that's the climate is quite warm there anyway but uh it's um if they, if they were chopping down weirwood trees, then that's why there aren't any weirwood trees there. And perhaps that's why it is so um, arid as a land. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're speculating. George R. Martin always emphasizes the the things in the Dawn Age and the Age of Heroes are so long ago that we can't even take 
the stories that we do have as being actual fact. These are legends. These these are just sort of like uh, the 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 bits of truth that have been passed down and uh, from generation to generation. Let's go to. Um, a uh, question from Travis saying, a follow-up from last week. Why did Ned never tell Cat about John? Uh, I can see why not straight away, as they're practically strangers. Um, but after they fell in love and Ned trusted her and saw her as a partner, why did he not tell her then? Um, I did do a, a, a short on this recently, which you can find somewhere on this channel and also on TikTok. I'm on TikTok now, if you have uh, not found me over there. Um, but uh, yeah, so so my my take on it is that um, basically Ned was traumatized by what happened during Robert's Rebellion. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see this by the way that he has nightmares about it still uh he doesn't want to think about it talk about it his actions at the time seem just so ludicrously over the top not telling people not 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 telling people where their relatives were buried in case it shows them where the tower of joy was tearing the tower of joy down stone by stone which isn't what that's not what in uh in his fever dream that's an actual memory of him this is just completely over and above everything that you thought a normal sane person would do he was completely traumatized by whatever happened there um and yeah. probably he made a promise yeah uh to tell no one um and i think that all of that bundles up so yes we all agree you can understand why he didn't tell cat straight away because he barely knew her but then two five years later does he want to bring this all back up again he's I don't think so. He's locked it in an icy prison. Like you said, it's the best way to explain how he doesn't think about things other than just saying, oh, it's a thorough license. I don't want to give away. I don't want him to think about John Snow's parentage. Trauma is a is a, is a a human and accurate way to describe a way why people aren't, why someone's not thinking about something. Repressed memories. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely fits. Yeah. By the um, way, you've got uh, Quinn's ideas in the chat there. Just stop by to say oh, hello. Hi, great to see you. Sorry, hey, I didn't Quinn. have mm -hmm. spotted you know, I, I had Quinn on a long time ago, but uh, fantastic. Um, and I'll do a quick shout out for those who do not know Quinn's ideas. Um, excellent channel covering, among other okay. things, mostly sci fi these days and particularly June. Um, and I would highly recommend uh, checking mm. out if you're the June. Part two is coming out, I believe, in March uh, of, of next year, um, and it, the trailers look amazing. So if you're if you're wanting to get into a bit of uh, the background about that, then I highly recommend checking out Quinn's ideas, books and and movies. Yeah, he's an expert, absolutely. Um, fantastic uh, question from Travis about uh, this is a song of ice and fire again. Uh, what? holidays religious or otherwise do the denizens of planetos celebrate most feasts and parties we see are associated with life events like marriages are there any festivals associated with holidays in westeros or essos so this is interesting as i say i've got a video coming out about uh holidays in middle earth uh, at some point in the next few days but um holidays in westeros is a is an interesting one because you're right they're not they're not they're clear and present in front of us there's lots, lots of talk about weddings and name days and things but not so much can you think of any uh, aziz i could think of maybe maybe one or two yeah there's this the maiden's day i think uh and there's the some holidays that would correspond to real world medieval holidays that don't fall on a certain day like the harvest day things like that 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 are more seasonal that happen based on certain conditions rather than a specific day on a calendar because calendars aren't a thing you know for most people for peasants who are illiterate right that's the whole idea of a holiday works a little differently but that said it's also the peasants and commoners who are the ones celebrating a lot of these holidays and the song of ice and fire for example is mostly characters who are in the upper class so we also just don't have their perspective on a lot of these things um but yeah, it's kind of a kind of a long-winded way to say not really. There's a couple that we know of, like you said, but I don't I don't really know what I can't think of any other ones. Um Yeah, I I I've, I have a vague memory <laughs> of Marjorie once talking about a 
uh, they they have a feast on the first harvest moon or something like that. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, there's not. It, it's not a major thing, and and this is one of those bits of sort of world building that George R. R. Martin did kind of, um, uh, or, or didn't focus on so much. Uh, there's there's a lot of world building that he clearly did huge amounts on. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, sort of festivals and holidays we don't see uh, so much. Um, let's go to. Um, Oh, so House of the Dragon question. Uh, actually, it's quite an interesting one. Johnny Targs uh, saying, Hola, Robert. Hola to you. Um, uh, and please keep up the great work, everyone. My question is, what in House of the Dragon Season 2 do you think will be the biggest change or delineation from the books? Um, which is interesting. So with, with no spoilers here. I know you're not really a spoilers person yourself either. Um, uh, but we've had the... The trailer um and we obviously know what happened in season one um and season one at a high level did stick to the books but there clearly were quite a few different things where they decided to go in different directions um i mean episode just random i think episode nine is as a, a classic example that's almost completely new um uh, so what if you had to guess based on what should in the books be happening in the course of season two where do you think they might be going that might be different i think they might try to lean a little more into the dreaming supernatural stuff that ironically game of thrones which has more of it did less of because we know in retrospect that david and dan thought that they wouldn't be received very well so they they tamped it down, whereas Ryan Condal doesn't seem to think that way and seems to understand that that's not the case, that fans do like that as long as it's handled well. So since there's not very much of it, of that sort of thing in the maesterly history, why would there be much of it? Then I think that's where there's room for them to expand. And they, they could do that in the north. They could do that with dragon lore. They could do that with uh, Alice Rivers. They could do that with any Targaryen dreamer. Helena, they already made her a dreamer. And that's not in, that's not in Fire and Blood. So they could, they could build on that or expand on that. So I think that's, I think supernatural, it's kind of a vague maybe category, but I think that's, that's where they have the most room to surprise us. Other than just maybe they have a character die that doesn't die or the other way around. That would be shocking. There's probably going to be that. That's probably going to happen once or twice throughout the rest of the, show, the run of the show. Um, but it may not be the most surprising thing or the biggest change. This, this might be a bigger change or implied change. So, and, and maybe more, I'm hoping more for. Of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think I would agree that that's definitely something which is, is happening on the show. I think there's a couple of things which we saw in the trailer, which we can probably s extrapolate out from. We saw a couple of people on Dragonback looking like they might be in combat or certainly angry. People like Baylor and yeah, Rhaenyra, who in the book weren't really involved in battles. Um, right. So it's possible that they might go down that route. Secondly, we saw... I wasn't sure when I first saw the image, but uh, people reliably informed me that that shot of the North that we had, that those were Night's Watch characters. Now, uh, if that's the case, then um, uh, we didn't really in the book, Jace, yes, went to the North, but it was mostly sort of Winterfell and uh, things like that. But we might go up to the wall and we might see more things going on up there. There's a lot of scope, I think, for them doing things in that bit of plot because in the book, they just basically, they just said, he went up there, here's a couple of outcomes. They had a pact and they agreed that they were joining the war. Um, but here's a whole load of rumours, things mm -hmm. that might have happened. Um, so I think that there's a fair to middling chance that... Uh, they will use that particularly as they've gone quite heavy on this whole threat from the north thing. Yeah, Aegon's um, dream and all that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that fits in that with that very nicely. And 
yeah, it would give them room to to play with that plot line and to give more screen time to Krieg and Stark, which they probably want to do. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, Mara Lee has a question. Hi again, Mara. Hi, saying, Mara. Um, in fact, actually, just, I don't know how she knew you were going to be on here. A question specifically for Aziz <laughs> um, saying uh, to do with uh, Lady Stoneheart, Rob's will and the Stark succession crisis. What will be her role in helping to solve the issue? And uh, what do you think will finally give her peace of mind in the books? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the most peace of mind she could get is learning that all of her children, other than Rob, who she saw die, are actually alive. Well, who she thinks that Arya, Rickon, and Bran are all dead. Finding out that all three of them are alive would be... Well, I don't know how it works when you're an undead, semi-revenant type being, but she sure, sure, it seems like that would matter to her because uh, that's what you would expect a mother to care so much about, right? Uh, and it's a very human and natural, as well as perhaps vengeance of some kind being passed down on the phrase and or Lannisters, mostly the phrase because Tywin's already dead. So there's, you know, Cersei, maybe she, something could happen to her, but we know Cersei didn't actually have anything to do with the Red Wedding. So Cersei has crimes to answer for, just not that one. <laughs> and yeah. uh, so the phrase, get it, having someone give vengeance to the phrase, whether it's her or her helping or someone else doing it, I think would help her rest. Uh, may, but maybe it needs those two things. Maybe vengeance for her children, vengeance for Rob and learning that her children are alive. Those two things together might, it's hard to imagine her getting more than that, right? Those are both pretty reasonable outcomes, but I'm not sure what else would be. You know, maybe her, maybe the kingdom of the North being restored, maybe seeing that, that might help too, you know? Um, but the way she's portrayed, it doesn't seem like she's going to be uh, a character that's like around at the end, say, for example, you know? So I do think that having a, a, like a relatively peaceful end or positive end for such a tormented character would be, it's, it's reasonably set up and would be would be nice. I don't know if that's what we'll get, but I, I could see that happening. Yeah, I think so. I would agree completely that it's her her anger comes from her belief that her children, most of her children, are dead. Um, and if she gets any peace, it's a discovery that they're not. Um, and also in vengeance, because her her. her her character is very much about vengeance now and it's against the phrase. Uh, so yeah, I think those are the two key um, elements there. Um, just shout when you do need to go, by the way, Aziz, I, I'm not really keeping track of time. Um, Will do. Uh, let's go to, um, oh, this is an interesting one about a minor character. This is Nick from NJ. Um, uh, and Stone Snake, hmm. um, who I will remind people of, uh, for, because if you don't know who which character this is, that is entirely understandable because he is, as we've said, a minor character. So Stone Snake was one of the Night's Watchmen who came with Corrin Halfhand, joined up with the expedition um, north of the Wall, uh, then was also part of the team that. Corin and John went off on to sort of go and investigate what's happening uh, further afield while everyone else stayed at the Fist of the First Men. Um, when that all started going wrong in that mission, um, he he got sent off. Corin, I think actually even you've given um, uh, uh, Nick, you gave the quote um, here um uh, or maybe you didn't, or maybe I might have made that up. But basically it's saying that um, uh, if, if anyone can survive uh, climbing up through the Frost, Frostfang Mountains, he can. He is this uh, experienced Night's Watchman, an excellent climber. Uh, he escapes, and Mance Raider is told, yeah, one of them escaped, and we've not seen from him since. Uh, so... Uh, that's who he is. This does feel like, yeah, okay, maybe he could just disappear, but it does feel like he, there's this thread hanging out there. Do you, what do you think of him? Are we going to 
see him again? Is he just gone now, or or is there something else going on here? You know, it's funny. He's right on the cusp of of a character that you think we might eventually find out what happened to, but it has been, I think, too long for him not to have turned up. Although mm -hmm. he could have turned up at at say east watch not east watch but the shadow tower for example i don't know why he would have gone that way but maybe he did because he had to take a go a different direction we wouldn't have necessarily heard that he turned turned up there he's not some famous ranger that news would have spread all throughout the wall uh so if he hasn't turned up somewhere and we just haven't heard about it i'm skeptical that he could still be alive after everything yeah. that's happened but I do really want to know. <laughs> I definitely yeah. am with I, I'm with the the asker of like give me an give me an answer, George. Like my my cynical realistic mind is like, eh, George has had characters just kind of wander off page before. He can't give us an ending to everybody. It wouldn't necessarily be realistic. But this one we really want, you know. And um, we we had lines from him and dialogue and stuff that he did. We're invested in his fate, so. Uh, yeah, I'm hopeful he turns up. It's, it's it's not clinging to a lot of hope, but whenever I think about him, I'm like, yeah, come on, George, give us a few, mm. give us a line for Stone Snake. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this is this is interesting because I I I do want to see him again. I want to hear what happened, um, and also because he's heading off into the wilds, to basically off to the far north, away from the wildlings. And he might see stuff there. Giorgio Martin did say a long time ago that in the winds of winter, we will see further north than we have done so far, which I've always found a really intriguing comment because uh, how? Yeah. Um, Bran, it's, it's like, I mean, so hmm. yeah, so Bran is the furthest north of the <laughs> POV characters, but he's not going any further north. Uh, so are we going to see, is he going to be like looking out through the Weirwood network and seeing stuff? Um, are we going to get somebody walking into a you know, bird and flying north? Uh, how, or, or is it one of the very small handful of characters that we know that have headed north? Benjamin being one of them and Stoneskin being another one. Is there, is there a chance that they're going to come back and tell us what they've seen to the far north? It, that would it, certainly make sense. You could expect, you could think almost that George left it this way in part as an option for that mm. for that resolution. He's like, well, I've got, I want to give myself a few different ways as a gardener. He's planting a few different seeds that are like, these are characters that exist beyond the wall who might be a way for me to convey information to the reader. If he wants to go really direct with it, it's Bran or Jojen or what, one of those characters. He wants to go a little more oblique a little, a little out of a little coming out of left field style then he's got characters like stone snake and maybe maybe one or two others so yeah yeah, yeah. think about it as a as a as a from the authorial perspective as well as from the reader perspective and it, it gives us maybe a little bit of hope yeah yeah and and just as a building on that nick from nj also said what or asked what a song of ice and fire character uh, as a minor character, captured your interest the most. Who would you like Ooh. to see more going forward? Um, uh, which is, as, I mean, and and this, yeah. as in, and he describes a little bit about what he means by like a minor character. So, like somebody who's got a few lines, but clearly isn't like big or something. I, I will start because I had a quick think about this beforehand and give you a chance to think of one. Um, I would love to find out more or see more of the captain of the ship Miraham. Um, mm. Now, uh, mm -hmm. if that's how we pronounce it, I've no, I've no idea if that's how you pronounce it. We 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 meet him twice in this story, and both times are really intriguing moments. You'll remember when Theon gets a ship and goes over to the Iron Islands; it's his ship, uh, and so it's his daughter that uh, that we have those interactions with. Um, which leaves hanging this, uh, and we oft don't often think about it, but he does sort of say, oh, well, maybe you're already pregnant. Yeah. And it's like, hang on a moment. That's, a, is that's a important, chance, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Is there a chance that Theon's got a baby somewhere? Um, so yeah. there, there was that left hanging. 
Uh, I don't think we ever get the name of this character other than that he's the captain. Um, and then secondly, he comes in when Rob is writing his will, as he's and I, we collaborated on a Rob's uh, will uh, video quite recently. So, so I was looking at this and so he comes back finds Rob and basically tells him what's going on in the Iron Islands because he's been kept there while all of the stuff's going on and, and Euron's being made uh, king and things like that. Um, and then he arrives back and uh, while Rob's writing his will, and he basically says, okay, I've just got to finish doing my will here with all of these witnesses. You just hang outside for a bit, could you? Because I want to talk to you again. Um, and then we kind of leave it and it's kind of <laughs> left up in the air what's what's happening because is is does rob give him something to go somebody's got to go and tell john that rob's made just legitimized him he's not asked anyone to go and do that has he asked him to go and do that is is this boat going to go back home to old town there's a whole load of really interesting characters going on there so he's he only appears twice he doesn't say huge amounts um, but it's fascinating the potential where his story could go. So that's my minor character that I'd love to know a little bit more about. Mine, I suppose, would be also related to sailing and ships. I'm so from a world building perspective, and this is mostly just like a flavor of the week thing, because I'm sure if you asked me two months ago or two months from now, I'd probably have a different answer. But We've been thinking lately over in history of Westeros about the most the houses that live in the most extreme conditions or the most remote conditions, and the uh, the people of the Lonely Light, this the map, the mm. island that's not even on a lot of the maps of Westeros because it's eight days sail from the west of the farthest iron of the uh, of of Old Wick or Great Wick rather. So it's the farthest west of any point in Westeros really, and they supposedly have skin changers in their bloodlines uh, every so often and the idea of a skin changer who can see through the eyes of whales and dolphins and deep sea creatures is really fascinating what can they see down in the depths or what can they see to the far west uh, and they speak of a land to the far west that they can all migrate to and yeah so it's not at all part of the story, <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, this is a really cool way to have a candidate. The, at the, at King's mood. This is the first guy that speaks at the King's mood. Like, make me king. Like, nobody cheers mm. for this guy. They all think he's a weirdo. And, but they, George made this guy really interesting, even while making him an obvious non-starter as a candidate for King of the Sea Stone Chair. So, uh, yeah. Again, just well done, George. And what's up with that? What's up with these naval, like ocean sea cha skin changers? Like, give me, give me whale, whale skin changers and, and orca skin changers and all. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're absolutely fascinating. That, um, and it's like it's like two weeks sailing, sort of northwest or something. Like, yeah, yeah, really a long way away. Um, let's go to. Um, Oh, it's an, an old, an old question, but a classic. Um, Lawn Duck Twenty uh, saying, "My question is, why do you think that Rorg is scared of Jacken? Uh, mm. Arya bumps into him at Harren Hall, and when she asks Rorg about Jacken, she sees fear in his eyes. Um, so, yeah, so this is Rorg is one of the. If you remember when we see Jacken uh, in the sort of the." The cage uh, with uh, in with the Night's Watch heading north. Uh, he's there with two other people, Rorg and Biter. Um, and yes, Arya does see fear there. What what do you think has happened in the past, or has he seen? What why do you think that Rorg is scared of Jacken? Well, I think the simplest answer is probably that he changed his face in front of them. Um, maybe he was down in the dungeons and then they were, they were, he was in the black cells and there's a lot of theories about why he was in the black cells, whether he allowed himself to be captured or not. I'm not, even without getting into that, they were clearly shipped out together. It was just the three of them in a cart and knowing Rorg and Biter, Rorg and Biter, who, by the way, we get a little, George once spoke on their backstory. This might be fun for some people to hear. Rorg ran one of those 
fighting pits, the very kind we see in House of the Dragon that Mazzari wants to shut down, the ones that they make children, they file their teeth and make them mm. fight. Rorge was one of those, and 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 uh, our biter rather was one of those fighters, and Rorge was one of those who ran one of those operations, which is, you know obviously illegal <laughs> even though it, a lot of people get away with it he must have gotten caught so uh, these are people that you would expect if they were locked in a cage with like, some man who's smaller than them they would absolutely bully and intimidate him so he must have done something to show that he is not a man to be bullied and sh proving to them that he is an actual being with supernatural abilities i think would immediately spook them in a way that would be pretty straightforward and easy for him to do given his abilities as a faceless man, like make it as simple. And in a way that's more intimidating. They're much bigger than him, much dangerous looking more, looked more dangerous than him. And he just changes his face in front of them and they're just immediately freaked out. <laughs> and that would, yeah. that might be all it takes, but there's a, I mean, he, if he's a faceless man, there's a number of other potential ways he, they could have been scared of him. Like he could have produced a knife from nowhere or, you know, done some martial arts style maneuver <laughs> something just that punched him in the face and punched him in the in the spleen you know <laughs> in close score yeah. i don't know I, I but i love the just changing his face and that that would be enough to just shock them into oh my god what is this guy yeah i mean i think this is clearly there's something about him that uh i mean changing the face is the obvious one but you know it, if he like snuck into the black cells in order to be there as well so that they know that actually they're chained up and can't get out of this this um this cart but he could at any moment and yet he's deciding to stay there uh i think that there's there's some kind of combination of of what's going on they have to know that he's dangerous um uh, as well as like kind of scary and magical so um yeah i, th I think that's we we may never know. I think is the short answer. Uh, but they have, and it's basically George R. R. Martin trying to show us that this isn't just like a random criminal with a weird accent uh, talking to Arya. There's something else going on here. Um, uh, but so what it what it actually is is less important than what we're trying to be shown through it. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um. Second question from Lawn Duck Twenty was: Do you think we will see Roslyn Frey again? Um, I'm curious to see if Edmure sees her differently or blames her for her role in the Red Wedding. So Roslyn Frey was the Frey that Edmure married at the Red Wedding, and I mean, it's we forget about this because when we think of the Red Wedding, we obviously think about what happened at the Red Wedding, but there was an actual wedding, and it was a real wedding, and everybody accepts that this actually happened, and this is legal. Um, and uh, she appears to have kind of stayed with him. He was first of all in the twins and stayed there, uh, and then we're told she became pregnant, and we're told that she actually kind of grew to like him. Um, so whether we can believe these things is another matter, uh, but that's what we're told. Um, and uh, when Edmure then gets taken out and goes down to River Run and it gets involved in the how can we try and uh, capture River Run whole business, you remember the if you don't hand over the castle, I'll kill him. Go on then. Oh, okay. I'm not actually going to kill him. That <laughs> whole business. Uh, so he was there. And then after that, Jamie basically says, right, you're heading off west. You're going to Castle Rock. And we'll send Rosalind Frey after you when she's had her child. Um, so do you think we'll see her again? Um, and if so, what do you think Edmure thinks of her? Well, I think uh, I think you're right that she, she's probably blameless. I doubt he blames her for anything. And mm -hmm. I don't think she didn't actively do anything, you know, and they were like you say it was a real marriage, a real ceremony, and he may very well have a real child with her, which he's not going to just throw this baby away, this who may not be a baby by the time things get, progress. So yeah, I think it's like we said earlier, an earlier questioner asked about Olivar Frey, 
under a different context, but uh, but at the time I pointed out there were a couple of so-called good phrase, ones that would still be on Rob's side or who don't agree with the Red Wedding. And they, the way Westeros operates, I don't know that they would want to wipe out the, the phrase. They wouldn't want to wipe out the phrase all because of the actions of a few of, the, of a few when there are some good ones out there. I think they would maybe by the time it's all said, said and done, these there's a one of the good ones is in charge and thus it would be even more acceptable politically for Edmure to stay with Roslyn as a way to help bind up what will be a very war-torn Westeros you know may, hmm. may as well that's a good way as, as Littlefinger said we only make peace with our enemies <laughs> and he's already married to one so you may as well sort of uh, finish building that bridge to use a uh, metaphor very appropriate for the twins. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's probably a complex relationship given what it was. She seems to have known at least some of what was going to happen. Maybe not all of the details. It, it's stated a few times. Kat, who's always painted as a very observant, clever woman, um, notices how she's crying and doesn't seem very happy uh, all the way through the wedding. And the clear implication is that because she knows that this is um, uh, what, what is about to happen. Um, but yeah. at the same time, uh, Ed Muir, I mean, he's sort of, Jamie talks to him, he doesn't sort of like spit when he says her name or anything like that. So it's like, there, there does seem to be some sort of a bond there. Um, but yeah, it, it will be interesting. I think we will see her again. Um, uh, and yeah. what I think would be more interesting is how someone, if she came across someone like Lady Stoneheart, how she might respond. Uh, because if she is pregnant, then it's yes, she's a fray, but also she is pregnant with what would be her niece or nephew. Um, so. That would be a conundrum. It would be an mm. interesting one, to, to, to mm. say the least. Um, Let me do one more, and then I'll... Uh, one more. I'll uh, well, out. okay, yeah. let's let's do this. This is actually from the chat, Victoria Gill. Uh, what was the element of your respective series, TV or author, uh, that inspired you to connect so strongly and publicly create? I think this is a nice one to sort of round off for you. So what uh, you've been doing this for, I don't even know how many years, but... Um, uh, starting out with the podcast the podcast is obviously still going strong uh, but you sort of branched out into a number of other areas now as well but very focused uh, all the way through on Georgia Martin a song of ice and fire what is it what is it about the the book series or the the author that has sort of inspired you well i think it's the uh i'm not sure it's hard to say that maybe dependent on one thing but i think it's the the, the, the believability of the way the characters behave and the emphasis on that within the fantasy setting rather than the fantasy setting being the, the emphasis itself and how it, as a, someone who's been interested in fantasy stories and history all my life, it was a change from what was expected. It was a, uh, different way to write fantasy george did change the genre in a way in in that he started emphasizing morally gray characters and grimmer outcomes what people just a lot of people just shorten it and call grimdark fantasy or just grimdark in general and that's had such an impact across the fantasy industry so i guess i'm just one of the people who got caught up in that but in, in specifically in terms of podcasting i would also cite Dan Carlin's Hardcore History, which was the first podcast I ever listened to and got very into. And he makes really long episodes. For example, his latest, I think, is over five hours. And this is one of the most popular podcasts of all time, <coughs> of any genre, and one of the top in the or top two or three in the history genre. And what he does is emphasize two or three things. One is history is really interesting. But as a presenter, you need to sound like you're interested in it. You need to be enthusiastic. You need to also be genuinely into it yourself, not just you can't be just interested in having an audience or interested in 
making a living through presenting on a media platform. You have to be really into the subject you're you're talking about. And that's what Dan Carlin does really well. He is really, really into history. <laughs> and it just it, it, that comes through in his presentation of it. And I try to do the same thing with George's history in world. And I genuinely am that enthusiastic about it. So it's not, I don't have to do any, there's no trick to it. Just, <laughs> just be, if you're really into something and you like talking about it and you're decently articulate. Yeah. That's your basis. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Aziz, for coming on. Um, uh, you stuck out for over three hours. Uh, so, uh, Excellent effort. Um, and uh, I'll have you back on uh, at some point in the new year because I've, I've reached the end of A Storm of Swords now in my re listen through A Song of Ice and Fire. And you came on with the reviews of the previous two books. So, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll have you back on some point in the new year and we'll, uh, we'll review uh, that book as well. Uh, but uh, where, if people uh, would like to see more Aziz uh, and history of Westeros more generally, mm -hmm. where can they find you? Right on. Well, we are on all the major podcast platforms, particularly Spotify. That's the main one. You can actually see our videos through Spotify these days. Of course, you can see our videos on YouTube as well. Our, we do a lot of live streaming on YouTube and then edit our content to be uh, tighter on the other platforms. And I also stream that game, uh, Crusader Kings 3 for Song of Ice and Fire on Twitch. That's also just History of Westeros on Twitch every Friday, almost every Friday. And that's the that's the basic right there. Just podcast history of Westeros, YouTube history of Westeros, Spotify, Twitch history of Westeros. That's where you can find us and hope to see you there. Thanks again for having me, Robert. This was a lot of fun. I'm glad we could raise a little money for a good cause. And yeah, uh, like you said, I'll be back for Storm of Swords and as well as for some of your uh, other Song of Ice and Fire videos in between. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I will see you at some point soon. All right. Bye, everyone. Vilar, reread us, everybody. <laughs> and then there was one. Uh, so it's, it's uh, me from now on. Um, uh, we will carry on, though, with the questions. But this does give me a chance just to very quickly again remind you of why we're doing this um, uh, live stream. This is my Christmas charity live stream. Uh, this is in aid of uh, crisis at Christmas, which is um, fantastic. It's a UK based homelessness organization where they help people. It can get really cold at night at this time of year over here. Um, and we have quite a lot of un uh, sort of homeless people at the moment, sadly. Um, this puts a roof over people's heads for the night, gives them warm food in their belly, and just as importantly, helps them out in the longer term towards getting more permanent accommodation. Uh, so it's just, at this time of year, if we can just give a little bit just to help out those who need it a lot more than we do, uh, that'd be great. So please do be as generous as you can. And the way we're doing it, um, all super chats, all super um, stickers if you're watching live, um, and if you're watching this back a little bit later, all super thanks. You'll find a there's a button somewhere to do a super thanks. Um, uh, all of that, I will add all that together, and I will put that money going straight towards the charity. So no, no money creamed off the top at all. It's every single penny is going to go straight to the charity. Um, okay, let's get back to the chat for a little bit while actually Callie Summers saying speaking of Saruman's fall it seems in Arda some knowledge is inherently evil does that ring no pun true uh, for you or Tolkien uh, how about in our world uh, so is some knowledge inherently evil in Tolkien's world um, uh, certainly to pursuit of some if you spend too long focusing in on stuff this is what saruman as you talk about here uh he he started focusing in on understanding and seeking for the ring and understanding sauron's ring power um but that focus then on it then turned into a temptation for him and he wanted the run one ring for himself so uh yeah i mean i think there's definitely a a, a theme there about focusing on um uh, the the good things in the world not if you just focus on uh unhelpful things then that is uh, a slippery slope um Henry Cavill, Henry Cavill, um, uh, thank you very much for a super sticker. 
um, flick through, trying to find some more questions. Um, Darius Hutchinson saying, to all race for the Iron Throne, uh, Tumblr is great. I think that's, oh, we're, we're clearly a long way behind on all of these. Uh, <laughs> that, that, I think, is relating to Crusader Kings 3 that we were talking about a while ago. Sheely 1, uh, thank you very much for the super sticker. Uh, Berus Aurelius saying, what real world lessons might Tolkien have been trying to teach us by having the elves more or less forced to leave Middle Earth in the end? Um, I don't know about real nice lessons. One of the things Tolkien is not trying to teach us lessons, or at least this is what he would say. Um, he doesn't like, you know, he cordially dislikes anal analogy in all its forms. Um, and he includes analogy in this as being trying to make a point through your art. Uh, he was striking, he was uh, going for applicability. People can draw things from what he wrote, but he was not trying to uh, tell people what they should be taking from uh, from what he wrote. Um, so uh, in terms of lessons from that, I don't think he was trying to give us specific lessons about having the elves uh, sort of leaving Middle Earth. Um, uh, yeah, I think I'll probably leave that, that one there. Um, Ian Buchwald or Buchwald saying, love the content, ITG, as always. Thank you. Your videos inspired me to read the series. I love to hear it when uh, uh, when people say that. It makes me very happy. Um, super happy to contribute to this charitable cause. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, Anthony Gonzalez saying, uh, I recently sent Aziz a message on History of Westeros Patreon. Oh, I've just read this out too late. I'm very sorry. Um, I recently sent uh, on History of Westeros Patreon page. Could you guys mayhaps answer it here? Um, well, I will I will happily prompt him uh, to uh, uh, to answer that one. Um, Kelly Summers, hashtag super tinfoil. Um, okay, Mira brings Dark Sister down. Danny claims it for her family and gives it to Jorah. Mira is sort of the morning as she is a Dane. Okay, there's a lot there. Um, uh, Mira is a Dane um, uh, because, uh, according to a working theory I have, um, her mother is a Shara Dane. Um, her being given the Sword of the Morning, um, uh, I, I think there's, there's one one bit which I think is definitely makes a lot of sense here. If Danny sees Dark Sister, she may well claim it for her family, for the Targaryens. I could definitely see that happening, though why that would come all the way down to King's Landing, um, I don't know. Um, but uh, Mira, I mean, I think Mira claiming the Sword of the Morning would be a complete, that would be very left field. Uh, I like it. I don't think it's likely to happen, but I do like it. Um, Jewel Elson saying, is Henry Cavill a leading candidate for a role as Maker the First in the Duncan Egg show? Um, well, I mean, in terms of casting, I've literally no idea. Um, in terms of whether he would be good, Makar is, uh, I mean, quite a big guy. So, yeah, that would work quite well. We know that Henry Cavill can rock the blonde wig quite well. Um, I think, yeah, so I, I've often wondered whether he might work well as someone like Magor. Um, uh, he does norm. I mean, he normally is the sort of the good guy, whereas in Magor, it's very hard to find any redeeming uh, characteristics about him. But uh, yeah, Magor, I think that could work. Uh, that could work quite well. Das uh, Bursa Fleisch, um, as somebody who only played necromancers in uh, Diablo, I'm very happy that two kings of Gondor saved the day with a legacy necromancy joint venture. Um, uh, yes, so. Uh, Kings of Gondor saved the day with a legacy necromancy joint venture. Uh, this is obviously referring to Aragorn, um, who, uh, when he uh, 
passes through the paths of the dead um and he brings the the army of the the, the dead uh, with him which we saw on the tv show there's um not the tv show on the films uh and is definitely there in the books as well in fact if anything it's a bit more impressive in in the books this is another one of those things uh which is evidence uh of aragon's kingship martin s what would have happened uh, had an immensely powerful being greater than Sauron, like a valor, acquired the ring. I'll leave Aru Iluvatar out. Um, uh, well, this is quite interesting because uh, we're now entering into the realms of the theoretical in as much as uh, all of the uh, beings who possessed the ring or or could potentially be in possession of the ring were equal or less powerful than Sauron could what hap what would happen if a more powerful being got hold of the ring uh, would they be in control or what, would would they be invulnerable to it um i think we see um the one exception to what I said just a moment ago being Tom Bombadil, who is clearly hugely powerful. Um, and he was unaffected by the ring. Um, the question there, though, is without wishing to go too far down the who is Tom Bombadil thing, whether or not he is unaffected by the ring because of his great power or because of the nature of who he is. Uh, but I think the short answer to this, I'm, I and I don't know if Tolkien ever went down that route but um uh in in his thinking in his letters or something like that i'd have to hunt for that but my take is that yes a more powerful being perhaps might be have been a better uh, been better able to control it uh anthony shifano saying cheers robert long time listener happy holidays my friend and to you too um uh, yes i've just looked at the chat i'm now exactly one hour behind in the chat uh so um uh, apologies for this i'll, I'll uh, get through this uh, as quickly as i can um simon schaffner saying disregarding morality in this scenario they totally uh like or won't hurt you who from a song of ice and fire would you find most enjoyable or annoying to get a beer with? Um, uh, who would be most enjoyable or annoying? Well, I mean, annoying someone like Joffrey. I would. You obviously don't want to spend too much time with it. I, th there are so many great. If if it's literally just going to be having a fun time, it's someone like uh, Oberyn Martell or Tyrion would be uh, tremendous fun. Um, or Ariane, um, again, the Dornish, Dornish, I think, would be quite, quite good fun to have a, uh, have a beer with. Um, yeah, let me know in the chat. I'll, when I get that far forward, I'll read out a few of the answers. But yeah, who would you most like to, uh, to have a beer with in Westeros? Um, Evan, no question, just a thanks to IDG and History of Westeros, both for another year of fantastic content. Thank you very much. Uh, a large part of my enjoyment of Game of Thrones is the content you both provide. What a wonderful community. Thank you. Uh, Mike Hanna saying no question, just a thank you to you both. Uh, I'll pass on these thanks to Aziz afterwards. Uh, so thank you. Um, and... Uh, there we go. I think actually I might now be caught up in the chat. That's uh, if if I have missed out your uh, your super chat or super sticker, then I do apologise. There's been a lot of them going through, um, which is uh, very kind and generous. Right, let's go to all oh, the hound. I've, I've now caught up, and now people are now saying who they would like to have the beer with. Um, uh, Ariana's good call. The hound says Barris Aurelius. Um, uh, Andrew K saying Dan wants out from behind that green screen. Did you uh, did you hear him? Um, uh, he I could I could hear him having a little shake a moment ago. Um, uh, yes, he's uh, 
<laughs> yeah, and you, yeah, you did hear that down the dog. Yeah, he's he's now gone to lie back down again. Uh, so uh, he he got bored of being upstairs, came downstairs, uh, had a little bit of a shake, um, and uh, and now he's gone to lie back down again. So let's go to some questions from my patrons. Um, Diego Godoy saying um, or asking, does Lady Stoneheart know that Arya is alive? Uh, she is with members of the Brotherhood Without Banners that ran into Arya in a storm of swords, but have they told her about this? Thank you. Yes, I think the answer is yes. Um, when we get Lady Stoneheart introduced uh, in um, Storm of Swords in the epilogue, uh, basically, she or the people on her behalf are quizzing um Merit Frey, who's this is whose POV this is from. And the questions they're asking are very pointed. Um they're saying they're asking where the hound is, because the hound is the person they last saw um with Aya, and has he seen the hound? Um and then they they follow up there, so he might be with a ten-year-old girl, or possibly um, uh, you might think it's a ten-year-old boy. Um, so yes, it's very obvious that they know that certainly at that moment in time, Aya was alive and with the Hound, and they are trying to find her. So um, yeah, they don't know that she's still alive, but they know that at that point in time, uh, she was. Lady Pushkins. Um, saying, Merry Yuletide greetings to all. Can you talk about magic beyond the wall? It doesn't seem to work beyond the wall somehow. Silverwing wouldn't go beyond the wall and Cold Hands is unable to pass. However, Blood Raven's magic, green sight and walking works? Question mark. If the wall is a barrier for magic, how is this explained? Yeah, so the wall appears to be a barrier. So magic can't pass one way to from one side to the other side. So for example, when when John is south of the wall and um, Ghost is north of the wall, he cannot sense Ghost. We we hear him saying, "You know, I haven't been, I haven't been able to feel him, him or his presence at all until he heads north of the wall and discovers uh, Ghost, and then it's it's there again." So it's a barrier, uh, and this is why uh, Cold Hands couldn't pass through the wall because he cannot go through. The barrier from one side to another. This is perhaps also why Silverwing, this is back in history, uh, Queen Alison went to the wall, tried to fly her dragon over the wall, and the dragon would not do it. And the implication is because dragons are magical beings, it simply it cannot pass the wall. So it's basically just drawing a line across the land and and magic cannot pass over from one to the other melisandre does magic on both sides of the wall so she clearly obviously does magic on the south but she also does magic north of the wall uh, she sees an eagle that uh, was yoran's eagle um it's now varamir's eagle she basically burns it down out of the sky so she when she's north of the wall she does do magic and other bits of magic are possible it's just the wall is a a block there. Um, Commander Ray, if Liana hadn't died, what do you think she would have done? Uh, gone home, married Robert with John named heir, or do something else? Um, what do you think she would have done? Would she have gone home, married Robert with John named heir, or something else? I don't think she would have married Robert. Um, uh, I think. Um, my best guess is that she would have, if she had not died, she would have gone off somewhere and hidden with baby John. That's my best guess. I mean, this is clearly, we won't know, um, but she wasn't willing to marry Robert um, and uh, her child would never be safe, and I suspect she would not have le left her child, so she would have gone off in hiding somewhere, perhaps to the neck, um, which would be a, a a good and sensible place for her to go. Um, 
Darius Hutchinson, will Jorah or John Connington fight as their stories echo? Um, their stories echo so in as much as John Connington has an unrequited love for Rhaegar and Sir Jorah has an unrequited love for Danny. Um, uh, will they fight? I mean, maybe. Um, uh, I, I don't think it's something that George R. Martin has pulled out hugely as a sort of an echo for us all to to look at. Um, uh, but uh, yes, th there are echoes. I mean, another one obviously is that they were both um, uh, so effectively forced to flee Westeros after a disgrace of some kind. Um, the disgrace from John Connington was just not winning a battle, and it was from the Mad King. Um, but uh, for Jorah, it was slavery. So um, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure that the story demands it, but it might do. Um, let's go to Hey Robert says Jay in the Song of Ice and Fire. There's the highborns, the small folk, some notable rags to riches stories, etc. But are there any major characters or groups you might consider middle class? And how does that impact the world? Yeah, it's an interesting question. So we, and I've said this quite a lot, the story is told through the eyes of the 1%, and we have to always remember this. These are the very, very top echelon of society that we're talking about. Um, the Starks, the Lannisters, the Targaryens, these are the nobility. Um and we often talk about the small folk, but who is in the middle? Well, it's the the trade professionals is probably the the, the people we would talk about. So uh, smiths are probably the, a good example of the middle class as as far as it goes within Westeros. Um, someone like Tobo Mott in King's Landing seems to be respected at the top of his trade, um, be independently wealthy from his business. Um, uh, you wouldn't really call him part of the small folk, but at the same time, he's clearly not part of the nobility. The same uh, ship's captains. I talked about the captain of the Miraham just a little bit earlier. Uh, he seems, you would have to say, he's sort of like a part of the middle class. He's owning a, a, your own ship is shows that you've got some sort of independent means. You've also got a, a sort of a class and role in society. But at the same time, there was nothing he could do when Theon um, basically came in and claimed his daughter. There was nothing he could do about that. Uh, he is not part of the nobility. So that's the kind of level we're talking about. There are quite a few of them, but they're not central in the story. Um, Kelly Summers saying House Clegane, Cassell, Poole, etc. Are they kind of upper middle? Well, yes, sort of, but they're still lords, um, really. If they're, if they're a house and you know you're knighted, um, or you're a lord, um, then uh, you are you're right at the top. Um, pardon me, so, um uh, yes, Andrew K saying thank you to everyone who's donated so far. I hugely appreciate this, by the way. As I say, I'm I'm happy to stay here for as long as the donations come, or I fall asleep at this desk, or Dan comes charging through and uh, the whole setup comes crashing down around me. Um, uh, let's have a flick through questions from my patrons. I think that there might be a few more uh, that we've got. Um, uh, Yeah, I think I've gone done through most of these. Actually, I've done. I'm doing better than uh, uh, I thought. So, Mara Lee asking about prologues. Every book in A Song of Ice and Fire begins with a prologue, and the prologue in The Winds of Winter will be about Rob's widow, I believe. What do you and your guests think the prologue will be about in the last book, A Dream of Spring? And what about an epilogue? Well, uh, what the prologue for A Dream of Spring might be really depends on where where the story ends obviously at the end of the winds of winter 
but the role of the prologue is to introduce themes that will play out all the way through that book or indeed through the the, the series of books um i do wonder if we are if we end the winds of winter with say the others getting to the wall or breaching the wall or something like that i do wonder whether george r martin would be able to resist he's done it a bit once already with varamir but what about the view of a night's a random night's watchman on the wall as the others get through somehow um on the run or maybe maybe in the last half house umber the others have reached that far south and you see them coming um and you know you're trying to make a run for it that kind of thing would be a really powerful opening so that you know you can then leave the the others alone for the next few chapters and go elsewhere in the story but that is what is framing your mind that we know that the others are on their way um username redacted saying what about weirwoods especially magic as opposed to, what about weirwoods are especially magic as opposed to other trees were they blessed by the gods or the children is all nature intelligent and connected in George R. Martin's world? Love the channel. Well, thank you very much. Um, I mean, what about them is is special? Um, I mean, they, they just are, I think, is, is probably the boring answer to that. They have been created in the way they are. However, I think they are supposed to be representative of Westeros. Um, uh, our working assumption is that they are all connected underground. So the Weirwoods are... Westeros and they um they remember uh so through the weirwood trees and through the magic of the weirwood trees you can then start seeing things in the past and the present and the future because they are sort of outside of time um is all nature intelligent I don't think that's what George Martin is going with here but I think we have the trees as kind of representatives of uh nature in Westeros. Um, uh, were they blessed by the gods or the children? Uh, the, they are basically the old gods. The idea is that um, you would, or the uh, the children of the forest would be, give they, they give themselves up into the tree, which takes on board their then knowledge and experience and understanding. This is, uh, I think I talked about this possibly last week, but at a high level, one of the, the things that George R. R. Martin is doing with this story is showing us a couple of different ways of recording history and what happened. And the maesters are the written history, the embodiment of written history, and the weirwoods are the embodiment of lived experience by people. Um, because you can... You know, Bran, once he's had the weirwood paste, he can then see what is happening back through history, through the weirwood network, but also experience it. Um, uh, there's that deliberately enigmatic end line where and Bran could, could taste blood um, in his mouth. So uh, it's, it's a blurring of his experience with the experience of the people uh, who he sees. Kalnitsky asking what time it is in England. It's just gone half past one in the morning here. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm keeping going, though. Uh, let's go. Uh, let's, I think I've got some more questions for my patrons. Um, Mars from House Bars saying, Hi, Robert, are trials by combat common in Westeros, or do we just happen to see a lot of them? Thanks and happy holidays. Well, happy holidays back to you, too. Um, Oh, TJ Guy, watch your videos for years. First time catching live. Thanks for all to you. Welcome. Great to see a new face in here. Um, uh, are trials by combat common? No, they're not. Uh, what's very uncommon is the trial by seven. Uh, so when we have that happen in the Hedge Knight, uh, that is uh, that is considered like, wow, oh, a lot of people that I hadn't, you know, 
hadn't even remembered that that was a thing you could do. Um, we only get, I think, one, two more possibly um, examples of this. Um, we get one Magor does a trial by seven to prove he, his claim to the Iron Throne. And he only wins on a technicality. This is one of the interesting things we found out in Fire and Blood. So he only wins on technicality is that he is technically still alive. Everyone else is dead. He's technically still alive. But um, uh, he's basically unconscious. And Visenya takes him. Uh, and uh, tries to heal him and then goes and gets Tiana of the Tower and only revives him through magic. But he was unconscious for days, and yet he claimed the victory because he was the last person standing, and therefore the, the, the seven have decided that he must be in the right. Um, so that's very rare. Trial by combat seems to be... Um, seen certainly by the we, we didn't see much of like normal people's justice so it's quite hard to tell what normal trials are like but certainly in um uh in the, the world of the the nobility it seems to be an option that people have uh, we we see it not just in when uh, the mountain and uh, the red viper face off but also Tyrion calls for it in the eerie of you remember when Bronn comes to save him uh, and these things are uh, accepted and taken as yeah oh okay that's annoying but that's your right kind of thing rather than uh what why are you trying to drag up some obscure bit of law here so they 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 do happen that it's not all the time but sometimes um Let's go to a question from um, Catherine Furseth. Um, the dragon must have three heads, we are told. Oh, this was one of the questions I was wanting to uh, ask Aziz about, but um, uh, I'll have a stab at it. Uh, do you think this is something real, like winter is coming, or just a cool saying, but loosely based on Aegon and his sisters? Um, uh, if it's not just a cool saying, what does it mean and what will it imply going forward in the story? So until a year or 18 months ago, I would and probably did say that the main thing here is this is based on Aegon and his sisters, the dragon, so that they turned their sigil into the three-headed dragon uh, because um there there were three of them and that that's kind of cool um so the dragon must have three heads um fits in with this it's a terrible thing for a targaryen to be on their own um that's the kind of feel we had but in house of the dragon i did a video about this a while ago in House of the Dragon, we had um, Damon singing to Vermithor, the dragon Vermithor, in High Valyrian, and we got the translation. Now, this is quite interesting because this the the translation came from uh, David uh, Peterson, who is he's the person who created the uh, Valyrian language, but the original. English or the the that was translated into High Valyrian. This came from T. McKell, who's part of the writing, pardon me, part of the writing team for House of the Dragon, but also for a long time was one of George R. Martin's assistants. So she knows, and Aziz was talking about this uh, quite a bit earlier. He has people working with him. He's got a little team around him. Uh, they're not co-writers or anything like that, but they. They're in, involved helping him uh, with little bits of research or talking to him about things, stuff like that. They are in the inner circle. She, so T was in that inner circle. And so, um, and knows as much about Westeros as anyone does. And if you read those lyrics, 
you will find that although they're a little bit enigmatic, it's very clear that this is a person doing the singing to a dragon with another another person, a, a rider there, implying that there are three parts in this. The dragon has three heads. There are three parts in this. There is a dragon, there is a rider, and then there is a interlocutor, priest, whatever role this is that Damon is taking on. And basically he was preparing um, uh, Vermithor to have another rider. And this adds, and we don't get any of the lore around this, we're just going on those words. The clear implication is that the process of dragon bonding in some way, uh, in the truest way, is not just a matter of one person and a dragon you get a third person who is involved. Um, so that adds another layer to our understanding of what the dragon has three heads uh, might mean. Martin S, um, a Lord of the Rings question. What would have happened had Elrond fought in the Battle of the Pelennor Fields uh, with Vilya and all? Let's pretend he wasn't needed in Rivendell. Um, well, so Elrond would have been a very important and powerful person in battle. Um, and uh, ultimately, I mean, in the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, ultimately the good guys won. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think he would have just helped tip the balance a little bit more there. Um, his sons did fight in the... In the book, uh, his sons both came down and uh, the Grey Company came to be there with Aragorn and they fought very admirably. Uh, so, yeah, I think basically he would have um, he would have bossed it a bit, um, uh, but I don't think it would have impacted on the um, the outcome of the battle much. Um uh, L.I.K. Say, uh, with a super sticker. Thank you very much. Um, very much appreciate that. Um, um, let's have a look. I've got some more questions. Ah, Michelle Ramos uh, saying, Hi, Robert. I wish you, Dan, your friends and family, all a happy, healthy and safe holiday season. Thank you very much. My question is about the Mystery Night, which is the third of the Duncan Egg stories. I recently did a re-listen, and I always wondered, do you think Dunk or Egg ever put together that Maynard Plum was actually Bloodraven in Glamour? Um, so, uh, Bloodraven uh, appears at the end of this story, uh, which is basically the story of a gathering of people who are about to launch the Second Blackfire Rebellion. Now, um, Blood Raven suddenly appears with an army uh, and ends it all. But through the story up to that point, we have this character called Maynard Plum. I'm not going to go through all of the evidence that we have, but to my mind, it is 99% certain that this character is actually Blood Raven with a glamour. Now, um, throughout this, it's very clear that. Dunk, we see all this from Dunk's perspective. He he doesn't have a foggiest idea. Um, he clearly thinks there's something odd with Maynard Plum, but he doesn't ever sort of go, oh, that's uh, Bloodraven, or that's somebody in disguise. Or when he sees Bloodraven, uh, then it's not like, oh, you, you were Maynard Plum. He, he never does that. So Dunk, I don't think, puts this together. And he, as he notes is uh dunk the lunk thick as a castle wall he he is not the person to put these kinds of things together uh, egg however might be we don't see him drawing that conclusion in the book but perhaps he did perhaps we will see um uh next in the next story that we have we'll see him mention it in an offhand way, he's basically, um, although there's not much magic going on at that point in Westeros, Egg is very matter-of-fact about the fact that Bloodraven and Shira Seastar 
are magic users. So it's not as if he has to completely, you know, change his worldview or anything. He would expect this. So I think probably Egg will figure it out if he hasn't already. Uh, but Dunk, no, not unless he's told. Um, and who would be my dream cast as Blood Raven? Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm never good at casting people. Um, I would love to know. This is it's an interesting. If you've got an idea who would make a great Blood Raven, please put it in the chat. I will happily read them out. Um, Commander Ray, my question is more of a brain teaser. What would your fantasy Game of Thrones small council be? Only rules uh, that the characters you choose must be alive at some point during the books, even if they die in one. Um, well, let's work our way through some of these. King, Hand of the King, Grand Maester, Master of Coin, Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Master of Whispers, Master of Laws, Master of Ships, Master of War. I mean, there's a few that I think are kind of shoo-ins. Um, I th think that um, Sir Barristan, for all of his flaws, and he does have many flaws, I think he's he's a good Lord Commander of the King's Guard. Um, King, I mean, it obviously would never happen, but I think I think Ned Ned Stark would make a good king. Um, I think he would be even-handed. I think he would be just. I think he'd be wide, wise. And I think that he would be happy to take uh, advice from people. Um, uh, as Grand Maester, um, I mean, I don't know. I always quite liked Lewin, Maester Lewin. I thought he was, he was good. I think Sam will, assuming he's going to earn some links on his chain at the very least, then I think he would make a great uh, Grand Maester. Master of Coin is an interesting one. Um, uh, I mean, Tycho Nestoris, I think you probably have to say, um, uh, again, he never would, but he would be a good character for that. Um, Master of Ships, obviously Davos, um, I, I think. Um, uh, Master of Whispers, uh, Whispers, I think. Um, well, if if Bran um, manages to max out his powers, he could spy on anyone at any time, uh, and I think that would make him excellent at it. Um, uh, let's uh, just having seen who would be as good as Bloodraven. Uh, Lapu Lapu says Lars Mikkelsen. Uh, yeah, I think I could certainly see that. Agree. We're with saying any of the Skarsgård sons. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, I think those are the only two uh, suggestions we uh, have here. Beres Aurelius saying Stannis is the one true king. Um, uh, yeah, but would he be a good king? I mean, I'd, I'd love to see Venli as a king. I think that would be a lot of fun. Um, uh, Al had saying, um, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year in advance. If possible, can you keep the donation facility open even after you go offline? Yeah, absolutely. So if you wish to donate, um, I will keep this open till Christmas Day. Um, uh, but uh, if you wish to donate, then and you're watching this not live, what you need to do is find the super thanks button, um, or there will be a link down to the actual if you wish to give direct, then no need to go through me at all. Uh, feel free, there's a link, or there will be a link down there in the description, um, to uh, Crisis of Christmas. Uh, but yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I will tot up after after Christmas Day. I will tot up everything, and then I will um, I'll let you know in the next uh, live stream. So yeah, this is the last live stream of this year for me, and I will be back um, first Thursday in the new year, I think. Um, let's. So the question, anyway, Al Had's question was: Almost everyone is considering the sweet-smelling blue rose from Daenerys's vision in the House of the Undying as romance between her and John, like in the show. 
Yeah, I think that's probably fair. Most that's the majority view, definitely. However, once resurrected, will John's body be able to perform regular bodily functions? Meeting in this case, won't his body be uh, behave much like Beric, Lady Stonehearts, or Cold Hands? So I think this is where we get the difference in um, what is going to be happening to John compared to other characters. So Lady Stoneheart. Um, Catelyn died after having uh, her throat cut bluntly um, and uh, she, her body then was lying in the river for a few days and was then uh, dragged out. So um, that is the state that her body was in when it was brought back. Um, Beric's got he got killed in various different ways uh, and he had the scars and uh, the like uh, to go with it. Um, Cold Hands uh, was, uh, we don't know all of the background to Cold Hands, but he appears a lot closer to a, the kind of the traditional white with the black hands uh, uh, with sort of the congealed blood in them. John, however, almost certainly is going to be a completely different process. So all of the foreshadowing and hints that we get is that, yes, his body has been killed. His spirit, soul, whatever, is going to go out to ghost his direwolf. What happens to his body? They will almost certainly put it in the ice cells. So his body is going to be frozen. They're putting it into a freezer, basically. So it is not going to decompose. Um, it's not going to, the, the blood is not going to sort of like drain to different parts of his body. Everything about him is going to freeze. Then his body will be melted, defrosted in some way, and his spirit soul will go back from ghost into his body at a later point in time. I've speculated wildly on how that might happen, but that broadly is what we think is the... Uh, the iteration of events is. So his body is not going to be like these other bodies. His body is basically, it's going to be killed and then um, frozen and then defrosted. Now, what impact will have that have on his body? If you're a doctor, you've probably got a better idea than I do. Um, uh, but uh, not good, but also not as bad as with say lady stoneheart and what happened to cat's body so um i don't think we can compare them and say because that happened there this is going to happen over here will he be able to um be fully operational or uh, so to speak um i don't know is this the answer and i don't think we've got the information to uh, uh to answer that one properly um Nick Drum saying, another great cause and another great live stream. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I hugely appreciate that. Auntie Slayer, you've mentioned the Iron Throne being destroyed at the end of the series would symbolize the end of Targ rule. If this does happen, is the implication uh, Targ rule was inherently bad for the realm? Um, and I mean, I don't think that's the implication behind it. Uh, I My my feeling that the Iron Throne will be destroyed at the end is 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 about symbolism as much as anything else because this is um, two things. First is the connection to the Targaryen rule. This was Aegon's throne made from the swords of those who bent the knee. Is is basically his vanquished foes, and so this does symbolise Targaryen uh, annexation of Westeros. And if the Targaryens have gone then symbolically the Iron Throne should also go. The uh, And for those who are wondering, when we have the Robert Baratheon took over, the justification that the Maesters came up with was that actually technically he was part Targaryen. He was part of the Targaryen dynasty. Yes, it started a new dynasty in House Baratheon, but um, he uh, the, the clear idea is that he... Um, uh, inherited at least the throne, at least in part, because of 
the blood tie into the Targaryen family. Um, so uh, that's half of it. And the other half is that clearly, symbolically, what the Iron Throne has been in this story is a an item of power that people have been struggling over that has been distracting them from the bigger threats elsewhere. And so the end of the story for that throne to be destroyed again makes kind of thematic sense. So that's where we're coming from. And I don't think either of those things by implication necessarily cast a moral judgment on how um, good or bad the Targaryen rule was in Westeros. Um, uh, Callie Summers, um, George R. R. Martin likes Freudian trios, id, ego, super ego as siblings, the Baratheons and the Lannisters being the most obvious. Are there other examples you can think of? Ooh, um, <clears throat> not off the top of my head. That's the kind of question that I'd have to sit down and think about for a little bit. If there's anyone in the chat who can, uh, who can think of that, I mean, it's a very erudite question. Um, yeah, let me know. And and if I think of something, then um, I will uh, uh, pick it up next live stream. Um, Martin S. Lord of the Rings question. What do you think Eonwe looks like during the War of Wrath? Does his form represent uh, resemble an elven male or something else? He is one of the greatest Maya. Yes, he is. So this is the Herald of Manwe. <laughs> Um, who seems to have sort of led the armies of the West in the fighting that defeated Morgoth at the end of the First Age. What did he look like? Well, yes, quite elf-like. Um, this was deliberate um, uh, to sort of... Uh, the elves and the the Maya the Maya took on shapes which are similar to because uh, they, they could take on uh, the Valar at least could take on shapes uh, that um, were uh, you know any shape really <laughs> to be to be honest um, but the the Maya also could take on a variety of different shapes um, the the Belrog was a Maya for example. Um, but uh, over in the Undying Lands, the general rule was that they took on human or elf type shapes. So yes, I think he looked like that. Paris Aurelius saying Aegon and his sisters. Yes, absolutely. Yes, there's a, uh, there's a good example for you. Um, uh, Let's go to um, uh, Alhad uh, from my patron saying, I always suspected that the shepherd from the Dance of the Dragons has some other influence nudging him. Maybe Laris Strong. Laris was also with Perkin the Flea, if I remember correctly. What is your take? Yeah, so um, this is potential spoilers for House of the Dragon, uh, but this is what happened in the book. Um, and in case you're new here, the, the rule here is the book spoilers are OK. The books have been around for a while now. Um, uh, TV show spoilers are not OK. Uh, but obviously there might be some crossover. What happens in the TV show is largely reflective of what happens in the book, but not necessarily. So I happily talk about what happened in the book. In the book, um, when things started getting really bad in King's Landing, and they're going to start getting worse from this moment on in, in House of the Dragon, when things started getting really bad, a rabble-rousing priest, uh, a, a septon, or, or perhaps, yeah, that's to, even to put too high a title on him, um, a leader uh, but a zealot for the faith of the seven called the shepherd or known only as the shepherd started calling out uh, the Targaryens and the dragons. And um, uh, this led to the storming of the dragon pit. Uh, thousands, tens of thousands of people all charging at the dragon pit. And by sheer weight of numbers, they killed the dragons that were there. 
hugely important moment in uh, uh, Westeros history, basically. Uh, so, um, was there somebody behind it? Well, I, it's possible. We don't know. There's no evidence where this this character, the Shepherd, came from. It's very possible the story works just as well if you keep this character as just being what they present as, which is a random zealot who's had enough of these Targaryens who have caused absolute misery to the small folk of King's Landing. That works perfectly well. However, if you are to look for uh, somebody to blame for this uh, as a power behind the throne, you have to ask, in whose interests is it for their anger to be directed not at the Red Keep, but at the dragon pit, because that for me is the, the key thing here. The, they were angry, the mob were angry about what had been happening, understandably, but decided not to go and attack the people who were actually running the, the place, but the dragons. Now that for me, if you're looking for a power behind the throne, which you're not necessarily, but if you are, suggests more than maesters. Uh, than uh, someone like Laris Strong. Um, because as we've sort of speculated elsewhere on this stream, uh, the Maesters did have an agenda against um, against the dragons. They wanted the dragons dead. <clears throat> and if they could storm the dragon pit uh, with all of these people, then that was a way to do that. So, yeah, if, if I had to pick, I don't think the story needs it, but if I had to, it would be the Maesters. Uh, Kirsty Angel, could you know nothing, Jon Snow, be a reference to the dead know nothing, implying Jon is of the dead or was born dead, underworld or vampiric? Um, uh, it could be a reference. I mean, I think Jon, th the simple fact that his direwolf is called Ghost, I think tells you that, yes, this is an essential part of what he is and who, he's, who he is right from the off in terms of George R. R. Martin's thinking. But I think this is simply um, uh, a reference to the fact that he will die and come back, which is the central part of, uh, of his sort of arc, really. Uh, so uh, yes, that I think that it might well be deliberate on George R. R. Martin's part, but I don't think that he is he was born dead, or he's vampiric or anything like that. It's just that he is going to go through this. Uh, Kate Whitehorse asking where I got the hat. I honestly cannot remember where I got the hat, but I do kind of like it and wear it around this time of year. Um, Auntie Slayer, what's the deal with Cersei always needing someone sleeping in bed with her, even platonically? I've always seen this as an interesting vulnerability. Um, yeah, she does. Um, uh, I, I think... I mean, it's quite it's quite intriguing because this is not the the temptation is that this is just sort of a, a physical thing, uh, but it doesn't seem to be. Um, it means either a need for reassurance, or um, uh, a desire to um, uh, always have someone there that can be. Um, making you feel good. It's th there's a there's a psychological thing in there. I think. I mean, it's a really interesting question. I have to say, um, there's a psychological thing in there about Cersei um, is very much in and of who she is, but she cares more about others' opinions than most of the other characters in this story. She will. Um, uh, she cares about how she comes across. She cares about what people will think about her um, and uh, her reputation. Um, and she cares and has a whole load of baggage about the way that people view her because of because she's female um, um, and because of where she's come from. She does care a lot about other people's and she does not want to give that impression. Uh, but it does mean that she is, to a degree, dependent on having other people there in her life. There's also an element here, perhaps, of the Jamie link, which uh, 
although it was clearly stronger for Jamie than for her, it is there. She does, she sees the two of them as two halves of the same person. And when Jamie is not there, it's like there's a missing person there. Um, John Greenwood saying, thanks for doing this, Robert. You're welcome. Uh, what do you think happened to Tyrek Lannister? Will we see him again in the story? So this is the, the Lannister who disappeared in the riots at King's Landing. Um, and uh, we get, uh, I mean, obviously the Lannisters want to try and find out what happened to him. And we get Varys, uh, who goes and um, is is commissioned to go and find him. No, can't find him. So um, what happened? I, I I kind of sometimes come down to the obvious boring answers in this. George R. R. Martin's world, it's very magical and, and all the rest of it, but... He tries to make it realistic feeling, internally coherent. And sometimes people going missing in a riot is just people going missing in a riot and they're not seen from again. And it doesn't mean that there's some extra something happening along the line. It doesn't mean that they're going to turn up. It means that there was a riot against the rich folks of, of King's Landing and one guy got caught up in it and uh, they stripped him of his rich clothes and jewellery and then disposed of the body, and he'll never be seen again. Uh, it's grim and dark, but as, as we were talking earlier, this is what George R. Martin is about. Um, uh, Andrew K. saying, Dan is lurking, he wants his cameo member. He's, he's stuck the other side of the green screen. I, I promise you, I will I will change the setup at some point in the new year so that when Dan does appear, then he can come and have his little cameo. So there you go. Uh, that's my that's my treat for, um, for my, uh, well, moderators and patrons. Uh, you, will, you will get your Dan um, uh, cameos in the new year at some point. Um... Corvus Corex, season's greetings, Robert, and to you too. Who do you think is the best villain candidate for Martin's scouring of the Shire uh, ending? Um, so, and how much of the Seven Kingdoms is even going to be left? No one prepared for winter. It's ravaged by war and broken men. Um, so, uh, for those who don't know, the scouring of the Shire ending, George R. Martin was asked about how... Um, a Song of Ice and Fire will end. How does he want to end it? And he said that uh, he uh, well, he gave the uh, bittersweet line. This is the, the line we always quote, is that um, he, he wants the ending to be bittersweet. And then he gives two examples of what he means by that. Both of them Lord of the Rings examples, because the man's obsessed with Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. One of them is Frodo. Frodo, uh, clearly, uh, he does does his duty, gets the ring all the way to the uh, cracks of doom. Um, largely through him, the world is, is saved, but not for him. He is a broken hobbit. Um, by his experiences, his his wounds hurt. He's uh, struggling to overcome the memories of what happened, um, and he needs healing. And he has to head off at the end of it all. He has to head off on the boat on the ship heading westwards. That is bittersweet, says George R. R. Martin, um, because he was the main protagonist, but this is not saved for him. The other thing he talks about is the scouring of the Shire, which he he rains praise down on. Um, this is the penultimate chapter of the Lord of the Rings. Um, wasn't in the films, but obviously in the books. And basically, at a very high level, the the hobbits come back to the Shire. They discover that Saruman um, has taken over the Shire and done terrible things to it, uh, uh, chopping down trees, imprisoning all of the good hobbits, that kind of thing. Our four heroes return, um, uh, muster the uh, the hobbits of the Shire, uh, manage to turf out the bad guys, Saruman dies. 
after which uh, they set to making the Shire right again. George R. R. Martin loves that chapter. Uh, he thinks it's brilliant. Uh, and he wants that feel for the end of A Song of Ice and Fire. So uh, what does that mean? Well, feel free to interpret it in your own way. The way I take it is that this is, at the end of this story, once the big baddie's gone, there's another baddie left behind. Um, and this baddie is affecting our home, the things we actually care about, the war, the, bad, the big things that have been happening in places away from our home. But here we have somebody who is impacting on and preventing us returning back to how we want to be. Um, but our heroes, having grown uh, figuratively and literally in some cases uh, through the story, are now equipped to deal with this other last threat, this secondary villain of the story. So that's the kind of feel. Who, therefore, is the secondary villain? And I think the best or the most likely candidate here is Euron. Euron is not the others. He's not got the destructive capacity of the dragons either, but he is hugely um, dangerous. So I think... Once the the dragon threat, and this is how George R. Martin does present it to start with, whether he's shifting in that, I don't know. Once the dragon threat and the threat of the others has been dealt with, we're still going to have Euron who needs to be dealt with. So that's the, um, uh, the best villain candidate for the, the, the Song of Ice and Fire, Scouring of the Shire. Um, Curvus Corax also saying, we know Shireen is going to be burned by Mel. Do you think due to her grayscale that her burning won't proceed like a normal person's? Um, possibly, although her grayscale is quite limited. It, it never really spread throughout her body. It's mostly on just on her face. Uh, so yes, it, she her body will not burn as normal bodies do. Um, but uh, I don't think it's going to be hugely significant. I think she will get burned, um, uh, and I think she will die. Um, Magma Frost, how and when did the Seven Kingdoms end up almost entirely speaking one language? We hear about more linguistic diversity existing beyond the wall, and we know of many languages over in Essos, but I don't believe we ever hear about any language barrier existing within the Seven Kingdoms. Um, true, and this is one of the bits George R. R. Martin is very open, he's not a philologist, he's not a linguist, um, he's not there making up lots of languages like Tolkien did. He, he makes up a few words that operate well as a language, uh, Valamogulis, etc., etc., but pardon me, but um, he's uh, he's, he doesn't construct entire languages. And to make life easy for himself, he did not in Westeros. And I think that that's the honest answer. That that's what he did. If you're looking for an in-world answer, then uh, the first men who came across all spoke the same language. They spread all the way across uh, Westeros. We have... Um, the Andal invasion, but that is not one big invasion that took over and pushed everyone out. That was a very slow, it was over hundreds of years. It was an immigration, an armed immigration, but an immigration nonetheless. And that resulted in mostly the joining or merging of houses. Now, uh, that in that sense, the original language could easily have been preserved. It's entirely possible that the uh, the Andals spoke the same language as the original first men who came from Essos. Uh, so that's the the working theory. And then uh, the uh, when Nymeria comes across, uh, they also married and settled, and they could have learned the local language too. Um, Mr. Bumpy Cat. Hi, Robert. Thanks for all the amazing content. Thank you. Uh, where in Planetos or Arda would you go if you could travel there for the holidays? Well, I answered about um, Planetos, um, the world of A Song of Ice and Fire. Uh, 
uh, a little bit earlier. Um, although, I mean, I've always got a hankering to go to Bravos. I think that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, in terms of Arda, I mean, obviously want to go to Middle Earth. Um, I mean, the Shire would be the nicest place, I think, pretty clearly. Um, but uh, I, Minas Tirith, maybe? Um, uh, I mean, Lost Lorien, if they'd let me in, although I don't think I'd particularly like the heights a lot of there's a lot of uh uh being on um treetops basically um so yeah Minas Tirith seems like it would be in a really interesting place um and magma frost a bit of tinfoil wanted to share uh over the targaryen live streams you talked about the idea of the dragon dream prophecy evolving over the generations from denise the dreamer uh, seeing a need to flee valeria to aegon seeing his conquest and so on but i don't think the dragon dream prophecy started with denise the dreamer given her dreams were taken seriously prophetic dreams were clearly a known phenomenon amongst the dragon lords so why should the evolving prophecy have started with her what else might be a candidate to have been influenced by these dreams the creation of the valyrian state the creation of dragons i think these are good candidates um so uh i, I like this idea a lot actually i, I do I, th I think it's a very valid point that um why on earth would they trust Denise the Dreamer, um, who has a dream that you know, if, if a member of your family says, I just had a dream that all of this is going to blow up, you don't immediately pack up everything, leave all your friends, your culture, your civilization, and move hundreds of miles away, um, unless you know that this person gets dreams or dragon dreams are a thing which is recognized within your family or you've got experience that this is these things are true it does seem to imply that there was more uh beforehand um and blood raven even kind of hints at it um that there were dragon dream and num many dragon dreamers before pardon me before the invasion therefore going back uh in time to when the targaryens were in valyria so yeah this kind of makes sense um we're told that the Targaryens weren't one of the the main houses. There are 40 houses, but they weren't one of the top houses in Valyria, which seems to imply that perhaps uh, the establishment of Valyria probably wasn't them. But, yeah, I completely believe that there was uh, there were dragon dreams within the Targaryens and perhaps also for other people beforehand. Um, Auntie Slayer, we often hear that John won't want Winterfell because he already turned it down. I feel like he didn't really get to answer. Voted Lord Commander before deciding. Is there a chance he will be tempted, given the choice again? Um, yeah, so I was reading or listening to this again relatively recently. And you're, you're right that he didn't really get the chance. Um, but... We do get a really good look at his thinking and his thinking is absolutely fascinating because um, what his thought process isn't so much, you know, it's not a, oh, well, I shouldn't leave the Night's Watch because I made my promise or anything like that. No, his thinking is, yeah, I could go back. Um, I could go be Lord of Winterfell. Uh, but Melisandre says, if you do this, you have to burn down the Weirwood tree. And he didn't feel he that was his right. He felt that Winterfell, first of all, he, he says the Winterfell belongs to the old gods. Um, he didn't feel it was right to be um, uh, doing that to what he considers his father's gods. Um, so he was pretty much, he decided he wasn't going to go and do it. But the reason he wasn't going to accept it was not because he didn't want to be lord he he'd thought about it a lot he dreamt about it um but it was because the terms and conditions he didn't think he could agree uh, so uh that therefore means that if he gets the chance to take it again if he's offered it again 
and that rider isn't there, he doesn't have to burn down the weirwood tree, then yeah, why not? Um, okay, let's go to... Um, George R. R. Tolkien saying, Salutations, Robert. George has finally confirmed that the stage play for Harren Hall is almost done. What do you think of the title they chose, The Iron Throne? It seems that they are scared the casuals won't get the Harren Hall title. Yes, yeah, so uh, in his latest blog post, he has, for those who don't obsess over these things to the extent that I do, he, George R. R. Martin has a blog. He calls it not a blog because he's like that. Um, and he updates it irregularly, it has to be said. Um, and a lot of the time when he does, it's not stuff that we may perhaps be interested in as much. It's just, you know, what's going on with his uh, uh, favourite sports teams or something like that. But there was quite a significant update um, just a week or so ago uh, where... He said that he'd been in London uh, for two and a half weeks, uh, and it's his first time for a long time over uh, this side of the pond. I think it was 2019, maybe, was the last time he was here. Uh, he was he was in Ireland for Worldcon um, and took the time to sort of look at a few Game of Thrones things, a lot, the filming for a lot of Game of Thrones stuff in Northern Ireland. Um, anyway. He was in he was in London for two and a half weeks. It looks as if he had a great time. Is is the, probably the first thing to say. Um, he met a whole load of old friends. He saw three plays while he was here, including um, the Ocean at the End of the Lane, which is a personal recommendation from me. I've I've seen it as well. It's uh, excellent. Uh, the Neil Gaiman um, adaptation. Um, uh, so if you get a chance to see that, please, please do. It's excellent. Um, uh, and he also says, so he revisited um, the set for House of the Dragon, uh, spent a couple of days there uh, talking through with the writing team seasons, th uh, yeah, seasons three and four, um, and which is good news because they've not officially been greenlit yet but I think this shows that they are pretty confident that they will be um, he also got some people excited but I think this is probably over interpreting what it was he, he said that he saw his British editors um, talked about a lot of things including the winds of winter this doesn't mean that he's about to hand it in or anything like that. He was in town. Um, it would have been rude if he hadn't gone to see them. And, of course, he was going to be talking to them about when the book that they uh, expected him to finish a decade ago might finally turn up. Uh, so uh, he did that. But also the thing I found most fascinating or exciting was this mention that he had a good meeting with uh, the the producer and the writer of the stage play. Now, if you've missed out on this, this is really quite exciting. So we're going to get a stage play about the tourney at Harren Hall, which obviously has got so many mysteries surrounding it. Um, now, we haven't been told much information, really, uh, but he's he has said at one point he thinks that it might debut in london in the west end uh, which is excellent for me i'd be very happy with that um uh and in this uh update he said that he was hopeful that it might be ready by the end of next year uh which would be brilliant uh, but um he also noted what George R. R. Tolkien here says that the, the title that they have at the moment, it's not a, fit, a finished final title, might change. They'd originally thought they would call it Harren Hall. Now uh, they've decided to, to call it the Iron Throne. Now, th there's a couple of obvious things we can read into this. The first one, I think, is what you've said here. The Iron Throne is more accessible. Um, people know what the Iron Throne is. Uh, Harrenhal, 
they probably don't remember. So you're you're more likely to get a wider set of people engaging with it or at least understanding the concept straight away. The second thing to sort of, if you wish to read into it, uh, to say is that if you call it the Iron Throne, you're framing the which elements of the Turning at Harren Hall you're focusing on. So George R. R. Martin has said previously about the Turning at Harren Hall is that you could write an entire book about what happened at the Turning at Harren Hall and a George R. R. Martin book at that, so a big, thick tome. Not all of that is going to be covered in this play, sadly. Uh, a lot will, I'm sure, but not absolutely everything. Um, and so this kind of framing device helps us see which elements we're going to be getting more of. And as you're talking about it being the Iron Throne, this is about succession. It's about who's sitting on the Iron Throne. I think the clear implication is that we're going to see uh, Rhaegar with probably what we expect is him with this sort of outline plan or plot to oust his father in some way. We never really have had the details of this, but the hints are very strongly there. We're going to see Varys advising um, Aerys II about what's happening, getting him to come out to the tourney at Harren Hall. Um, that's the angle. The, the Targaryens, the um, succession politics. That's the that's the framing device that we've got with this title. Um, which doesn't mean we're not going to get, but it does seem to imply that we're going to get less of a focus on magic -y stuff, uh, the Knight of the Laughing Tree, the Starks, Howland Reed. I'm sure they will all be there, but that doesn't seem to be the focus based purely on what this title will be being given. Um, Mara Lee, um, uh, hi there, Mara. You're, uh, good to see you. You're around right at the beginning of the stream as well, saying just a show of love and support for all the great content. Thank you very much. I hugely appreciate you and, and your support. Um, George R. R. Tolkien, in The Fellowship of the Ring, when the hobbits get to Tom Bombadil's place, they step through this foggy hidden path to get to the entrance. Do you think Tom Bombadil's house is a pocket dimension in the Undying Lands? The land around his house just seems so amazing. Also, do you think Tom has to stay between the borders of the old forest in order to stay immortal? It's like the terms and agreements to his immortality. Um, well, uh, to uh, answer this first bit, I think, no, he's very much based in Middle-earth. I think Tom Bombadil, without going into all of the detail about who Tom Bombadil is, um, but uh, he seems very based and grounded in Middle-earth, an expression of Middle-earth in some ways. Um, that would not work if he was actually somewhere else. He's just got a little pocket dimension based there. Um, so I think, no, he is, he is there. Um, and... Does he have to stay there in order to stay immortal? Um, I mean, I, I think it's more that he is immortal and he will stay alive and there for as long as there remains Middle Earth and is not um, trammeled by the forces against nature. Uh, by which I mean you get there's Tom Bombadil we talk about him appearing in the Lord of the Rings. He also appeared in uh, his very early creation by Tolkien. Um, and we get the adventures of Tom Bombadil. Um, Bombadil goes boating. We get poems about him. One of them, he's paddling up the, the stream, um, the Withywindle, and goes and uh, meets Farmer Maggot. Uh, Farmer Maggot, as we know, lives outside of the old forest so tom bombadil is but that is still very much um middle it's not been industrialized it's not there's nothing been you know, against this kind of rural idyll that tom bombadil is still uh, that um uh, farmer maggot is still expressing and tom bombadil is still there so uh 
slightly circuitous way of, of saying that no i think he is there i think he is based there i think he's an expression of that land and i think he would be there until such time as that land is destroyed in some way um let's go to oh we're nearly the end of questions from my patrons um in fact this is the last patron question i've got callie summers this is yours um, a bit of a troll question for you. In Middle Earth, trolls are established to turn to stone in the sunlight, but trolls are also often seen in daylight. Apparently, Sauron modified them. The originals were some of Morgoth's most feared soldiers, but they're also the kind that Bilbo encountered as comic relief. I've read that they were made as mockeries of the Ents, but also um, that. Uh, the Ents were created to balance the Dwarves. So what's the deal with Trolls? They're even more confusing than Bombadil and Balrogs. Okay, I think you're most of the way there, actually. Um, so uh, Ents, you're right. Ents were created um, uh, in response. Yavanna saw the creation of Dwarves and wanted something to balance this, not just Dwarves, but those who might look to destroy nature, chop down trees, that kind of thing. Hence, she gets granted the Ents to be the shepherds of the trees. Um, Morgoth, the original big baddie in this world, he, um, he could not create Ex Nihilo. He could not create from nothing. And so, but he did want to create... And so what we find is that he he creates things that are a mockery of what is already there, a twisting, a perversion in some way of what is already there. A classic example being the orcs uh, as a mockery of elves. But here we have trolls as a mockery of ents. And... Um, that comes from Treebeard. Treebeard sort of speculates that that might be the case. Treebeard is very old. And so if anyone knows, then he probably does. So it kind of makes sense. So that's where they come from. And yes, they were feared, uh, but they were never clever. And uh, what we have in uh, the trolls that we discover in uh, The Hobbit is, well, first of all, the comic relief, yes, this is a children's book. It's supposed to be um, a bit silly, a bit funny. Um, but also, these are trolls without direction. So it's just them. And that is what they are like. When, you know, it's a throwaway line, but we all remember that they've got a cave troll. So it's like the cave troll was being owned by the orcs, basically, in Moria. And that was more the natural state for them, uh, not being in charge of their own destinies, but other people um, sort of pushing them around and making them do the things that they ought to be doing. So uh, that's the, the, the trolls that we see in The Hobbit. That's, that's what they're like. That's, um, uh, that's their role. They're not particularly clever. Um, uh, they're, they're not, um, uh, th that's not what they're made like. Um, Sauron, he did this with the orcs. He realized that the orcs had a big problem. They couldn't go out in sunlight. And he uh, created Uruk High. Uh, Saruman there also creating the Uruk High. This is the orcs that can go out in daylight. The trolls. This is what Sauron did. Trolls that could go out in daylight, he called Olog High. So when in the Lord of the Rings you're seeing trolls that can go out in daylight, they are next generation. They are upgraded trolls uh, by Sauron called Olog High. Um, okay, so I, that's my questions from my patrons um all gone uh what i will do uh now is i will go through the chat i will pick up as i say i'm if you keep on sending a donation this is i'll say this again for one more time uh this is a charity stream this is the reason why we're doing this and i'm still talking after uh four and a half hours is because 
we're trying to raise a bit of money uh, at this time of year for those who are less well off and who need it more. So this year, what we're doing is we're raising for a charity called Crisis at Christmas. This is to help homeless people. Uh, for whatever reason, they find themselves uh, in a situation we're very cold at night at this time of year in this part of the world um, and uh, no food to eat often, um, quite often mistreated um, uh, rather horrifically. Um, the, the the charity crisis at Christmas, they go out, they give a roof over their heads for these people. Uh, they make sure that they've got warm food in their bellies. And just as importantly, they don't just then say, OK, well, that's it. We've helped you out for a day. They then actually get alongside them and they they try and work out what is it? What what can happen to help get you permanently back in accommodation, back, get you permanently uh, moving back in the right track. And that will be different for every single individual. And it's hard work and it can sometimes be quite costly in terms of you have to get professionals involved and, and experts. But that is what we're doing here is that we're helping people who have lost everything uh, and they're out on the streets. Um, so that's uh, what we're raising money for. If you are watching this live, you can do that by a super chat or a super sticker. I will add up all of this um, uh, and send it off direct. I'll put the receipts up on uh, on Twitter so you can see that. Um, if you're watching this a bit later, I'm going to keep this open right up until Christmas Day. You can put super thanks in there um, uh, afterwards, and this, I'll do the, exactly the same thing. So that's what's going on. But question from Casey uh, Pelletier. Do we know the in-world story regarding Arthur Dane's demise? As the greatest knight in living memory, I imagine that that would be a story that gets around. No, <clears throat> is the short answer. Um, the, the implication is that Ned must have told a version of this story to Robert Baratheon. Uh, which is that um, he tracked down Lyanna <coughs> to uh, somewhere. He didn't say where this was, uh, but there were three members of the King's Guard there. Ned had gone with his guys. There was a fight. All the King's Guard uh, died, and uh, he came back with Lyanna's body. That's the story he told. And uh, the bit that Robert Baratheon will have focused on was what happened to Lyanna. Uh, everybody else was focusing on the fact that they literally, the entire uh, continent had been turned upside down in war. And it was now just a matter of uh, so we've got a completely new king. He's got to create a new small council. Everything's got to be, everybody's got to be judged. Um, people have got to be appointed. And House Dane were just trying to stay quiet. Uh, they were just, they were not pushing this out. They were not saying, our brave hero died and such and such. But they were just, shh, we're not saying anything. Um, and they basically retired from public life. House Dane largely retired from public life for the next decade and a half. Uh, so, uh, yes, a story, but the story is that Ned Stark and a, a group of people with him outnumbered the King's Guard. There was a, an epic fight, and uh, the King's Guard died, including Arthur Dane. Uh, Dragon Seed, my first time catching a live from Seattle, USA. Thank you very much. Uh, great to see you. Uh, Beris Aurelius saying House Dane was way too quiet on this. Yeah, absolutely, they were. They just. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, Andrew Kay saying, to me, John is much more ambitious in the books than super dutiful Game of Thrones version. Even his vision of decapitating Rob could be suppressed subconscious higher aims for himself. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So he's... Um, uh, I, I don't know whether ambitious is the right... He, he certainly struggles with, uh, with his, his thoughts. 
um, about, uh, I mean, he admits to himself that he did dream about being ignored, uh, but um, he definitely struggles with this as a concept because he does, because he, he loved Rob as a brother. Um, uh, so that's not, um, that's not a comfortable thought for him. But yes, ambitious might be the wrong word, but he definitely uh, had hopes uh, that did not really come across. Uh, you know, the whole I don't want it, um, it's, it doesn't sum up all of his rather complex thoughts on this. Uh, Sin saying, hi, Robert. Many thanks for all your fantastic content. Happy holidays to all. Thank you very much. Uh, that's your first Super Chat uh, ever, so thank you. Um, uh, George R. R. Tolkien, almost three in the morning. Robert, you're a champion. I'm still going strong. Got half a glass of water to go. Um, uh, keep me up for another few minutes uh, by donating a little bit more, guys. Uh, that would be good. Amara Lee, did I see the latest super chat you sent? Um, oh, for, oh, for Robert's cap. Uh, oh, here. Well. Thank you very much. Yes, there it, there it is. I got a nice little bobble on the end. Uh, thank you. Um, Sarah, awesome source saying, happy holidays. I hope you have a great holiday season. And thanks for all you do, especially for your charity live streams. It's always nice to see people supporting people. Well, thank you. I try to do my best here. Um, it's been a little, so, I mean, pull back the curtain a touch. It's been a little bit frustrating for me, the fact that I um, haven't managed to get the, the, the standard... Um, uh, uh, charity stream uh, set up going on this channel yet, uh, but uh, I will do soon, and that means that we'll be able to do even more of these charity live streams. Um, uh, Zach K saying, hey, everyone, not going to be able to make it to the end. Phone is dying. So am I. Oh, um, I hope everyone has an amazing holiday and enjoys time with friends and fam. Thanks, mods, guests, and Robert. Thank you very much. Bearus Aurelius saying Robert isn't even tired. I am a bit tired, but I'm just keeping on going. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Nick Drum, Robert forgot to take his hat off. I did. I, I took it off. My, my head is now all itchy, and I dare say my um, my hair is a little bit of a mess at this point. Okay, um, I'm going to start wrapping this up unless uh, unless we get any more uh, kind of donations uh, coming through. Uh, but uh, I will tell you what's going on uh, over the course of the next few weeks on uh, on this channel, the main channel. Uh, basically, uh, I've still got some more videos coming out. I've got the one I mentioned about holidays in Middle Earth coming out. Um, I've got I've got another one coming out tomorrow and i for the life of me can't remember what it is um uh but hey here's hoping it's a good one um uh, then uh hopefully over the course of the next two or three weeks i've got another uh maybe maybe a video week for a little while just over the christmas period i will be taking some time off i normally do i highly encourage if you are able to do the same just take time off from your work um doesn't have to be this time of the year but uh, it's really good for the, the the mind and the soul, I find, just to switch off from everything and just enjoy family and friends um, and the good things in life, which is what I intend to do for a good couple of weeks over Christmas and the new year, um, and then return reinvigorated. So we're going to have, I think it's two weeks of, of uh, no live stream here. Um, then I'll be returning uh, in the first Thursday of the new year. Um, and uh, I've got lots of random plans for what I do. I might get some brainwaves while I've got a couple of weeks off. Uh, but yeah, one thing, if you missed it slightly early in the stream, I'm looking at doing some lore playthroughs of video games, by which I mean not just like a standard playthrough of a video game, but something like there was, uh, there's some Lord of the Rings games out there. There's obviously Witcher games, um, uh, and there's some sort of Game of Thrones game out there as well. Uh, playing through them, but describing the world as we go through it, explaining the background, the lore, the history of what's going on um, uh, as well. We're going through the game. So it's just a th another thing I'm doing um, that I thought might be a slightly different angle on uh, how to address all of this um, wonderful content and world that we've got to be looking at. So uh, that's coming up in the new year. Um, 
I'm I'm now on, if you've missed it, almost all of the different social media you can find. So X, Twitter, um, also Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok I'm on now. I'm trying my best to do, put as many videos up onto there as I can, the short form ones, but also a few of my uh, my older, longer ones. Um, Mara, Lee, Mara Lee, again, thank very generous, Mara. Thank you very much, saying happy holidays to all. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, thank you very much. Emma S saying, happy to catch this live after exams. Oh, I hope they went well. Um, silly question. What do you think the Stark kids have on their Christmas wish list? Um, uh, well, John wants to know who his mum is. Um, uh, it depends which point in their life, really, because it will vary a lot. But uh, younger versions, um, I mean, Sansa, Sansa will just want, I mean, pretty things, won't she? She'd want a nice dress or something like that. Um, Arya, if it's before she got needle, then she will want a sword. Um, uh, or uh, I don't know if she has a horse, but um, uh, yeah, she, she loves riding as well, Arya. So maybe like a new saddle or something like that. Um, Bran... Mm, I don't know. Uh, what would he like? Uh, I don't know. This is a good question. People in the chat, I will read out stuff if you can think of what, what Bran and Rickon might might want for uh, for Christmas. Uh, Rob, I don't know, something really um, boring and grown up to show that he um, <laughs> he's, he's, he's ready to take over. Um, uh dragon seed i want robert's t-shirt you can have robert's t-shirt thank you so they're, they're very rare for me to get this let's see hopefully there it says in deep geek it's my uh holidays t-shirt it's available as merch i always forget to mention merch i've mentioned it twice in this live stream i'm very proud of myself there should be a link somewhere down there um to uh my merch um if it's if there's not like pictures and stuff like that then there will be a link in the description to it so yes you can get it it's available as a t-shirt or a hoodie or sweater or tote bag or whatever you want really uh right right now so she'd want loris yes uh sansa would want loris um uh Beris Aurelius saying John has being alive on his wish list. I think. Well, maybe. Uh, sometimes I think he's um, he's a bit more doom and gloom than that. Wheezy Squeezebox lemon cakes. Yeah, she'd love some of them. Uh, Weirwood Arya will want everyone left on her list on a silver platter. Uh, yep. Um, toys for Rick on yet. Yeah, don't forget, he's still still a child. Um, Kalua, any speculation on what is to the west of the Lonely Light? Do you think we will ever find out? So what, what is west of Westeros? Um, will we ever find out? No. Um, uh, what is there? Well, there's a route through because um, when Alyssa Farman sailed west, then uh, her boat ended up, uh, we think in a shy so she ended up circumnavigated basically the, the the globe or nearly circumnavigated it anyway um perhaps there's another continent or perhaps essos just keeps on going for a long long way um it's a very long continent and we don't see on the maps we don't actually see the end of essos so i mean if i had to guess it would be uh, that there's a very 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 big ocean a bit like if you've ever looked at a globe of our world you can look at it from one angle and you can pretty much just see water of the pacific ocean um that length of water and then it comes up on the far side of uh, of essos that would be my best guess um Uh, Justus saying, is Bloodraven Father Christmas, North Pole, etc.? Yes, uh, but quite a dark Father Christmas. Um, I think it's probably fair to say. Um, uh, 
Okay, and with that, I think I'm going to start drawing this one to a close. Mammoth session. Thank you to all of the the um, moderators in particular who've been uh, sticking at this for that's now nearly five hours. So a thank you, a huge thanks to you. And uh, for this year, a few thank yous just before I sign off. Uh, everyone who's donated on this stream thank you hugely i appreciate that um i don't know i haven't got a running tally of how much that is but it's certainly going to be hundreds of pounds hundreds of dollars um so uh, that will be hugely um uh, valuable and important thank you and it will mean a lot um in moderators patrons your support through this year for me personally has been amazing thank you so much and anyone who's just um uh, watch my videos or supported me in any way that I do not know. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, here's another. I said I was going to keep staying here if you keep on sending money in. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, Raven's Oath, thank you very much. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, Robert. Thank you for another great year of vids and streams. God bless you and everyone in the chat. Happy holidays, everyone. Yes, so um, uh, I think that's where I shall probably end. Um, uh, every blessing to all of you. I hope you, if 2023 has been hard for you, I hope that you get a restful end of it. Uh, and I hope that 2024 is, is all kinds of wonderful. Um, if you celebrate Christmas and New Year, then I hope you have a fantastic time with your family and friends. Uh, if not, um, then I hope you have a, a really relaxing couple of weeks and I will be back in the new year. Take care, everyone, and I will see you again soon.